Thank you, members. I'd ask you to stand in silence and pray or reflect on our responsibilities to the people of the Australian Capital Territory. Thank you, members. Mr Stanhope. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, I move that this, that this assembly expresses its deep regret at the death of Mr Alan Fitzgerald, distinguished local journalist, author and satirist, former member of the ACT Advisory Council, founder and former president of the National Press Club and passionate commentator on life in Canberra, and tenders its profound sympathy to his family, friends and colleagues in their bereavement. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, Mr Alan Fitzgerald, who died at the end of March at the age of 75, after almost half a century's residence in our city, was a passionate but clear-eyed Canberran, an accomplished writer, a politician and a biding commentator on matters political and social. I acknowledge, Mr Speaker, in the chamber today, Mr Fitzgerald's wife, Maria, his son, Julian, his daughter-in-law, Jacqueline, and his grandson, Patrick. Alan Fitzgerald was born in Sydney in 1935 and started out in the advertising industry before moving into journalism. In his early career, he worked in London and also edited the Fiji Times. On his arrival in Canberra in 1964, he was invited by the then editor of the Canberra Times, John Pringle, to write a satirical column for that newspaper. From those first columns, in which he cast an accurate, bitingly humorous but never cruel eye on the social mores and structures of his adopted city, Alan Fitzgerald built a career as a chronicler of a young and growing city that he had made his home. His popularity was enduring because he wrote for and about people like himself, young adults building careers and families, often without extended family for support, people creating a community out of nothing as suburb after suburb was carved from the landscape. Fortunately, it was a community more than willing to laugh at its own foibles, more than able to recognise its own absurdities and its sometimes overweening ambitions. A community made up, so it must have seemed to outsiders, entirely of public servants, diplomats and political advisers. In fact, of course, it was more diverse. As Alan Fitzgerald wrote at the time, Canberra, commonly held to be the Australian national capital, was planned by an American and today is designed by Dutchmen, owned by Greeks and built by Italians. The English, accustomed to positions of privilege in colonial societies, have taken over the PNC associations. It's slightly disturbing reading through some of Alan Fitzgerald's old columns to reflect that the issues that appalled and entertained him 30 and 40 years ago are in many cases the same issues that have modern day commentators and letter writers fulminating over their computer keyboards and modern cartoonists and satirists rubbing their hands with glee. Take this observation about planning taken from a 1975 compilation of Alan Fitzgerald's writings called Life in Canberra. When things go wrong in Australian cities, people know it's because there is no properly coordinated planning authority. In Canberra, even the mistakes are planned by the National Capital Development Commission. This, of course, was written before the existence of ACPLA. It's a great comfort to residents of the National Capital to know that the backlog in the construction of government houses, the absence of footpaths and the delay in the development of retail centres are not accidental occurrences but the result of carefully calculated professional advice. Or this, the NCD says it takes seven years to plan a new suburb. Two years are spent in district design, engineering of roads and services, land development, construction of schools, government houses and shopping centres. The remaining five years are spent in trying to get the Department of the Capital Territory to agree to the building of a public toilet near the District Oval. And his observations about the bus network. The longest distance between two points is a Canberra bus route. Bus <laughs> routes are determined by the need to move the least number of people 
the longest distance in the maximum time. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Alan Fitzgerald did not confine himself to parochial musings. His work appeared over the years not just in the Canberra Times, but in papers across the nation, including the Sun Herald, the Sunday Observer, the Sunday Australian, the Bulletin, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. In time, he even became a publisher himself, presiding over the conservative periodical, the Australian National Review, for five years and establishing the Australian Constitutional News. Nor did he confine his talents to print. He was a correspondent for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in the mid-1970s and hosted a current affairs program for nine years on local radio station 2CA. He was a familiar voice on ABC Radio and his was a familiar face on Channel 7's breakfast program. Alan Fitzgerald was a long-time member of the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery and a founder and early president of the National Press Club. He remained active on the club's committee for many years. His son, Julian, also a journalist, recently commented that almost until the day of his death, his father was still reading newspapers and listening to current affairs. Beyond his daily journalism, he was a respected author who published a number of books on the history of Canberra, including Historic Canberra, 1825 to 1945, Canberra's Engineering Heritage, Canberra and the New Parliament House, and Canberra in Two Centuries, A Pictorial History. Included among his other titles are a number of historical works, including Italian Farming Soldiers, POWs in Australia, 1941 to 47, and Victory, 1945, War and Peace. He traced his own ancestry in another book, Barons, Rebels and Romantics, the Fitzgerald's First Thousand Years. Alan Fitzgerald also authored a number of satirical guidebooks to life as it was, and to some extent still is, lived in Canberra, including Fitzgerald's Canberra, A Guide to Life in the National Capital, Life in Canberra, the book from which I've quoted today, and Canberra, Where to Go and What to See. Alan Fitzgerald was, in addition to all of these things, a politician, though he could perhaps best be described as an accidental, even resentful one, almost an anti-politician. He was elected to the, to the then ACT Advisory Council, almost, it has to be said, as an act of perversity, before, being, before going on to run seriously for federal parliament as the Australia Party's candidate for the seat of Canberra. He was a staunch and lifelong monarchist, actively promoting the status quo during the lead-up to the referendum on a republic. He was a foundation member and a one-time chair of the ACT and region branch of Australians for constitutional monarchy. He was also, somewhat ironically, given his public utterances regarding the NCDC, that organisation's director of public information at one point in his career. Mr Speaker, Mr. Mr. Mr Alan Fitzgerald will be fondly remembered by the many friends and colleagues he gathered around him over the course of his professional life, as well as by the many Canberrans, such as myself, uh, who grew up with his observations about this city, politics and public affairs. On behalf of the Assembly, I extend my deep condolences to his wife, Maria, sons Dominic and Julian, his six grandchildren and his extended family. Mr Cezelja. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I rise to support the motion uh, moved by the Chief Minister today uh, in recognition of the life of Alan Fitzgerald. Uh, the presence of Mr Fitzgerald in Canberra was mostly felt in media circles. He had a long and distinguished career that saw his work cross state and international borders. His sharp wit and renowned satirical work and political commentary will last the test of time. He had a passion for media and politics and will be remembered for, among many other things, decades of commitment to his chosen profession. He has made a lasting impact on journalism and has passed this passion on to his family. He first arrived in Canberra in 1964 to write columns for the Canberra Times. However, it did not take long for his, before his work was printed in many other places, including The Bulletin, The Sunday Australian and The Age. Mr Fitzgerald's involvement in media evolved to include him being the correspondent for CBC Ottawa, for nine years, he was heard on Canberra radio station 2CA when running his own current affairs program. As a general contributor, he appeared regularly on Channel 7's breakfast program and several ABC radio programs. Mr Fitzgerald was a member of the Federal Parliamentary Press Gallery. He was elected president of the National Press Club for two terms 
1969 and 1970. Like many of those who are passionate about not only media but the intersection it has with politics, Mr Fitzgerald could not resist the opportunity to be involved in the political process. In 1967, he was elected to the ACT Advisory Council as a true Whig on a joke platform of promising to do nothing. The election in 1970 saw him re-elected with 21 per cent of the vote. Mr Fitzgerald made a more serious foray into politics when he ran on the Australia Party ticket in the 1970 by-election for the seat of Canberra. Although an enthusiastic campaign saw him achieve the highest vote for the Australian Australia Party of any candidate in any election, he was ultimately unsuccessful in his bid for the seat. A prolific writer, Mr Fitzgerald was the author of many works and was in fact nearly finished another book on the history of the Irish in Australia when he passed away on the 31st of March. Mr Speaker, we are a young territory, a young city, uh, yet the passing of Alan Fitzgerald uh, reminds us that although we have not been here long, we have already lost many of those who played such a key role in establishing and defining the territory. Alan Fitzgerald will be remembered as one who came to Canberra and not only made it his home, working here and raising his family here, but he will be remembered as one of those very few that in future should and will be remembered as a, as a great contributor to Canberra. Uh, Mr Dospot, who will speak to this condolence motion, reminded me of the quote from the autobiography of Mr Fitzgerald. The quote reads, My life has, had been shaped by living in the national capital in ways that I could could not have imagined possible had I lived elsewhere. Mr Speaker, I would suggest that this life was not only shaped by living in the national capital, but helped to shape our national capital. On behalf of the Canberra Liberals, uh, I express my sincere condolences uh, to wife Maria, to son Julian and daughter-in-law Jacqueline, uh, to grandson Patrick and all family and friends of Alan Fitzgerald. Thank you, Ms Hunter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I rise, the ACT Greens will, of course, be supporting this important condolence motion this morning. Alan John Fitzgerald was a proud, passionate and active Canberran. As a resident of Canberra for 47 years, he certainly took part in shaping the capital. Mr Fitzgerald witnessed the real boom in Canberra's population in the 1960s and 1970s. Mr Fitzgerald worked across all journalistic mediums, writing columns for both the Sydney Morning Herald and Canberra Times. He satirised and documented the shaping of our capital. Alan John Fitzgerald was born to Patrick and Ursula in Sydney on November 5, 1935. Alan grew up in Cloverley in Sydney's east and was educated at the Marceland College Randwick. After leaving school, Mr Fitzgerald worked in advertising agency, then became a journalist working in Sydney and Melbourne before travelling to Europe, staying abroad and travelling the continent for two years. In 1961, he married Maria McFadden, who was then working for the Department of Navy. In 1964, John Pringle invited Mr Fitzgerald to join the Canberra Times in the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Working through the 60s into the 70s, Mr Fitzgerald worked with well-known commentators such as Laurie Oakes, Caroline Jones, Mike Willisey and Alan Ramsey. It was in these years that his satirist skills shone as he wrote about the rapidly emerging Canberra. He documented the well-known lack of social amenity, so often reported by saying, finding something to do in Canberra is easier than finding something to do after it. His love of satire was matched with his fondness for Canberra and his writing was well regarded. A well-known quote of life for many new to Canberra coming for work and gradually establishing families was, the best thing about living in Canberra is that your relatives are interstate. Whether one left Canberra to escape family or not, many could relate to this comment. As Mr Fitzgerald immersed himself in the political scene, he had some desire to join the ranks officially. He first ran for the ACT Advisory Council. His election platform was certainly not conventional, and as others have stated this morning, he formed a joke party called the True Whig Party. He promised to do nothing and cited his inspiration with local politicians. He went on to refuse to engage in a campaign launch and speech and cited his ongoing silence as meaningful. 
The most interesting outcome was that he was elected, gaining the third highest vote. After all the satire and fanfare, Mr Fitzgerald took his role seriously and went on to serve two terms uh, for the Canberra community. His assistance to many did not form part of his public agenda. He just got on with the job and helped people. This led him to accept an invitation to join the Australia Party and run for the federal seat of Canberra. Mr Fitzgerald ran twice but was unsuccessful. He had a keen interest in planning and development and we've heard from the Chief Minister this morning uh, some of the, uh, the uh, comments he made about planning in the capital. As someone who lives through Canberra growing and thriving, transforming from a country town to a thriving city, he had a wealth of information and opinions regarding the future of the capital, something that will be missed. Although conservative by nature, Mr Fitzgerald experienced warm relations with both sides of politics, including Prime Ministers Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser and John Howard, as well as the former Deputy Prime Minister Doug Anthony. He was a passionate monarchist, maybe something uh, perhaps unusual considering his Irish heritage. Mr Fitzgerald was a founding member of the National Press Club. He served as president from 1969 to 1979. 71. He was a real thinker. Both he and his wife Maria were intellectuals, always discussing current issues and events. Both Alan and Maria Fitzgerald study at the ANU as mature students. In the last weeks of his life, family friends recall his being as uh, ever sharp. He was an avid reader and an author of many works. Thousands of press articles, both satirical and serious. He also published historical texts including Fitzgerald's Canberra and Life in Canberra. A work he was particularly proud of was an exploration of Italian prisoners of war in Australia titled The Italian Farming Soldiers, an account of Italian prisoners of war in Australia between 1941 and 1947. He was still writing at the time of his death, nearing completion on another historical account, this time of Irish families in Australia. His son Julian has followed in his footsteps working in the Federal Press Gallery and publishing books, firstly on lobbyists in Australia and a work nearing completion on Australian Prime Ministers. Mr Fitzgerald's satire was only a thin disguise of his love of Canberra and his participation and service for close to 50 years. He penned an autobiography in 2001 and in an obituary in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday written by his sons, they quote Alan by saying, My life had been shaped by, shaped by living in the national capital in ways I could not have imagined possible had I lived elsewhere. Alan Fitzgerald, a resident of Isaacs, died from cancer on the 31st of March. He is survived by his wife Maria and sons Dominic, a paediatrician in Sydney who is married to Karina, and their sons Nicholas, Timothy, Samuel and Hugh, and Julian, a federal parliamentary press gallery journalist in Canberra, married to Jacqueline and their sons, Patrick and Daniel. And I do acknowledge the family in the chamber today. On behalf of the ACT Greens, we express our condolences for the, uh, the loss of this wonderful Canberran. Thank you. Mr Corbell. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I rise to, to join the Chief Minister and other members in expressing this chamber's sincere condolences on, on the passing of Mr Alan Fitzgerald. As members have heard, Mr Speaker, Alan had a great interest and passion for politics that eventually extended to his involvement in the local political scene in the early 1960s. Around this time, he publicly lampooned the elected ACT Advisory Council, the forerunner to this assembly. He was especially critical of the lack of power of the council, primarily due to the fact that its recommendations were usually ignored by the federal government, a criticism that still has some resonance today. As a result of this frustration, in 1966, Allen announced he was forming the True Whig Party. He called on voters to write his or his, or his party's names on the ACT ballot papers in the 1966 election. Hearing that many voters had done so, he, he decided that he would actually stand for the ACT Advisory Council in 1967. In Allen's true satirical style, he ran on a joke platform, promising to do nothing. Interestingly, one of the few election promises he did make, however, was to build service stations on Muggle Way. He was subsequently elected 
getting the third highest primary vote behind the Labor and Liberal parties. At the subsequent election in 1970, he was re-elected with around 21 per cent of the vote. It's worth noting, Mr Speaker, that he attracted more support than the Liberal candidates on that occasion. Allen became seriously involved in politics when he stood for the Australia Party as its candidate in the 1970 by-election for the seat of Canberra. He gained the highest vote of any Australia Party candidate in any election, winning 18 per cent of the vote, but was eliminated from the count in a final distribution of preferences. He stood again for the Australia Party for the seat in the 1972 federal election and would later lead a team of members of the party contesting seats in the Advisory Council. After standing down from politics, he joined the National Capital Development Commission and became its Director of Public Information. After its abolition in 1989, he transferred in the same position to its successor, the National Capital Planning Authority. During his time with the NCDC, he was involved with a number of local history and heritage projects, a passion that shone through in both his lit literary and bureaucratic careers. For many years, he was a member and a chair of the ACT's Historic Sites and Building Committee, now the ACT Heritage Council, that had been established at his initiative to protect historic homesteads and buildings at a time of rapid expansion of Canberra into the surrounding rural areas. The committee prevented the development of a suburb within the Lanyon Homestead site and recommended the acquisition and management of Calthorpe's house in Muggleway as a home museum. As members have also noted, he was also a foundation member and chairman of the ACT region branch of Australians for Constitutional Monarchy and played an active role in the debate about Australia becoming a republic. In 1998, he was the organisation's primary candidate in the election of delegates to the Constitutional Convention, but lost on a final distribution of preferences. However, he nevertheless attended the convention as an alternative delegate and media officer for the ACM and a number of independent delegates. Throughout his rich life, Allen was passionate about issues that related to the development of Canberra and was often critical of the change that was taking place within the capital as a result of perceived lack of quality planning and little interest and support from the federal government in the national capital's development. As late as February this year, he wrote an article on the destruction of Canberra as a garden city concept and as a well-planned capital. He was critical of the decline of the National Capital Authority as a proactive body created to protect and enhance the national aspects of our city. He was also a strong supporter of moves to see federal funding to commemorate the, the, the city's centenary in 2013. This article perhaps typifies Alan Fitzgerald's passion for the city that he loved and lived in for most of his life, a city that he believed was unfairly criticised as merely the home of politicians and bureaucrats. Through his humour and insight, he managed to portray Canberra in a truly human light, a city that we can all be proud of. Uh, on behalf of other members and, and in joining with other members, I extend my sincere condolences to Alan's wife Maria, his sons Dominic and Julian, his six grandchildren, his daughter-in-law Jacqueline, grandson Patrick in particular is here today, and his many friends. Mr. Dospot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Chief Minister for his condolence motion on the death of Alan Fitzgerald. The key facts of Alan's life have already been covered by Mr. Stanhope, Mr. Seselja, and Ms. Hunter. And uh, I, today, I wish to focus on the man from both uh, private and public perspectives. In this task, I've been assisted by the thoughts of some of those who knew him best, his two sons who both delivered fine eulogies at his funeral at Sacred Heart Church, Pierce, on Tuesday, as well as my own memory. ...to join us in the gallery here today, and to them, I pass on my deep condolences on Alan's passing. In his eulogy, Dominic remarked that Alan's family was the centre of uh, Alan's family was the centre of his world. Alan's love for Maria was deep and profound, and clearly reciprocated in a remarkably successful marriage, which, at 49 years, 
lasted nearly a lifetime. Julian described Alan as his Abba and his Alpha and Omega, which in Latin and Greek means that Alan was his father, his beginning and his end. He was a strong moral force in the life of his sons. He was always there for them, and I know how proud he was of their achievements. Alan was passionate about everything he did and left a fine record of achievement as a journalist, author, satirist and politician. He was a man of great courage who never resiled from expressing his firmly held views on the subject of the day. In Julian's words, he was driven to do what was right, not what was popular. And this did not come at times without its cost. As I mentioned to this House in my adjournment speech on Tuesday night, Allen was a high profile and committed constitutional monarchist, and since its foundation, he was the local convener of Australians for constitutional monarchy. Allen was also prominent in establishing the National Press Club, where he served two terms as president from 1969 to 71. And despite his satirical comments about Canberra, he loved the place with a rare passion. In his 2001 autobiography, Some What I Have Done and Failed to Do, he suggested that my life had been shaped by living in the national capital in ways that I could not have imagined possible had I lived elsewhere. Alan's commitment to Canberra included local politics as well. He was a member for two terms of the ACT Advisory Council. In this capacity, Alan was able to help many members of the Canberra community in ways that were never publicised. In Dominic's words, Alan became part of the fabric of Canberra, providing insightful social commentary as it evolved from a large country town into a city. Although he did not suffer fools gladly, Alan was a kind, compassionate and caring man with a keen interest in the welfare of his fellow man. Although a keen observer and satirist of politicians, he maintained warm relationships with politicians on both sides of the political divide, including Gough Whitlam, Malcolm Fraser, John Howard and Doug Anthony. Alan had an inquisitive personality and an endearing sense of humour, qualities which manifested themselves in his hugely successful career as journalist and commentator. He was incredibly hard working and only retired earlier this year due to illness at the age of 75. Alan loved reading and writing and wrote many books on subjects as diverse as an account of Italian prisoners of war in Australia in the Second World War, Canberra's history and engineering heritage and political satire. Alan was currently working on yet another book on the history of the Irish in Australia. Right up until the end of his life, Alan devoured the news media in all its forms and had adapted remarkably well to the digital environment that has so profoundly impacted on the modern media environment. Julian recalled that although having grown up in the age of wireless, Alan succumbed to the advent of television, the wireless internet, and finally Facebook, iPads, and Google. I might best conclude by noting Dominic's observation at the conclusion of his eulogy that Alan, in the words of the Jesuits, was a man for others. Thank you, members. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I ask all members to signify their approval by rising in their places. Thank you, members. Clark. Executive Business, notice number one. <coughs> Ms Birch. Present the Education and Care Services National Law Bill 2011 together with its explanatory statement and Human Rights Act compatibility statement. Clark. Bill for an Act to apply a national law relating to the regulation of education and care services for children. Ms Birch. I move that the bill be agreed to in principle. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Ms Birch. Thank you. It is my pleasure to table the Education and Care Services National Law Bill, National Law Act Bill um, 2011. The bill provides for the introduction in the ACT of the single national regulatory system for childcare, family daycare, outside school hours care, as well as for ACT government and independent preschools. 
It proposes the adoption of an, in the ACT of the Education and Care Services National Law as applied law of the Territory. This national law contained in the Schedule to the Education and Care Services National Law Act 2010 Victoria. In applying the national law, the Bill implements the National Quality Framework, which aims to raise the quality of care to children in early childhood, as well as outside school hours care services. The National Quality Standard will come into effect in the ACT on 1 January 2012. The new laws and regulations will introduce a new National Quality Assessment and Rating System, it, which will see services assessed and rated against each of the seven quality areas of the national standard. These quality areas are educational program and practice, children's health and safety, physical environment, staffing arrangements, relationships with children, collaborative partnerships with families and communities, leadership and service management. Mr Speaker, the assessment and rating system will drive continual quality improvements within services and the rating will provide families with better information for making choices about their children's education and care and these ratings will be published. The assessment and rating process will be carried out by the regulatory authority in the ACT which will be the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Services. The department will delegate some of its authority to the Department of Education and Training to support the ACT government preschools. A national body is also being established, based in New South Wales, called the Australian Children's Education and Care Quality Authority. The authority will coordinate and guide the national quality framework and ensure the consistent and effective implementation of the new system. Mr Speaker, the new regulations will be phased in over the next 10 years to give services time to adjust to the new standards. There will be two key impacts the ACT services will need to address, namely the educator to child ratio and the qualifications of staff. In the terms of compliance, the ACT already meets the new educator to child ratio outlined in the standards for the, over, for the children over the age of two. However, from 1 January of next year, ACT services will deliver care for children under the age of two who will need to move from a one to five ratio of carer to child to a one to four ratio of educator to child. The ACT government and independent preschools will be required to move to a ratio of one educator to 11 children to align with long day care from January of 2016. The current ratio is two educators to 25. The Department of Education and Training in the ACT advised that it will be compliant by 2014, two years earlier than required. From January 1, 2014, 50% of educators will need to be qualified at a diploma level or actively working towards the qualification. The remaining educators will need to have or be working towards completing at least a certificate three in children's services. An early childhood teacher must also be provided in all long day care centres. In this regard, it is recognising that there is a school shortage of qualified early childhood educators across Australia and actions <coughs> continue to be taken to support the sector to meet the new qualification requirements. The Australian Government has removed regulated fees to attract more people to the industry and to encourage those already involved to upskill. As a result, here in the ACT, we have seen a marked increase in students enrolled in the various courses available at a tertiary level through the Department of Education and Training in the Canberra Institute of Technology. The Australian Catholic Education, sorry, the Australian Catholic University and the University of Canberra continue to offer access to early childhood teaching degree. The ACT government is also contributing through investment in capital upgrades and maintenance to assist services who may wish to modify their premises to meet the new educator to child care ratio. Recently I announced a child care grants program to support eligible services in their planning for the implementation of the national quality framework. The services will be able to access up to $10,000 for planning and design purposes, equipment or fit out and fittings. Madam Assistant Speaker, there is, um, with such a significant reform, a reform that will ensure that the children of ACT enjoy quality education and care, we know that this will come at a cost. In 2009, Access, Econom Access Economics was commissioned by the Council of the Australian Governments to undertake economic modelling of the cost impacts for implementing the National Quality Framework. 
It was found that the estimated additional increase in childcare fees in the ACT would be in the order of $2.75 per week in long day care in 2012, up to $11.39 by 2015. This equates to 55 cents a day in 2012 and $2.39 per day in 2015. Miss, um, Madam Assistant Speaker, those modellings remain valid. The Australian Government will continue to pay at least 50 per cent of the out-of-pocket expenses of families that claim a childcare rebate. For some families, the Australian Government will, through its combined childcare benefit and childcare rebate, cover the majority of the cost. The Australian Government estimates that these benefits and rebates have resulted in childcare costs to parents dropping from 13 per cent of disposable income in 2004 to 7 per cent currently. Madam Assistant Speaker, these changes are significant and are driven by the vision that by 2020 all children will have the best start in life to create a better future for them and the nation. We know that parents want high quality care for their children. We know that they want meaningful and caring relationships between the educators and the children and parents. Few would disagree that children deserve their very best education and care and we recognise and accept the increasing volume of evidence that early learning is critical to a child's development and that education and care services play an important role in this regard. Quality early childhood education provided by qualified, well-trained educators gives children the best start in life by helping develop children's literacy, numeracy and social skills in the years before compulsory schooling. Quality early childhood education ensures that children during their early years are able to learn and grow in positive, nurturing environments. Under the new national laws, parents will be able to, uh, parents will be able to consistently um, high education and care wherever they live in Australia or the ACT. Parents and carers will be provided with detailed information so they are in the best possible position to choose the education and care options that best suits their needs. Madam Assistant Speaker, educators will move, will have more time to spend with individual children, allowing for more positive relationships and interactions. Educators will experience greater job satisfaction and will be more likely to stay within the sector. From a business perspective, the bill seeks to, introduce, to reduce the regulatory burden on operators by replacing existing separate licensing and quality assurance processes. A single national regulatory system will minimise administrative processes for services and improve the cost effectiveness of the regulatory framework. Finally, Madam Assistant Speaker, the national law will be reviewed in 2014. This review will consider if children's services outside the scope of the national law could be included in it. It will also consider the effectiveness of the law in achieving the goals set out by the Council of the Australian Government's agreement. I would like to thank the providers in the ACT for their commitment to children and families and to the reform process. I also acknowledge the important partnership between DHCS and the Department of Education and Training in addressing these important changes. Madam Assistant Speaker, the first five years of a child's life does last a lifetime. This bill recognises there are lifelong benefits of quality early childhood education, and I commend the Education and Care Services National Law ACT Bill 2011 to the Assembly. The, um, the question is that the debate be adjourned. Oh, sorry. Um, the question is the bill be agreed to in principle. Uh, well, Madam Assistant Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. Thank you. The question is that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I believe the ayes have it. The question now is that resumption of debate be made an order of day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I do believe the ayes have it, Clark. Assembly business, notice number one. Mr Corbell. Uh, thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. I move the motion standing in my name on the notice paper relating to the referral of election matters <coughs> excuse me, to the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety. The question is the motion be agreed to. Mr Corbell. Thank you, um, Madam Assistant Speaker. Uh, Madam Assistant Speaker, members would be aware that last week the government introduced two bills relating to recommendations made by the Austra ACT Electoral Commission as a result of its report on the ACT Legislative, Legislative Assembly election of 2008. Those two bills deal with a range of matters that the Assembly identified as matters worthy of consideration by this place as a result of its conduct 
of the 2008 ACT Legislative Assembly election. The government has indicated that it believes uh, that a, most of the recommendations made by the Electoral Commission should be agreed to by this Assembly and has introduced uh, bills to that effect. Uh, however, I, I have indicated uh, last week, Madam Assistant Speaker, that the government believes it is prudent and sensible for matters of this nature to be properly considered uh, by the relevant standing committee of this place prior to any debate occurring on any changes to the operation of the ACT's electoral laws. For that reason, I am moving this referral this morning. The referral will allow uh, the committee to uh, inquire into the provisions proposed in both the Electoral Legislation Amendment Bill 2011 and the Electoral Casual Vacancies Amendment Bill 2011. It will also allow it to have particular regard to the issues arising from the Electoral Casual Vacancies Amendment Bill 2011 in relation to the application of the entrenchment provisions uh, under uh, ACT law. Uh, and it will also allow the committee to look at the report of the Electoral Commission into the 2008 election as a whole. These are matters that are always of significant interest, I know, to all parties and members in this place, as well as, obviously, to the broader community. And the referral to the relevant standing committee uh, will allow uh, that discussion and that examination to be a detailed one. And in particular, I believe it is an important opportunity for members of the community with an interest in these proposals to have their say and to have those matters reported back to the committee, uh, to the assembly by the committee. Uh, as I indicated last week, Madam Assistant Speaker, uh, I, did, uh, I did consult, uh, uh, I have, well, I have subsequently consulted with the chair of the standing committee, Mrs Dunn, uh, in relation to this matter. Uh, she has indicated to me uh, that uh, she is supportive of the uh, proposal uh, as it has been uh, placed on the notice paper, and I would ask members to support this referral. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mrs Dunn. Madam Assistant Speaker, uh, the Canberra Liberals will be supporting this referral uh, of the, uh, the two electoral acts to the uh, Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety. Um, it is, I think, unusual, uh, and it hasn't been the past practice, that electoral acts are referred for inquiry to the to the equivalent commit the appropriate committee, but um, I think that that, that uh, electoral matters are of of the utmost importance in the ACT, and that there is a a very good argument for um, exposing uh, them to more community discussion than than is normally the case here. And I think that it's a good practice, and I welcome the opportunity. I particularly welcome the opportunity to uh, expose to uh, public discussion. The proposals put forward by the government in their uh, in their uh, casual vacancy legislation, um, it is uh, not not a surprise that the Canberra Liberals uh, have reservations about the proposal and uh, and concerns about the government's motivation for this. Uh, and I would look forward to um, uh, um, a vigorous discussion on these matters through the channels of the of the. Um, Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety and allow the community to participate in, in that because I think that there are, amongst those people who hold views about uh, um, our electoral system and there are many people, including myself, Madam Assistant Speaker, who have a long history um, associated with the establishment of, uh, and the entrenchment of the Hare Clark system in the ACT and it's more than a sentimental attachment. Um, and I think that there are man many members of the community who have considerable concerns about that uh, um, and would welcome the opportunity to uh, fully explore the issues raised in, in the bill um, because I think they, they do cause some trouble to the community. Uh, and I, I have, as, Ms., as the minister said, had discussions uh, with uh, the minister. I'm not sure whether the minister had discussions with other members. I didn't because I understood from, from uh, the words, the dis the, the discussion that he actually no that's not true we did discuss it in the we did discuss it in the committee sorry uh, a momentary lapse there we did discuss it in in committee and that there is was general agreement amongst uh, committee members that uh, 
that they would welcome this, this reference. Um, I do apologise for that, Madam Assistant Speaker. Um, but I, uh, I didn't, uh, outside the committee, discuss this with, uh, with, mem with the, the members of the committee, and I, and I don't know whether the minister did. It may, uh, he may wish to. It would have been courteous for him to do so. I hope that he did. Um, but we don't have a problem with the ref this reference, uh, and I look forward to the inquiry. The question is the motion be agreed to. I think Mr Hargraves got... Um, Madam Assistant Speaker, I rise in the capacity as Deputy Chair of the, of the committee uh, to welcome uh, the referral of, of this, this matter to the committee. Um, for the record and for members who weren't here during this, this particular uh, period, um, I was the Deputy Chair of the same committee when we considered uh, issues around the size of the Assembly, um, the um, number of uh, years of term we would have. Uh, and I would remind members that um, there was public consultation on that issue, which actually resulted in the community uh, accepting the argument about a four-year term for the Assembly as opposed to a three-year term. It was also determined that the community was not ready at that point to increase the size of the Assembly from 17 to either 21, 23, 25, 27 or 35. Those were the figures that were advised by various experts in the field, particularly, in fact, um, a professor whose name escapes me from Tasmania, who was very, very uh, well read in this particular matter. That, was con that, that particular inquiry followed on uh, from the Pettit report into the Assembly. And, uh, um, what we saw happening was that the community was invited to engage in matters of sovereignty in the ACT. And I, I observe now that the question of the ACT's sovereignty is very much alive and well out there in the community conversation, whether or not we should govern ourselves. I think, therefore, it would be a bit uh, inappropriate for us to just consider this particular proposal, particularly the one on, the, on casual vacancies, Philly without a public engagement when we are actually having our community have this sort of, this sort of subject right in the front of their minds. Um, we need to look at that against the background that uh, the right to vote and the right to participate in the political process is something which we particularly value here in the ACT and Australia generally and for which people are dying overseas in, in the conflicts that we're seeing where democracy is starting to get a foothold. Um, and I, I just think that it is so important that when we talk about the fundamental principles which govern the ACT Legislative Assembly, that we don't just think of a good idea from one person, which in this case we believe it is from the Electoral Commissioner, and then just vote on it, discuss it, vote on it and pass it here. And generally things get passed on party lines here anyway. We need to be able to say that the community was given its opportunity to have a say. When I looked into, uh, as the Deputy Chair of the, uh, of the committee last time, I found that the community engagement was not all that wild, I have to tell you. If, you. if people go back and have a look at the committee report, you'll find that the submissions to the committee's inquiry were quite, uh, quite few. I had hoped, for example, that um, academia might have been engaged in the, in the proposal to increase the size of the Assembly or increase its tenure, but I was uh, very much uh, disappointed about that. And I would hope that I'm not disappointed again that, uh, in fact, the, uh, the people who find it quite, uh, uh, quite amusing to write to the Canberra Times and belt uh, this so-called toy parliament, for example, that find that they can slag off about the, uh, the members and the processes in this place, are now, I believe, we are now giving them an opportunity to do it officially and come before the committee and, and either do it in writing or appear before an inquiry, whichever the, uh, the committee decides is the best way forward. I wanted to take this opportunity, because I know that the media are listening, for them to cover this. I want to actually to have the conversation with the community, with its parliament, having a conversation with the community about a proposal that the Electoral Commissioner believes is a good idea. It needs to be understated. Sorry, it needs to be uh, needs to be stated strongly that this is not a referral to a committee of an idea that the government has come up with. This is a, this is a series of recommendations from the electoral commissioner, with which this side of the, of the house actually agrees. But it is still, nonetheless, 
The recommendation of the Electoral Commissioner. Now, the, this particular Electoral Commission has been here since uh, day one and has seen the evolution of processes as we've, as we've gone through the electoral process. For example, the electronic voting and how that actually applied. It was this Electoral Commissioner who pushed that, that proposal forward and it, and it got legs and now it's an, uh, an integral part of the way we do things. It's an integral part of our democratic process. And the, any recommendation that comes out of the Electoral Commissioner is about our democratic process. And we really need not to have it just dealt with here in the same way we may do with the planning rig. We need to have it make sure that every person who is entitled to vote has an opportunity to participate in this. One of the things that we're talking about here is lowering the age for people to actually register for their vote. And I have to tell you, uh, trying to get people who are aged 25 and, and uh, younger engaged in the political process, which is about their future, is one of the most difficult things I've done in my uh, 13 and a half years in this place. I find it very difficult. So here's another opportunity where we can go out there and start to engage with people. So, uh, Madam Assistant Speaker, as I say, I particularly welcome this, re this, uh, this reference and I look forward to the discussion in the committee around how we're actually going to progress it, how we're actually going to go out to the community and say, please engage. Um, I, I think I'm the only, um, yeah, I am actually the only member on the committee that was there the last time, so I do have some contribution to make about the lack of um, promotion of the inquiry out there in the community. When we did it last time, we, we did the usual story. We stuck an ad in the paper and then that was it. And I don't think we can do that this time. We've now got other media that we can employ. We've got Facebook type, type approaches and all this sort of thing to reach a particular part of the community that wouldn't otherwise be aware that we're actually doing it. So uh, I look forward to engaging uh, very, very heavily in this particular process and I welcome the referral from the, uh, from the Attorney General. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr Rattenbury. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. The Greens will also be supporting this referral to the committee. Uh, as members have touched on previously, we think that these are important matters that warrant some further scrutiny. I think that um, some of the issues that have certainly occurred to us in, uh, in a first look at these bills are that, and as I think as the attorney highlighted in his introductory speech for them last week, uh, the government has not agreed to all of the recommendations from the Electoral Commission and there seems to be some um, and he spoke to some reasons around that and I think it warrants further scrutiny that some have been supported and some have not. And uh, I make no comment on the merits of that at this stage, but I think given that it's not a consistent approach, it is worth exploring these more closely. And I think the other obvious issue is the, is the one of casual vacancies. Uh, I think that the proposal from the government exposes some real tensions. Uh, and I think Michael Moore's article in this week's City News probably highlights those tensions quite well at the, the uh, and perhaps the proposal picks it up too in the sense of perhaps wanting to ensure some stability through the term of the Assembly versus the notion of uh, the ultimate act of democracy and that uh, the preferences that elected a member are the ones that continue to choose a member through the course of that term. I think there, are, there is a real tension there and one that does warrant further conversation both amongst the members of this place and also with other members of the community, which the community process will provide an opportunity for. And I think uh, there are even some scenarios there which I've not been able to resolve in looking at the legislation yet around what happens if um, we go down a path where uh, there are nominees from a certain party and yet those nominees don't prevail out of the preferences and what, how does that play out in terms of what the government's suggested policy approach is here. So, uh, those questions will all be no doubt explored in the committee uh, and the Greens will be supporting the referral today. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say oh, all those of that opinion say aye? The country no? I do believe the ayes have it. Clark. Business, order of the day number one, standing committee on planning and environment from the sixth assembly. Government response to report number 34 entitled Inquiry into the Namadji National Park Draft Plan of Management. Resumption of debate on the motion, Mr Stanhope, that the paper be noted. Um, Mr Rattenbury. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. I must say it does seem a little odd that we are here today discussing the government's response to the committee's report into the draft Namadji Management Plan, particularly as the final management plan was released last year and we discussed that matter here in the Assembly uh, in August last year. In some ways it would be more appropriate use of the time for the government to actually give us an update 
on how they are going implementing the management plan rather than us assessing the government's response to the committee's report into the draft plan of management, which has now been superseded by the final plan of management. But nonetheless, that's where we find ourselves today, and so I'm going to take some opportunity, this opportunity to make some comments on uh, that government response. And I guess issues around the state of the park generally, which is perhaps where the debate really is at now. We noted last year that there has been no funding for a state of the park report for Namadji. Annual reporting against the management plan is something that stakeholders have been keen to see. And perhaps if we had annual reporting against the management plan, it would be the government that would be here today giving us an update on the progress against the management plan. We also noted previously that the state of the, of the park report would come into its own as an indicator of the ecological values of the park. This would be welcome, especially against a backdrop of an increasing number of anthropocentric indicators for parks and reserves as we saw in last year's budget papers in a, a matter that I raised in the estimates hearings. Ecological indicators would actually put front and centre that the primary purpose of our national parks is their conservation value, not their recreational value or some other value. This doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't or can't use our parks for recreational purposes. It's simply that recreational pursuits should not be undertaken at the expense of ecological values when it comes to national parks. The management plan doesn't cover reporting against its own action, and that is a shame. I can imagine, given how it seems the government is resigned to an underfunded park system here in the ACT, that it was felt that annual reporting may be too expensive. I would encourage the government to reconsider this, as I think that ultimately we cannot provide good management without good reporting, and that a lack of reporting is the first step along the path to poor management. More importantly, how do we even know if the management plan we are putting in place is effective in delivering the outcomes that we want if we aren't doing a regular uh, and thorough reporting process? Now, I understand there has been some new work put out recently that was undertaken by Graham Warboys and Roger Good on assessing the health of catchments in Namadji and costs associated with good management of the park. To date, I haven't been able to uh, get a hold of a copy of that report, but I hope I can do so shortly as I'm sure it will contribute greatly to the thinking about how we might implement state of the park reporting. Now, regarding the management board, I feel I am repeating myself here, but we know that one of the difficulties for Namadji over the past few years has been the lack of a functioning board of management. The interim Namadji advisory board concluded in August 2007, and in spite of being told there were negotiations underway to re-establish the new board, to my understanding, there still has not been any board of management established, and there continues to be no involvement from our Indigenous community in overseeing the park. We, we would really appreciate an update from the government on how this is progressing, because time is slipping away. And it's now been nearly four years since the interim board of management was concluded, so it's debate, today's debate provides the Chief Minister with an ideal opportunity to update us on exactly what's going on here, because that really is an unsatisfactory situation, four years since the Interim Board of Management was wound up. Now, I've already touched on recreational issues in the park and how they should be properly managed in order to protect the ecological values of the park. But I would like to touch on this further because to date, as far as I'm aware, we haven't seen anything much done on an outdoor recreation strategy by the government. Though I understand there has been some work done in some of the nature parks in Canberra in regards to this. Uh, for example, the work that's currently being undertaken on Bruce Ridge to deal with the impact of mountain biking in that nature reserve and the consequences that has for other areas. I've said before that where there is potential for conflict, we need to bring groups together and get some clear guidelines on how we will proceed. There is no benefit to the park for groups to be at odds with each other, and there is much to be gained by groups that collectively value the park uh, to understand where each other is coming from. And I think that's an important point because uh, I know many in the mountain biking community using this as a particular example who value the nature parks very highly and would be uh, distraught at the idea of doing any sort of permanent damage. And I think that uh, there are many in the, perhaps what you might call the conservation movement, who are quite open to having recreational activities undertaken in the parks but want to ensure there is no permanent damage. And so there's a lot of common ground to be explored there. In this context, I think there would be merit in developing an ACT-wide strategy on recreation Although I understand those who have reservations about this approach who say that with such limited resources, 
uh, perhaps we shouldn't be so ambitious and we should simply focus our efforts on on-ground delivery of services. But I think a piecemeal approach is also frustrating for the many user groups. Uh, and those groups are quite diverse, the horse riders, motorbikers, mountain bikers, uh, runners, really the recreational users of all persuasions. Uh, resolving this issue can only improve the pressure on, on how those pressures are managed when it comes to our natural areas, and particularly for an area such as the Magi, which is so important. I think of great concern to the Greens when the plan was released was the issue of large-scale recreational events in the Magi. And while the government did not follow the recommendations in the committee's report to reinstate the table giving guidance about the size of large events that were suitable, I recall that the government did give a commitment to undertake a full review within 12 months of the capacity of the major sites in Imagi that could be used for large-scale events. We look forward to seeing the outcome of this review and hopefully there will be the opportunity for public consultation on this so that we can determine what is, suitable for, what is a suitable event for each site and provide guidelines to those who wish to hold events. I'd quickly like to touch on a few of the other recommendations in the report and perhaps areas where we can we are, we are unsure where things are up to. Now, recommendations 15 to 17 talk about commercial operators. And again, we are unsure what is happening here and whether or not commercial operators are being accredited. Uh, and again, this might be an update, that, an issue that the Minister will provide us with an update during this debate. And if not, we'd certainly hope to see it soon. Recommendations 9 to 15 cover horse trails. The report made a number of recommendations about the use of horse trails and facilities and the monitoring of that use. It would be useful to see how this is progressing, because again, I'm sure that the horse riding community would appreciate being involved in discussions about progressing this, as well as the MPA. And that brings me back to the point I was just making. We need to not let these discussions descend into one side against the other, but rather uh, work through finding good outcomes uh, and getting the best outcomes for our parks, whilst ensuring that those who seek to use them can do so where it's appropriate and do so in a responsible way. I would be interested to see how the park services and the user groups feel the monitoring of the use of parks by horse riders is progressing as part of that understanding, as I'm sure they all have the values of the park at heart. Uh, recommendation 19 covers fire management. Sub-regional fire plans appear to be going according to the environmental protections required, and at this point we don't have any concerns, although we have had reports of ad hoc burning of roadside verges along the Baboyan Road from time to time outside of the approved strategic bushfire management plan. And perhaps that's another area that the government could give us an update on because uh, there may be useful information that we're not aware of that uh, relates to that, those reported ad hoc burns. Uh, in concluding, I think that I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this issue today. As I said, despite my earlier comments about perhaps the the somewhat odd timing of it. Um, we've seen reports recently, and there continue to be question marks about resourcing of our parks uh, and about the range of numbers that are available to them and the ability they have to deal with ongoing issues such as weeds. Uh, certainly in the recent discussion about weeds, I was concerned, for example, to see that uh, in the government's operational weeds program, uh, some areas that have been previously treated are not being followed up. And this speaks to uh, an issue of efficiency because if the money's already been spent and most of the money for controlling weeds is in the upfront initial assault uh, on, a, on an area of weeds or a species of weeds in an area, um, it's ex far less expensive but nonetheless very important that the follow-up work be done so that that initial work is not cancelled out by regrowth uh, or by some sort of comeback from the species and particularly in such a, a year where we've had such good rainfall and such ideal growing conditions as, we, as we've all experienced in our own gardens, uh, to have follow-up projects not being undertaken has a real potential to undermine the good earlier work that's been done. Um, so we are concerned about that. We'd also urge the government to seriously consider um, how they're going to ensure the ongoing proper funding and resourcing of Namaji. We've seen the recent discussion paper from the Commissioner for the Environment I think that produced some fairly strong public reactions uh, and I think it's important that we keep that discussion going because there is a chronic underfunding through both, I believe, at the National Parks and our nature reserves with the Canberra Urban Nature Park, perhaps it's the way to describe it, um, problems of rabbits, weeds, erosion, uh, support for park care groups. Now, these are ongoing issues that uh, 
particularly apply in the urban environment, but also an issue in the Magi National Park. So um, overall, I, I, as I said, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss this today. I hope that this is an opportunity for the government to provide us with an update on uh, some of the questions that we've raised today and undoubtedly some of the other questions that arise out of the plan of management. And um, we look forward to that continuing discussion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mrs Dunn. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. Madam Assistant Speaker, Mr Rattenbury has touched on, on some of the, some of the uh, extraordinary issues of why we're here today. And it seems <clears throat> that this debate is, is essentially a, an insult to the intelligence of, of the Assembly and to the people in the ACT who are passionately interested in the operation of Namaji National Park. It's also an insult to the work of the members of the Planning and Environment Committee of the Sixth Assembly, of, and I was a member of that committee um, uh, at the time when this, this was put through. And I think that the government shows how little regard they have for the administration and management of Namaji National Park that they would bring this item on today with so little to show for it. And Mr Brattenbury touched on the issue of the Namaji Advisory Board was a matter that was discussed at length by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the committee in which the government has done nothing. The, the, the time, the point was made that the, committee, that the advisory board was, t was treated with considerable discourtesy and the fact that the, although there have been government commitments to re-establish the advisory board, um, some four or five years down the track there has been no, no progress on that. Despite commitments from successive governments that there should be Indigenous involvement in the management of Namaji National Park. There, there did appear at some stage to be bipartisan support for this, but, not under, but under this government, again, their actions speak louder than their words. They've made commitments, but they've not followed up on them. Um, on Tuesday this week, Madam Assistant Speaker, the Attorney-General um, used an important piece of legislation as a filler because the government had no business. And again today, we're putting forward this piece of, uh, this, uh, this report, which is so outdated um, because the government has no business. And, and it's, it's so outdated, and Mr Rattenbury has touched on it, that in fact the government has responded, we're talking about the government response to a to a Sixth Assembly inquiry. And not only have they responded, but they've actually acted on it. In, in addition to the, um, the debate today underscores the fact that, that this has been a, a tedious, tediously long process and it's well worth reviewing the history. Um, it's taken five years to get to this, to, to get to this stage. There was a draft management plan as to, uh, um, promulgated in 2005, and in December 2007, two years later, a revised draft plan of management was referred to the Standing Committee of Planning and Environment. There were some interesting goings on in the, plan that the Standing Committee of Planning and Environment, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to remind people today of the actions of some of the members of the committee who really did tr try to subvert a proper inquiry. Because when the, when the draft, the, the revised draft management plan was brought to the committee, it was not published. And as a member of the committee, I could not get it published. And so that when we conducted consultation, the community was consulting on a document that they couldn't see. They were working on the original draft plan, not the revised draft plan. And we were in this in untenable situation where, um, because we couldn't publish the document, the, uh, and, and, the, and that the responsible department wouldn't publish the document, um, I had to bring a motion into the Assembly here forcing the committee of which I was a member to publish the document. Now, now I think that the, the members of the committee, the government members, there were two government members of the committee at the time, wanted to force my hand and force my bluff, but when, when push came to shove, the minister realised what an untenable position they were in and the government agreed that the, the report should be published so that when we conducted a consultation on the draft management plan, that members of the community who wanted to contribute knew what we were talking about. It was an untenable position and it shows 
uh, the, the level of arrogance that the government has in relation to this and the lack of regard the government has in relation to the management of 63% of the Territory's land mass. And Mr Rattenbury, as well, has touched upon um, a whole range of issues about land management and about reporting on land management that, that are of considerable concern to the, to the uh, broad uh, sectors of the community. As I said before, I had to make, make the unprecedented move um, of coming into, uh, as a member of the relevant committee, coming into the Assembly to seek the agreement of the, the Assembly to the publishing of a document. Eventually, the committee reported um, on its inquiry in July 2008, and it made 22 recommendations. And in May 2010, almost two years after that, the government finally managed to respond to those recommendations. Then in August, the government released the final management plan for the Namadji National Park. And here we are today, Madam Assistant Speaker, in April 2011, eight months after the manage after the release of the final management plan, talking about the government response, which is a year old. Um, what this boils down to is the government is madly scrambling for anything, something, anything, to put on the Assembly's program to pat out the day. Because they stand for nothing, they have no program. Because they have no vision for the people of the ACT. And we, they're so desperate to put it on that they actually they actually create a situation where the sorry history of their mismanagement of Namadji National Park can be brought up for all to see again. The performance of the, the, members of the, of the Labor members of the committee was disgraceful. The slowness of the, of the, um, of, of the uh, government in this matter has been disgraceful. Two years to revise the, the draft management plan another two years to respond to the, to the government, uh, to the, the committee's inquiry. Uh, all of these things show that they have no concern whatsoever. And you, Mr Speaker, when you made remarks on this, raised a range of concerns um, about management, about resources for management, about staff for management, about cooperation between user groups. These are... What happens in Namadji is emblematic for what happens in in parks and reserves all the way across the ACT. And that you and I, Mr Speaker, have spoken uh, on a number of occasions about our concern about the running down of the parks and reserves uh, and, and, their in, and their inappropriate, their perhaps inappropriate use. And it's time, and I, I do welcome uh, some of the discussion from the Commissioner for the Environment around, um, around the issues of of the management of the parks and how we might deal with it. And it is time that we started to have some, uh, some innovative uh, looks at how we might be more innovative with the management of our parks because we do accept that land management is a very expensive practice and that there are some areas which are of higher values uh, than others and that perhaps our, our, the, the real thrust of our money should be going into maintaining the areas which are more pristine. And I, the, we have to actually look at the history of, of what is now Namadji National Park, and it is not all pristine wilderness. For many years, it was farmed and gra it was grazed rather than farmed. For many years, it had freehold properties on it. In the time that I have been in this assembly, uh, as, a, as a staffer and as a member, we have gone through a process of removing a pine plantation from the middle of Namadji National Park and. Re, uh, and letting it return to, um, to native bush. That is not pristine land. The removal of the Bobian pines, in, which commenced in, in, I think, 1998, uh, indicates that not all of the areas in the Madji National Park are pristine and that we need to be much more innovative in the way that we manage this vast area of land in relation to ensuring the, cons the conservation value values of the, the high integrity areas and appropriate management of those which are of lesser value in terms of their biodiversity and their, 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 sort of their natural history. And these, these things need to be done in, con in concert with a whole range of people who want to use the park 
and are entitled to use the park because they pay for its management for a range of uses. Um, Mr Speaker, the government, the government putting this uh, matter on today has been extraordinarily cynical. Um, they really, you are correct. They really, if they wanted to do something, they should be reporting upon the management plan as it as it's currently promulgated, uh, and and what they are going to do to improve the management, the weed control, the vermin control uh, in 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 the in the Magi National Park. How we go, how the Magi National Park uh, interfaces with its neighbours, both here in the ACT and across the border in New South Wales. Uh, and these are the things that we should be dealing with. We should be dealing with um, what the government's vision is for the Alpine National Parks and how we ensure that the, the, the string of Alpine, the, the, the strings of high quality Alpine areas are, are preserved um, and protected from bushfires and the like, and vermin and the, uh, the infestation of weeds, how we maintain our water catchments. These are all the issues that we should be de dealing with not things which are essentially dead and buried because the government, even, even the government after five years has moved on from there. Um, as I said before, Mr Speaker, this proposed motion today is insulting and I'd really rather hear from the Minister about what he proposes to do in the future, for the future management of Namaji National Park than casting over, the, the, over decisions which have already been made and have already been implemented. Yeah, the question is that the report be noted. Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Namaji National Park, as we know, was declared in 1984. The park covers uh, just under half of the ACT, supplies most of our domestic water supply, protects a diverse range of mountain wildlife, contains evidence of Aboriginal occupation dating back 20,000 years, and of course is a treasured recreational area for many Canberrans. The size and significance of Namaji warrants careful and coordinated planning, and I'm, I'm confident at least, unlike some of my colleagues here, and grateful for the fact that the Namaji National Park Plan of Management does enable that. The plan establishes primary management objectives and ultimately aims to protect the natural and cultural values of the park in perpetuity. The plan addresses threats such as feral animal and weed invasion, fire regimes and climate change, which may have adverse impacts on these values. It sets out policies for community participation and engagement in the park and for encouraging people to visit, learn about and appreciate the park. It's one of 11 national parks and reserves in the Australian Alps that are collectively known as the Australian Alps National Park. These parks are listed on the National Heritage List under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Interestingly, surveys conducted by TAMS estimate that there are over 200,000 visits to Namaji National Park every year. 60% of uh, those are repeat visits, and uh, I find it interesting that of uh, the 200,000 visits, 24% of visits only are made by Canberra residents. The survey for the past year re reveals that the most popular recreational activities are bushwalking or hiking, camping, enjoying scenery, visiting cultural sites, bird and animal watching, picnicking, mountain bike riding and four-wheel driving. I'm sure members uh, most particularly haven't regarded the contributions to this debate so far today. Uh, would be interested to know that 92 per cent of visitors are satisfied with their experience in Namaji and 93 per cent of visitors are satisfied with the management of the park. The Visitor Information Centre ranges in the services provided by volunteers also rank very highly. Last April the three-day Australian Orienteering Championship was held in, championships were held in the Canberra region and, and on one of these days the event was held in the Gudgeonby Valley and over 800 people attended. Although there was some community opposition prior to the event, it was approved subject to the event organisers providing comprehensive plans for risk management, temporary traffic control, emergency evacuation, waste disposal and communications. To address those concerns about potential impacts uh, on the environment, TAMS and Orienteering ACT developed a robust independent monitoring program to assess the impact on the park. The monitoring program is overseen by a steering group which includes the National Parks Association. The results of the monitoring indicated that there are little or no discernible significant adverse impacts on the bays of the park as a result of an event such as an orienteering event uh, participated in by 800 people. Many other organisations, of course, also uh, use the park for recreational events. 
The Namaji Plan of Management commits the ACT government to preparing a policy document to guide the assessment of applications for events in the park, and the events policy will cover different types and sizes of events, including large events, and will take into account the need to protect the natural and cultural heritage values of the park. Mr Speaker, the natural world operates in a complex and unpredictable manner. It's foolhardy to assume that our knowledge is complete or unchanging. The plan of management establishes the fundamental and simple concept of evidence-based management. Evidence-based management is achieved through scientific inquiry, carried out through survey monitoring and research, surveying ecosystems and species aims to build an inventory of vegetation communities and individual plant and plants and animals where they occur and their association with each other. Monitoring focuses on key populations, species or environmental conditions and how they change over time, while fundamental research aims to tease out and deepen our understanding of the relationships between species and the functioning of landscapes and ecosystems. In particular, the plan of management advocates research that is applicable to park management and long-term studies that are suited to building an understanding of the dynamic nature of natural systems over time. Over the years, there has been a considerable survey effort to build survey effort to build an inventory of the natural assets of Namaji National Park. We now know, for instance, that there are 20 different vegetation communities in the park. In relation to native fauna species, there are at least 35 mammals, 14 frogs, 41 reptiles, 4 native fish and over 130 bird species. Many of the species are rare and 15 are listed as threatened. Monitoring is generally focused on these species which have restricted distributions and are under greater threat of extinction or, or, or on ecological conditions that are indicative of wider threatening species. Mr Speaker, I'll take this opportunity to highlight several examples of ongoing monitoring for individual species to indicate the scope of monitoring being undertaken. One example, for instance, is that of the Brindabella midge orchid, which is only found in the ACT and is only known from a one hectare, hectare area near Bendora Dam. It was first discovered in 1992 with a total known population of 70 plants. In 2003, the site was burnt during the bushfires and monitoring of the site after the fires showed a decline in orchid numbers. Action was taken to reduce shading from other plants that sprouted post-fire and in 2010, 78 orchids were counted. A more comprehensive monitoring program which tags individual plants has now been established. The northern crobbery frog has been monitored for over two decades. It suffered a dramatic and rapid decline and it's estimated that there are less than 100 frogs left in the wild. The main reason for the decline seems to be the spread of the amphibian chytrid fungus. Concern about the rapid decline of the species led the government to the establishment of a captive breeding program. There is now an assurance population of over 100,000 frogs maintained in special housing at Tidman Billa. Without monitoring of the species, the government would, have not, would not have known of its decline and no action would have been taken. Without these actions, the species would undoubtedly become extinct in the future. There is now at least a chance that future generations will be able to appreciate the beauty and uniqueness of the species. In terms of research, there is a plethora of opportunities that arise whereby ACT government ecologists work in collaboration with local research institutions, such as the ANU, University of Canberra, Cooperative Research Centres Act or with other park agencies through the Australian Alps National Parks Cooperative Management Program to implement specific research programs focused on the natural and cultural heritage of the park. By way of example, a research project that I believe exemplifies the efforts of the government through our very professional and capable park mm -hmm. staff is the restoration of our special subalpine sphagnum wetlands and fens that were damaged in the bushfire. This research received funding from the Commonwealth, New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT governments and was undertaken by staff of four agencies and researchers including from the ANU, La Trobe, the Tasmanian government and the ACT parks. Chief Minister, one moment please. Uh, it being 45 minutes after the commencement of assembly, stop the clock, thank you. Uh, 45 minutes after the commencement of assembly business, the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 77. Mr. Hargraves. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move that the time allotted to assembly business be extended by 30 minutes. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, currently research institutions are undertaking nine different research projects. Uh, in Namaji, which includes research into lizards, birds of prey, small animals, soil ecology, plant transpiration and snow gum ecology. And park staff are also collaborating in regional climate change studies. 
The extent of the 2003 fire, where 91 per cent of the park was burnt to varying degrees of intensity, has also stimulated research in aspects of fire ecology, fire management, hydrology, water quality, repair and recovery and soil erosion. Last year, the Department of Territory and Municipal Service began the implementation of the 10-year fuel and fire management plan identified in the ACT Strategic Bushfire Management Plan. The Australian Alps agencies also recognise that Aboriginal people have cultural and spiritual associations with the mountains that go back many thousands of years and their past presence is evidence through the many archaeological and historic sites. Mr Speaker, the government is addressing, and this is an issue that has been raised in presentations today, the Assembly's recommendations that the role of the Interim Namaji Advisory Board be finalised. Individual meetings have been held with, that, with signatories of the 2001 agreement between the Territory and the ACT and Native Title Claimants and a workshop scheduled to explore more permanent options for cooperative management of Namaji. Due to unforeseen circumstances, a number of signatories were unable to attend the workshop, which is now being rescheduled. Mr Speaker, I know this is a matter of great interest and has been raised this morning, but I can assure you that the government is firmly committed to the goals. Uh, inherit in the recommendation in relation to the Board of Management, and we are doing all possible uh, to achieve an agreed outcome. Meaningful Aboriginal involvement in park management is evidenced by Aboriginal contributions to current educational research and conservation programs in Namaji. In 2008, a project was established to assess the condition of the Namaji rock art sites and to develop monitoring and maintenance protocols and skills to assist their management was commenced in 2008. To speak, Mr Speaker, by way of conclusion, I regret that uh, I'm almost out of time, I can assure members that the government takes this issue particularly seriously. It's a report that was some time in the making, but it's uh, a most uh, complex uh, issue. Uh, and I think uh, some of the commentary today, most particularly in relation to the management, is not reflected by visitor experience uh, and really at one level I think is very unfair uh, to the passion and the commitment which uh, Parks members of TAMS uh, show in the management of uh, Namaji. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Chief Minister. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Assembly business, order of the day number two, Standing Committee on Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Government response to report number five entitled Needs of ACT Students with Disability. Presumption of debate on the motion of Mr Barr that the paper be noted. Mr Dospot. Mr Speaker, I have to say that I must echo your and Ms. Mrs Dunn's comments on the previous motion that um, due to the time lapse, uh, in this case the report came out last October, um, it, and the Minister responded in, in March, it, it would have been or it would be more appropriate to in fact be getting on update from the Minister on the progress the Government has made in the implementation of the recommendations of the Standing Committee on Education, Training and Youth Affairs report needs of ACD students with a disability of October 2010. However, having said that, I thank the Standing Committee on Education, Training and Youth Affairs for looking into the needs of ACT students with a disability. This is an important matter and is in need of further consideration by, my, by this Assembly. But as my earlier comments on time lapse, um, it is worth noting that Minister Barr's belated response to this report in March, after Minister Birch's tardy formal response to the Love Has Its Limits report the other day, a deadline extension she had set for herself. I suppose to use Mrs Birch's own phrase, Mr Barr's calendar hit, head finally hit him today. We have noted the Government's response to the 30 recommendations that the committee has made, and the Canberra Liberals will continue to fight for the rights of our most disadvantaged members of our school community. We need only to be mindful of the Minister's treatment of this community last October when it decided, without proper consultations, to find efficiency savings by accessing support services that were in place for students with a disability. And this occurred only a month after the Minister released the Government's strategic plan for disability in ACT public schools for 2010-2012. Recall that in one fell swoop, the accountability elements in the Government's strategic plan like providing opportunities for consultation between stakeholders, in essence became nothing more than nice-sounding motherhood statements. What more with issues of fairness, as was the government's commitment to support diversity by developing whole school learning environments that promote recognition 
of the right to education on the same basis as students without a disability, ensuring fair access to quality education, supporting staff to implement reasonable adjustments to meet the learning needs of all students. This is the same government that, although preaching fairness, was willing to cut support teachers for visually impaired students and replacing them with text-to-speech programs to teach these students literacy. And that was one of the many other measures the government, under Minister Barr's leadership, or lack thereof, was willing to cut. We note in today's response that the government has agreed to key issues facing the school disability community, such as post-school options and pathways, individual learning plans, improved service consistency between public and non-government school sectors, and the like. This is, is a step in the right direction, but as, has, but as has been the government's track record thus far, it needs to be seen whether they will deliver on these responses. Because in Mr Barr's case, we have to be mindful of the constant spin he creates and the reality of his lack of ability to deliver on his promises. Just ask the teachers of ACT on how much he has delivered for them. The Canberra Liberals will continue to keep the government accountable on such matters and continue to push for fiscally prudent and sustainable options to improving outcomes for all students, and in this context, for students with disabilities. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ms Hunter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And um, I also would be um, interested and hope we will get an update from the Minister this morning on, on uh, where uh, he and his department are up to in progressing uh, some of the recommendations from the report that were agreed to. Uh, one of the overall things I would say is that uh, we have a number of students in our um, education system who have disabilities and who need support. Uh, in order to uh, pursue their educations. It's incredibly important that we do provide that support. And uh, although Mr uh, Dospot talks about being fiscally prudent, I think we need to go a little bit beyond that to see that, in fact, this is an issue of fairness. It's an issue of social justice. It's an issue of ensuring that those children with disabilities have the same opportunities uh, as students uh, who do not have disabilities in being able to pursue an education. So I do think that that's important uh, to put there uh, in this debate. It's also incredibly important that, the, uh, that this report from the Standing Committee and also the Shattuck Review be addressed, the recommendations, the issues that came up be addressed in this coming budget. It's quite clear that there are cost pressures within the education system. Now, this has come about for a number of reasons, and some of it is listed in the report, and that is around an increasing number of students who are coming into our education system uh, who have disabilities and an increasing complexity uh, of those disabilities. And uh, we really do uh, need to um, push the government to ensure that there are funds allocated in this coming budget to address many of these recommendations. And particularly when we go to those recommendations from the report that have been agreed to uh, by the government in their response to the report. Now, um, one of, some of the issues uh, were obviously were not new because they have been around for quite some time and parents have been very, very frustrated and so of advocates, because issues they have been raising for some years now have not necessarily been responded to. And so in reading um, the Standing Committee's report, um, I, was, I was not terribly surprised by those issues. I mean, some of it was around the overall allocation of funds in this area. Parents feeling that uh, they weren't being listened to, that they, uh, their children were not being uh, properly uh, supported through allocation of resources. Some of this came back to the scan process. And uh, I know from uh, being in an election forum uh, back in 2008, that was a big uh, frustration from parents, was that uh, they went through the scan process, but they then could not see uh, how the, that was assisting their uh, children in that it, there wasn't a transparent process around how 
their needs were assessed and then uh, resources and money flowing to ensure that uh, their educational needs were being met. Now, I do um, recognise that uh, here in the report, of course, these issues were raised. So, as I said, not surprised. It has been one that has been a real bugbear for many, many um, parents. Now, it was also raised by the Council of Parents and Citizens, the PNC, who talked about the fact that the, the uh, student-centred appraisal of need, the SCAN process, is supposed to be used to determine the need for additional resources so that these can be allocated in an equitable, transparent and consistent manner. And this does not appear to be the case. So the committee did put in a recommendation around this. In fact, there were several recommendations as you go through the report related to SCAN. And one of those was around uh, a schematic representation of the definition and funding model used to allocate uh, funds and this be pro uh, provided to uh, parents so they could see, clearly see how that works. Uh, there was also uh, recommendation 11 around the need for greater transparency in the allocation of those funds. That one's been agreed to in part uh, by the government and I would urge them to, uh, as, uh, to really take that one on board, that it is important that there be some transparency around these processes so that you don't have the situation of some parents feeling that, uh, that those who jump up and down uh, the squeakier wheels are going to get an allocation that others aren't. That's why it needs to be accountable. That's why it needs to be transparent. Uh, and this led to recommendation 15. Again, this was only noted by the government. And this recommendation uh, was around, as I said, the greater need for transparency and that maybe school-based management was an issue here, that we weren't clearly seeing uh, somewhere that it was uh, laid out, the allocation given to each school and, uh, and, and how that allocation was made. What the, uh, the government's response has simply said, oh, well, well, we'll provide you some information through the, uh, the budget process. Now, as we know, um, the budget papers have a certain level of detail, but they don't contain this level of detail. So I think that although it's been agreed in part, uh, or noted rather, that one has been noted, I do believe that this is an area that needs further work. Recommendation 18, uh, again, was in uh, a recommendation that, responds, uh, that corresponds, again, with the uh, SCAN process, and so does 19. Uh, 19 talks about uh, the need for inclusive technologies to be assessed at the same time that the SCAN process is done. And uh, if we look at uh, recommendation 18, that recommendation was about reviewing the SCAN process and establishing a mechanism to ensure funding uh, approach to allocation of resources to students uh, be focused towards maximising, maximising learning outcomes. What I find interesting with a number of these uh, recommendations that relate to, to SCAN and government's response is they very much seem to be going back to uh, the excellence in disability education in ACT public schools. So this is, this is the guiding uh, strategic document. And it, a number of responses, government responses, have sort of uh, laid their hat, if you like, on a couple of these priority areas. And in relation to SCAN, quite a few of these, uh, well, a number of these are around priority um, two of that um, action plan. And priority two uh, does outline aligning the SCAN uh, and the IEPL processes. And uh, what I guess I would like to see from this is I'm not getting a sense of timing about when these, these uh, st uh, strategic priority two will be implemented. Uh, and it would be good to hear from the Minister how that's going and where that, that, uh, some of those, that implementation of a strategic priority two is up to. Is it on its way? Are we waiting for budget allocations? What sort of work has been done in that area? Another one was around information, and this was another thing that parents really were crying out for. Where is the information? Where's the one place we can go to get all the information about the programs and 
and uh, that provide us with support, our students with support. And I'm pleased to see that, again, it refers to strategic priority number three and a pulling together of a guide, a resource guide, that will contain all of those uh, programs that are available for parents to apply to, uh, those, those resources and, and funds and so forth. And that is incredibly important. When you have a child uh, going to school, as a parent, you want to do the right thing. Uh, and as a parent of a child with uh, disabilities, particularly uh, when they, it, it presents some great complexity, there is an extra stress and pressure. And uh, of course, you are going to be uh, your child's best advocate. We want to support those parents to be their child's best advocate. And that is why it is important that we do have one place that they can to access this guide uh, to find out about these resources and programs and so forth. And I truly uh, hope that uh, this guide, uh, hopefully it will be available soon. If it's not already, again, the Minister may give us an update. But again, that we don't do a guide and then leave it, but there is some, someone and resources allocated to ensure that that guide is kept up to date because we know that uh, uh, children with disabilities will continue to enter our education system. Uh, so again, I will be very interested to hear from uh, the Minister about how all of this is going. Um, I know that uh, there are a lot of dedicated people um, in the education department uh, and teachers across the system and, uh, of course, the assistants and aides and so forth who are doing their best to support um, children with disabilities to pursue an education. Uh, I do note another one um, of the recommendations <clears throat> was around uh, the uh, NAPLAN testing and being able to pull that apart a bit for students with a disability to participate. Again, this is an issue that I know parents have raised with me, is that they do want their children uh, to have some goals that they're going to reach during their education, and they do want to be able to participate in processes such as NAPLAN. I do note that the department uh, has said that they'll be going off to talk to ACARA about how this might be uh, pursued, and that uh, looking at uh, forming a working group to uh, investigate this. Uh, it is envisaged, it says, that the outcome of this process will be a system of nationally consistent standards uh, of student learning outcomes applicable to students with disabilities. I think this is a, a good thing to be pursuing. Um, my only concern is how long it will take, because I do know that there are parents out there now who would like this up and running. So again, I would urge government to participate and to pursue this particular objective. I think it's important. Uh, so again, I would like to thank the Standing Committee for the hard work that they put into this report. Uh, I would like to thank all of those parents and organisations and advocates who participated in that inquiry. Uh, it is a very important um, uh, part of this whole debate. You have added a value to the debate with the report. And I do look forward to uh, seeing the government's response in real terms, seeing that money on the ground seeing the resources on the ground, seeing the changes to processes that are in place that are going to mean that those children and our education system are going to be given the best opportunity to achieve uh, an educational outcome um, that uh, they want, that their, that their parents expect, and that we all hope uh, that they are able to achieve. And I look forward to hearing what the government uh, has done since this report has been tabled. Mr Hargraves. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I think it's important to put on the record that uh, this is a, a report, got uh, 30 recommendations, a good engagement by, uh, by the community and by the Assembly and by the Minister, and I congratulate the Minister for putting it forward. Minister Barr, with that nice introduction. Speaker, I thank members for their contribution to the debate. Uh, thank the Standing Committee for the conduct of the inquiry and indeed all those who participated, uh, parents and disability advocacy groups in particular, uh, all have played a meaningful part in contributing uh, to the government's continued commitment to high quality education opportunities for ACT students. Uh, today is not the day to uh, outline uh, the, detail, the detail of the government's response that will be contained largely within the budget, uh, Mr Speaker, and I won't be preempting. 
I won't. I, I won't Thank be preempting. I won't be preempting uh, budget announcements today, other, other than. Other than to uh, to uh, to uh, assure members that uh, a significant feature in this year's education budget will be a response uh, in relation to these issues, particularly particularly in relation to uh, to matters of demand, Mr. Speaker, and also implementation of those recommendations. I, I note the uh, the particular interest of Mrs. Dunn. Uh, and look forward to, uh, to her considered contribution to the debate. We've seen this morning, uh, of course, the range of contributions that you get in, in debates in this area from, uh, well, from, members, uh, from the you. somewhat, uh, from the somewhat Mr. pathetic, Mr Speaker, and outrageously political through to a more considered contribution. And uh, we look forward, of course, to... Uh, well, well there, there, there are those, Mr Smith, who, who seek to characterise their contributions to... Thank you, uh, members. We seek to characterise their contributions to, to the public policy debate Members. by one of seeking genuine outcomes, and then when it comes into this place, it's, uh, it's all about grandstanding. But anyway, that's for them uh, to determine how they wish to contribute. And I, I th again, I thank members for their contribution, thank the committee, and look forward to this year's budget. Question is that the, the report be noted. Order, members. The question is the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I believe the ayes have it. Clerk. Assembly business, notice number two. Ms Bresnan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move the motion standing in my name on the notice paper relating to the proposed referral of the exposure draft of the Election Commitments Costing Bill 2011 to the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Ms Bresnan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am moving this motion today to trial a more collaborative approach to the work of committees and to the development of legislation in the Assembly. All members would have received the letter from the Speaker concerning a proposal for the Assembly committees to meet collaboratively with the Executive to progress legislation in the Assembly. I will outline key issues from that letter. The committee chairs have been discussing the matter of Assembly committees meeting collaboratively with the Executive. Concern was raised with the original proposal in the parliamentary agreement for committee chairs to meet with ministers, following advice sought from the clerk by myself. On 25th November, Mr Corbell attended a meeting of the committee mm. chairs to discuss the original proposal, and following that meeting, a paper was prepared by the Secretariat to provide details on other jurisdictions, national or international, which have established a model for collaborative committees. The paper suggested there were no examples of the model outlined in the parliamentary agreement that will be suitable for the Assembly. However, features from collaborative models in other jurisdictions could have a role for committees and legislation development in the ACT. A number of parliaments in other countries involve committees in the review of legislation, including New Zealand, the United States Congress and Scotland. With the Scottish Parliament in particular, the processes of the Parliament have determined that it would be inappropriate for ministers to participate in committee proceedings that involve the scrutiny of the executive. However, ministers attend committee meetings when proposed legislation they are responsible for is discussed. There is a two-stage consultation process. First, the executive undertakes consultation developing the legislation and then the committee considers the bills. There is evidence that the legislative process in Scotland involves a high degree of consensus and decisions typically involve the agreement of all parties. A proposal was put to the committee chair's meeting involving a process where ministers would identify proposed laws that will go to an assembly committee for consideration, working collaboratively with the executive. In the first instance, the executive would identify proposed laws that could be referred to committees when the Chief Minister tables the autumn and spring legislation program. When a law was identified and nominated, the responsible minister would move a motion in the Assembly referring the bill to the relevant standing committee and appoint the relevant ministers for the inquiry's duration. Secondly, provide for relevant departmental officers to assist the committee. And finally, arrange drafting assistance from the Parliamentary Council office. The committee would then progress the inquiry and, once completed, draft a report on the inquiry and views proposed on the bill, along with a draft bill and explanatory statement. The committee would report to the Assembly with a copy of the bill. The process could also apply to private members' bills. The committee chair's meeting supported trialling the process 
and the suggestion was that the Exposure Draft Election Commitments Costing Bill 2011 be nominated and referred to the relevant committee. The matter then went to the Standing Committee on Administration Procedure for consideration. However, agreement was not reached to progress the committee chair's meeting recommendation. This motion today seeks to refer the Election Commitments Costing Bill to the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety, appoint the Attorney-General for the duration of the inquiry and provide the appropriate resources to the committee. Mr Hargraves. Speaker, I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the resumption of debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Mr Hargraves. Would executive business be called on forthwith? Something of that order. But I can see confusion reigning. Thank you, Mr Hargraves. We're just going straight on a committee report, so I don't think that's necessary, but thank you. Thank you, Mr Hargraves. And we will move straight on to the committee reports. Mrs Dunn. Uh, Mr Speaker, I present report number five of the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety, entitled the Freedom of Information Act of 1989, together with a copy of the extracts of the relevant minutes of proceedings, and I move that the report be noted. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I am very proud today to... Uh, to present to the, committee, to the Assembly the Committee's report on the, on the inquiry into the Freedom of Information Act. The Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety has deliberated on this for some time and, in tabling this today, makes recommendations to the ACT Legislative Assembly that, in sum, um, recommend a complete redrafting of the Freedom of Information laws in the ACT. Mr Speaker, uh, these these, uh, this, these recommendations need to be looked at in the context of um, a, wide, a wide ranging commitment to openness in, in, the, in the matter of access to information. Uh, as I have spoken about on a couple of times in the last couple of days, there has been a long standing um, verbal commitment by the, AC, by the Stanhope government to openness and reform for freedom of information. And the, and Mr Stanhope, uh, when he was the Leader of the Opposition in 2001, promised reform to the Freedom of Information Act. We have seen precious little of it under, under Mr Stanhope. When Mr Stanhope was the attorney, we saw none. Uh, when Mr Corbell became the attorney, we saw uh, some changes to rules in relation to conclusive certificates that made it um, easier to issue conclusive certificates, although the Minister said that it would make it more difficult to do so. The only reforms that have been substantial are those which were foreshadowed by the Canberra Liberals uh, in the, the previous Assembly and eventually brought about in this Assembly with the abolition of most of the conclusive certificates in, in, um, in the current Freedom of Information legislation. At the same time, the attorney uh, made some other, other amendments which uh, were opposed by the Canberra Liberals in relation to the Cabinet notebooks. Um, this, is the complex, um, this is the complex nature of the history of, of freedom of information. Uh, in December 2008, there was general agreement that the whole, uh, the whole range of freedom of information laws should, should be submitted for inquiry and report, and, and this today is the, is the result of that, of that work. The major recommendation uh, of this report can be summarised fairly simply, uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, in that the recommendation is that the ACT um, adopt uh, the current Commonwealth model for the operation of freedom of information. There are some good reasons for doing this. There are other paths that we could have gone down, but the ACT and Commonwealth freedom of information law has traditionally been very closely linked and is very closely mirrored one with the other. This means, of course, that, there, that we have sh shared jurisprudence uh, and therefore that the, the decisions made in one jurisdiction can have uh, more appropriate impact in the other. The committee's report, if the, if the committee's report were implemented, the ACT would see uh, new FOI laws, as I said, Mr. Speaker, that, Mr. Assistant Speaker, that closely mirror the new Commonwealth laws. 
there would be wider publication of government information online and the full development of what has been called a push model for public sector information, improve openness and efficiency of the, free, of the freedom of information process, the establishment of an ACT Ombudsman, Privacy Commissioner and Freedom of Information Commissioner rather than relying on the Commonwealth to provide these services as, pre as currently the case, and a significant overhaul of the processes for the release of documents, and, and this will have most impact, Mr Assistant Speaker, on Cabinet documents. The recommendations would, if adopted, make a significant com contribution to democratic rights and freedoms of the people of the ACT. Um, and it is the clear view of the committee that the FOI Act needs to be brought up to date so that residents of the ACT can enjoy the same freedoms as those in other innovative states in Australia. Uh, and we also, the committee also believes, Mr Speaker, that it's important that because we are in the ACT and we are so closely associated with the Commonwealth that we need to achieve consistency of arrangements um, one of the uh, areas of, of recommendation uh, was in many ways touched on by the motion that Ms uh, Lakuta brought yesterday, um, that in this day and age information is more than ever the lifeblood of our government system and, the public, uh, and where the public, public is properly informed, government can be truly responsive to its needs and that there is much in the discussion and the recommendations in this report, Mr Speaker, that go to... Uh, the substance of Ms Lakuta's motion yesterday about the, the timely publishing of information in the, in the hands of, of, the, of the government so that, in a sense, in the words of the Hawke report, that FOI becomes a, a process of last resort for people seeking information. I think that it's important, Mr, Mr. Assistant Speaker, to note that while uh, we the, the committee was... Um, concluding its deliberations on this matter, that the, uh, the Hawke report governing the city-state uh, was made public and made a number of recommendations that touch on freedom of information and the operation of the Freedom of Information Act. In other, amongst other things, the Hawke report recommended that the government move to adopt a more proactive model of release of information held by the ACT Public Service along the lines of the Commonwealth Scheme and to support broader policy debate in the community, subject to appropriate and necessary restrictions, including um, in relation to executive privilege, security and personal privacy. In particular, Mr Hawke's review recommends that the AC government should develop an approach to proactively publish more information of the, more, more of the information held by the ACT public service, including cabinet material, to establish a chief information officer with proposed chief minister in the proposed chief minister's department, and that all FOI decisions made by the ACT Public Service be published on a central website. Um, it is true to say, Mr. Assistant Speaker, that there is an emerging consensus on the way that public that, free, that public information should be dealt with in Australia, and that that emerging consensus shows that the bill that we the, the legislation that we currently have which dates back to 1984, 1984, yes, 1984 um, is outmoded uh, and while it was probably good at the time, it hasn't been substantially changed uh, in the ACT and it hasn't been substantially changed in the Commonwealth until very recently. And that uh, a lot has happened in the discussions about administrative law and access to information and privacy in the time since the Freedom of Information Act came into operation in the Commonwealth and eventually in the, um, in the ACT. There are a few areas that I want to dwell on um, in, relation to, uh, in relation to the recommendations in, in the report. The committee makes uh, 19 recommendations in all. Um, the substantial... The, and these have been summarised essentially as as creating a new FOI a body of law which, which uh, mirrors the Commonwealth laws. Um, but, there are, uh, but there are some issues about openness uh, that I think that we, need to, um, that we need to address. Recommendations 14, 15 and 16, I think, are, 
of importance uh, to the Assembly and because they, they touch on the whole range of, of openness. The committee recommends that in framing the new Freedom of Information legislation, all, ex all exemptions be recast so that they are subject to a, uh, a single consistent public interest test subject to merits review. And the problem is, Mr Speaker, that the current FOI legislation has some conflicting public interest tests uh, and, and that makes it difficult for, for uh, administer, administrators to, to make um, uh, decisions in favour of publication because in one section the public interest test um, has a particular bent and then you go to the next section and it has a different bent and I think it's very difficult for for uh, people who administer the Act to actually know in what, in what way they should be approaching public interest when the test is different from section to section. The committee also recommend that in framing the new legislation the ACT government remove all provisions for conclusive certificates. There are still currently conclusive certificates uh, and, create a, uh, and create a legislative mechanism such that conclusive certificates issued in the past be removed as documents to which they have been applied are requested under the process so that, that what, we, what would happen, Mr Assistant Speaker, is that if this recommendation were introduced that um, if there was a fresh request for documents uh, under, the, under, the new free, under the new proposed Freedom of Information uh, Act, that those, issue, those documents that were subject to conclusive certificates, like the thousands of pages of documents uh, in this, this, that related to school closures, would have to be looked at afresh with a fresh merits review. I, not to say, Mr. Mr. Speaker, this was the only set of documents that I had in mind when we were when we were looking at, at these issues and these recommendations. But what the committee is actually saying is that, seeing the assembly has already removed and, and removed most conclusive certificates, um, that we would effectively like to to contemplate and recommend the contemplation of the retrospective removal of conclusive certificates. The committee also recommended that in framing the new legislation, the ACT government create a charges regime that reinforces a citizen's right to information rather than discouraging requests. I think that this is very important because it's, uh, there has been a, quite a change in attitude to, to charging that, uh, that practitioners and users of the Freedom of Information Act have seen since the attorney appeared uh, before the inquiry uh, um, last year and uh, the, the attorney used his appearance before the inquiry to send a message to government officials that he expected to see a much more rigorous charging regime and I've had uh, quite a number of complaints and concerns raised by members of the public that suddenly they are being charged for things that they hadn't hitherto been charged for and I've noticed that uh, members of this place, including myself, um, there have been attempts to, uh, to charge uh, for access to information. I haven't actually yet had to pay a charge, but it certainly seems to be at least a, uh, another hurdle that, that members are being confronted before they can, um, before they can uh, get access, obtain access to information that uh, is often important to the operation and, and the administration of the ACT. I had, and I, I flagged with uh, the members of the committee that I would make these comments uh, in this place because it, 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 it is by way, or I suppose, of a dissenting comment. I, I did propose a recommendation that, uh, that uh, members of the Legislative Assembly uh, be exempt from charges under the Freedom of Information Act and the, the members of the committee did not agree with that. I contemplated making dissenting comments but they were essentially the only dissenting comments that I would have made so I flagged with the committee that I would raise that issue here so as that the, the fullness of the issues can be um, the fullness of the issues that were discussed in the, in the committee can be exposed in this place. I recognise that I was the only member of the committee who held that view but I do hold that view and I suspect it is the view of many members of the Legislative Assembly who are being confronted uh, with charging on a, on a regular basis. Um, one of the other important issues, uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, is that the committee has recommended uh, that, that the ACT create an office integrating the functions of the Ombudsman, the Privacy Commission and the Freedom of Information Commissioner 
and thus replacing the services provided by the Commonwealth and creating um, a new leadership role for freedom of information in the ACT. Uh, it's a, a sort of a natural con uh, continuation of the, of the process uh, that we have we have evolved, and we are seeing that we, in many aspects of things that happen in the ACT, we are moving away from reliance upon uh, services provided on a fee for service basis by the Commonwealth. Uh, and for instance, uh, only this week we passed into the Assembly passed into law the Evidence Act, which. Um, uh, when it becomes operative will mean that we have the ACT has its own evidence act uh, hitherto we have relied on the Commonwealth Evidence Act um, here too we um, recommend that we have a standalone office this is not inconsistent with the recommendations of the Hawke review and um, the committee's view that we the committee recognizes that, that this there will be a cost associated with this but there um, but uh, and I would the committee also uh, noted that the attorney was uh, pretty much seemed to be pretty much opposed to to this on a, on a cost basis, and the minister the minister's presentation before the committee was uh, a little woeful because he uh, he basically said, well, you can't do anything because it'll cost. Was essentially you know, and if you if you propose anything, you have to remember that it'll cost, and we probably won't do anything about it. So the challenge is now open to the uh, to the government to take on board the clear views of, the, of the, the committee, which I think reflects the majority of views in the ACT Legislative <coughs> Assembly that there needs to be root and branch reform of the Freedom of Information Act. The question is that the report be noted. Ms Hunter. Mr Assistant Speaker, and I'll just make some very brief comments about the report. And firstly, of course, uh, to thank the committee secretariat and particularly the committee secretary uh, for all their hard work. As you're probably all aware, the last two or three years have been particularly significant for the development of FOI laws in Australia. And I'd like to do this to some musical accompaniment. Thank you, Ms Lakuta. Order. <laughs> Order. Ms Hunter, stop the clock, please. Um, would somebody please tell the band to leave? It's, it's disorderly. Ms Hunter, the floor's yours. The major change, of course, came with the removal of conclusive certificates and then the substantial reconsideration and reworking of the FOI scheme, most notably by the Queensland and Commonwealth governments. The key recommendation of the committee is that we adopt a similar model premised on openness and disclosure and subject to a single public interest test that balances whether there's a greater public interest in disclosure or confidentiality, and Mrs Dunn referred to the PUSH model. Exemptions should not be based on documents being part of a class, but rather on the merits of the particular case and the substance of the issue at hand. This is, of course, a key point addressed in the report, but there are other very important and complementary measures that have also been considered by the committee and recommended as positive changes for the ACT. These include creating disclosure logs so everyone can easily access information that has been released and so that there is a public record of what has and has not been disclosed and the reasons for that. The report also recommends a free and accessible proactive disclosure of government information that should be in the public domain so that people do not have to make information requests uh, but rather can freely and easily access the information on the internet. Reference uh, should, of course, be made here to the Greens motion, to Ms Lakuta's motion on Gov 2.0 and the free availability of government information passed by this Assembly on Wednesday. That was yesterday. Mr Speaker, FOI will always be contentious and it's probably fair to say that the government will always want to be more secretive and those not in the government will want them to be more open. Certainly the submissions received by the committee and available on the committee's website favoured increased openness, whilst the government's submission was less disposed to this. I think the balance that the committee has adopted is a good way forward for the ACT. It will improve community access to government information and therefore the quality of government here in the Territory. The Greens are committed to open government and the increased participation of citizens in our democracy. Improvements to the FOI scheme are a key part of this, and the Greens are very pleased that the Assembly now has the benefit of this report, which consolidates much of the extensive range of material 
that is available on FOI. This report is the beginning of the next phase in regards to freedom of information for the ACT. There is a lot of work that now needs to be done to implement the changes and of course we're also hoping for favourable government response. And the Greens very much look forward to this debate continuing here in this assembly. The question is that the report be noted. Mr Speaker, could I seek leave to speak again because I omitted uh, to Mrs. acknowledge Dunn, the you, staff? You actually can close the debate. Because well, okay. there's no other member rising, so no, you okay, have to call. Right okay. Um, in, in, thank you, Mr Speaker. In closing, I thank uh, Ms Hunter for her comments and I warmly recommend to the, to the government um, a speedy response to this inquiry. I think that uh, there are many, many groups in, P, uh, in the ACT who are anticipating that we can be part of the, the reforms in relation, to AC, in relation to FOI and the access to information generally, which was reflected in uh, Ms Lakuta's motion yesterday. And in, con in conclusion, Mr Speaker, I want to pay tribute to the hard-working staff of the Assembly Library and the, AC and the Committee Secretariat uh, uh, for the work on this rather lengthy report. Uh, and also to my colleagues, to Ms Porter, who was a member of the committee and the, and the deputy chair of the committee until uh, November 2009, and to Ms Hunter, yourself as the deputy chair, uh, to Lydia Chung from the uh, secretariat, and a, a long list of uh, committee uh, secretaries. It might seem that we are careless with our committee secretaries, but there is a good reason. Um, they all have good reasons for not being here now. Uh, Mr Hamish Finlay, uh, who moved to Canada, Mr Derek Abbott, who came and filled in a gap as Derek has want to do, Dr Hannah Jareth, uh, who was uh, the committee secretary over uh, for quite a lengthy period of the time, and our current committee uh, secretary, Mr Brian Lloyd, who has brought this report um, together and put it in such good shape. However, I did notice a typo after all of that. Uh, and to the Assembly Library, Su Chin Scholar and, and Chu, Chu Yi Lim, who have provided particular research, particularly um, uh, particular and consistent assistance with research and and uh, the, the literature search that accompanied this, and I pay tribute to them for their hard work, and I commend the uh, report to the assembly. The question is that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. <coughs> the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Ms. Lacuda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, I present report number 10 of the Standing Committee on, on Planning, Public Works and Territory Municipal Services entitled Report on Annual and Financial Reports 2009-2010, together with a copy of extracts of the, of the relevant minutes of proceedings. And I move that the report be noted. The question is that the report be noted, Ms Lakuta. I thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And first off, I would like to um, thank my fellow committee members, and in, in particular, Ms Porter, who, who as chair of the committee should be uh, presenting it, but unfortunately is still off for medical reasons, and I wish her, of course, the speediest of recovery. Um, I also wish to thank Mr Coe and the Secretariat, Mrs Nicola Cossack and Ms Lydia Chung for their hard work in preparing this report. The thing each year that I feel when we're doing the report on, on the planning public works and territory municipal services is we simply haven't got long enough. But these, this, it's a really, really big area. We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on it, but unfortunately, or possibly fortunately from the point of view of the public servants that we, that we talk to, we don't have weeks and weeks to spend on it. So I'll just quickly go through the recommendations and highlight some of the reasons why we, we talked about them. Our first recommendation was about the Heritage Council backlog. And the disappointing thing is that we keep on having to make this almost the same recommendation. There is still a heritage backlog, and this is going to become possibly more and more of an issue, as particularly I'm thinking of the Northbourne Avenue precinct, which, which has considerable heritage-listed properties on it. And we need to work out some way of getting heritage listing done a little bit more quickly. Recommendation two, again, is a perennial fa favourite um, in slightly different terms. It's about the Southern Cemetery 
and looking at the full range of, of options there, because uh, it appears that the government is focusing particularly on on crematorium, as, as, as the committee heard, a very solid piece of work was done on a crematorium, which is, which is good, but it would be really useful if solid pieces of work were done on the other end-of-life options. And we'd like to see something more about the financial impact, which we believe has been done but is not yet publicly available, which I can now have a little segue back to the, the debate earlier well, on the last debate of the last committee report about freedom of information, information availability is an ongoing problem, I think, for all committees and for all MLAs. And it's, and it's something I very much hope, as a result of my motion yesterday and, and the, the um, committee report that Ms. Mrs Dunn has just, report, just tabled, we'll see some improvement on. The next area that we talked about was weeds. Well, always, yes, and I noticed that was talked about again with, by Mr Rattenbury in the, in the report on the Manji National Park. We made two recommendations here, one about prioritisation weed management and the other was, was the ACT government looking at ways of empowering and resourcing land care and park care groups in their weed control activities. And this is important for a number of reasons. I mean, the most... Um, bottom line, bottom line reason, I guess, is because there are a lot of people who are interested and enthusiastic and to, to work on these areas. And if the government can harness this energy and enthusiasm, it's going to save the bottom line. The government simply doesn't have the resources to do weed control everywhere that it's needed in the ACT. The other way of looking at value is more positively. People feel very positively about the, the natural areas that surround them. People love the bush capital, that, which we are fortunate to live in. And there's a lot of people who would be prepared to put some effort into doing the right things to weeds. They just need a bit of, a bit of help. Um, next, we move on to waste issues. We, had, we, we looked at a number of those. The first of, of those being uh, re expanding recycling services in public <coughs> places. And this is something, of course, the Greens have been talking about for years now. It was part of our agreement with the Labor Party. And we really would like to see the ACT government actually act on this recommendation. It's something that it's clear that the public think should happen. It's something which um, the government, in various guises, has talked positively about. We particularly noted in the committee's report the public place recycling and exhibition park. And you know, the committee heard that this was working, <coughs> that this was working well, but um, it's not been expended. The, the, the other waste recommendation was about batteries and light globes, and we, we did ask for, it for um, information about what the government's plans were with this, and we understand that the government is considering this and I guess we'd like, we've asked for the government to provide an assessment to the Legislative Assembly for opportunities um, to provide household battery and light globe drop off services. And this is an area that I've been very concerned with. We've, the ACT Greens ran for a, quite a period of time a battery and light globe recycle, recycling service from our office because the ACT government did not run one, and there is clearly a major need that their toxic waste, which is not properly be, being disposed of. And I guess I should also note that the Greens have put forward a budget bid for something along these lines, and I'm very much hopeful that, that the upcoming budget will see something positive happening there. Um, we made recommendations 8, 9 and 10 were a, were a series of recommendations about action and action reporting of action data. And we basically felt part that action needed to lift its game as far as reporting on timeliness and whether, whether, uh, whether our buses were cancelled or not. There's been a recent, seems to be a recent increase in cancelled buses, or certainly increases in complaints about cancelled buses. We felt that actually action could report better with its current systems. 
but it is at present. But we even more than that, we felt that, that as it has just introduced an electronic data, electronic ticketing system, which at the time we wrote this, it was just about to, it now has introduced this. There will be a lot more data available. We would like to see better reporting and better targets. This is well within actions capabilities. And we, we, rec we echoed the uh, complaint which I made again yesterday that action does not provide bus timetable data to third parties in a usable format for other applications. This is something action could and should do. It's not party political. Everyone can recognise the usefulness of having good bus timetable data available to the public. Even Action recognises that it just has not as yet done it. Our next recommendation was about Yarralum the Creek and as someone who actually at the end of high school traced all Yarralum the Creek as part of a school project, it's very distressing to see that it has turned into a concrete drain. And we would like to see the the TAMs seriously look at restoring Yarrow and the Creek into an actual creek bed. And this is particularly timely given the activities of the development which is called Woden Green, and which the ACT government through the LBA is a, is a partner in this. Um, moving along, we, we commented on housing affordability and we we're asking for more information about this. And I, I guess I would like to say that well, we would just, our recommendation, ask for more information. Housing affordability is something that the committee is concerned about, as I imagine most, most residents of Canberra are concerned about. Um, then moving along to ACPLA, there were a couple of recommendations, recommendations 17 and 18, about clarifying the intent of various parts of the planning regime master plans, neighbourhood plans and precinct codes and their statutory imp import at present. And this goes back to the debate which we had last night because while quite a few of these things are clear to the planning authority, I don't unfortunately think they're clear to the members of the public. And so we, we were asking for clarification in this and I, um, I think it's fortunate that the Minister last night did give some clarification, but I do look forward to the government's formal response to this. We then had a series of recommendations about the technical variation process. And I think given there are um, three of these recommendations, it's pretty fair to say that the committee is quite concerned about the process. Um, and we're concerned about the, the uh, borders of when it's a technical variation and when it's a full variation and when it's just a minor change which can be made to the existing plans without either of these. I mean, Trace and Casey were the particular um, technical variations which we we're talking about, but our concerns, I think, are wider than, than that. Well, certainly my concerns are wider than that. It's something which I've... Um, previously made representations to ACPLAR about. And so it's an area where, where the committee feels that we do need more information. We also talked a bit about infill strategies and policies. And I mean, we, we noted that it's now up to 30, 70 rather than, than 10 to 90%, which is uh, presumably, a, which is an improvement. And I, I think personally, I'd say that we, while we didn't have time to talk about it, much, we actually need to have a lot more sophistication about our infill and our development priorities. Simply saying within a distance from Canberra, from, from Civic, is, is not sophisticated enough. We do have other town centres, um, Woden and Belconnen in particular, Tuggeranong and Gungahlin as, as well. It's uh, concentrating all of our development in 7.5 k's, well, half of our development, 7.5 k's from Civic, is certainly um, of some use. And I mean, I'm not a big fan of greenfield developments, but I think that we're in a position in Canberra that we can get to a more sophisticated um, conversation and look at all the town centres 
and the, and the transport nodes rather than simply a distance from civic. Uh, as I said, there are a lot more issues which are of interest and the committee touched upon very briefly, but in the limited time that we had for our, our hearings, this is really all the recommendations that we had. And so I commend the report to the Assembly and I look forward with interest to the government's response. The question is that the report be noted. Mr Coe. Speaker. Uh, firstly, I'd like to, um, to uh, thank the, the committee for their participation. Um, the chairman, uh, the chair, um, is Mary Porter, and the deputy chair, um, Ms Lakusha, who um, yeah, the last couple of months has really been didn't. acting as the, uh, the chair. Uh, so I thank her, and of course to Nicola Cossack and to Lydia Chung for all the support they provide. Uh, firstly, with regard to actually how the, um, the hearings were conducted, um, I think it is worth noting that it was uh, disappointing that we uh, had to wait until, um, until uh, this year, uh, 2011, to um, hear from the, uh, the planning minister and also to get so many of the questions on notice um, back. It would have been uh, preferable to have had those uh, um, both occur um, late in uh, 2010 when the rest of the hearings were actually um, um, conducted. Um, the uh, deputy chair has already gone through um, a number of the um, a number of the um, recommendations, and I would like to just touch on a few of those. Uh, in particular, um, I'd like to uh, touch on the, uh, the recommendations as they relate to action. Uh, for a long time, we've heard with action buses that uh, one of the reasons why they can't um, give um, information about the timeliness of their service um, and about uh, general operational standards. Um, is because of the um, poor ticketing system, um, which um, means they aren't able to collect the data. Well, now that that um, ticketing system is in operation, um, we do expect a better level of, um, of information coming from, the, um, from uh, the bus network. So to that end, our recommendations 8, 9, 10 and 11, I think really are linked to that um, insofar as they really should be able to provide better information and we expect they will be able to report as such in the annual report, um, but also to, um, to give third parties who are interested in actually complementing the, um, the action network um, with the, the data that they can easily provide. Uh, I think our recommendation 17 um, is, is particularly relevant uh, for today, given the, um, given the minister is going to be doing a, a, um, presenting a paper on master plans. Um, I think there is considerable vagaries about the state of master plans, neighbourhood plans and precinct codes, and that's why Recommendation 17 was included in this report, as we think the community really does want some clarity about where they actually sit in the entire planning process. Um, and furthermore, we'd also like to know um, what is the status of, uh, of the existing plans which are out there, um, to again give certainty for um, people in the community that are interested in, um, in, the, uh, in the future of their communities. And uh, recommendation 19, which is the final one that I'll touch on, um, is with regard to Crace and Casey uh, and the technical variation process. Uh, the planning process, I think, is, is cryptic at best um, and perhaps even deceptive at worst. And, um, and I think um, the fact that um, Crace and Casey had these uh, amendments um, that were on the table, then off the table, and are now back in terms of a technical variation, I think really does uh, shed some light into just uh, how confusing the, the planning process is in the Territory. Uh, the fact you can make such significant changes to the, to the design of suburbs as proposed in the technical variation for Crace and Casey, I think really is a worry. And I do not think it's due process. And I do not think that's what the intention of this assembly was when we actually created um, the, um, the Planning Act and the Facility for Technical Variations. Um, however, given that it has been done, uh, it would be good if um, as many people as possible could be notified of um, the technical variations. So it would be good if such variations could be included in the community zone newsletter um, and also the community councils could be notified. Again, I thank the other committee members for their uh, participation along with myself in this report, and I commit it to the Assembly. The question is that the report be noted. Those 
Do you want to speak on this, Minister? Or do I need to adjourn it? You, well, if you want it adjourned, you can move that it be adjourned. Other than the government response comes in separately anyway, doesn't it? So OK, then the question before the uh, Chamber is that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I understand that it's wish of the Assembly to suspend for lunch. That being so, the Chair will be resumed at 2 p.m. Thank you, members. Questions without notice, I call the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, on Monday 7 March, the Federal Government released the Education and Care Services National Regulations Exposure Draft. Minister, I draw your attention to Part 6, Policies, Procedures and Programs, Division 4, Relationships with Children. And in particular, I draw your attention to 861A, protection from inappropriate activities or treatment. And I quote, children being educated and cared for by the service are not required to undertake activities that are inappropriate, having regard to each child's family and cultural values, age and physical and intellectual development. Minister, it's been reported that this will affect the ability of centres to have an Easter egg hunt and celebrate Christmas. The WA Minister for Community Services, Robin McSweeney, has vowed to reject the proposed national laws labelling it as political correctness gone mad and is hoping the federal government gets a common sense base before it is adopted over there. They have foreshadowed that if the federal government does not, they will draft their own corresponding legislation. Minister, do you support this proposed law in its current form? Minister Birch. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, I'm aware that there has been some discussion about some elements of the regulation and and um, some misinformation being put through the media which suggests that centres uh, can't allow children to participate in Easter egg hunts or decorating Christmas trees. It's certainly not my understanding and I think the Federal Minister has come out and dismissed those uh, accusations or commentary as well. Uh, we have centres that are already have in place uh, a framework, a policy, a mindset that ensures that all children are able to participate or should they not want to participate in a particular activity, it is their right to do so, and they will be supported to engage in other learning activities within the centre. Mr Zeldra, supplementary. Minister, will you be drafting your own corresponding legislation if the federal government does not get a common sense base? Minister Birch. Uh, look, the regulations are still being actively uh, discussed and, uh, across the sector. There is a common sense approach. I have faith in the regulations, but I will keep an eye and ear to uh, how I can further support the sector here in the ACT. Yes, Mrs Dunn. So the expression activities that are inappropriate is not defined in the regulations. Can you advise the Assembly as to your understanding of its meaning and how it would be interpreted in the, the context of day-to-day -day operations of childcare in the Territory? Minister Birch. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank Ms Dunn for uh, trawling through the regulations, the draft regulations and the bill. The currently in the ACT, there are already, as I've said, systems and approaches in place across centres that allows the centres to develop a curriculum, a framework, an activity set that allows children to participate in what we here in Australia know regularly comes in a calendar. They, Easter, Christmas, we also celebrate Chinese New Year at the centre. Well, Order, Ms Birch, one moment, thank you. Um, it was a very specific question about the meaning of activities that are inappropriate uh, and asking for the Minister's understanding of what that is and I'd ask you to direct her to be directly relevant to the question. Uh, Minister Birch, if you'd like to perhaps Help Mr. With the I would say after that as well. appropriate activity inclu includes a, a Easter egg hunt and decorating a Christmas tree. Thank you. Minister Dana, supplementary. Minister, have any service providers or members of the public expressed concerns with you about this? And if so, how have you responded to their concerns? Minister Birch. Um, look, there's been nothing come to my office, but I'm aware that uh, the, the, the sector is actively engaged with the community, with the childcare sector in its discussions about the regulations. Nothing's come to my office that indicate that the sector here aren't clear in their mind about what's an appropriate activity. Ms Hunter, a question without notice. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Health. Minister, as you know, midwives were granted Medicare eligibility in November 2010. 
The ACT has one Medicare-eligible midwife with six others pending. Medicare-eligible midwives are required to obtain either a collaborative agreement or an arrangement in order to practise. They also need clinical privileges to provide care within the hospital system. Minister, can you outline what steps ACT Health has taken to enable collaborative arrangements and clinical privileges for Medicare-eligible midwives? Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, and this is something that uh, the government is having ongoing discussions with uh, the Greens around. I haven't got a, an update um, as of today, but I can say that I have sought advice on how to implement um, access to clinical privileges for eligible midwives should they want it. I'm not aware, I'm not aware of anyone that has sought to, to gain clinical privileges um, at, through ACT Health, but I might be corrected on that. I'm, I'm personally not aware. But uh, once the issue was raised with me, I think by Ms Bresnan, in a meeting I had with her, I have sought um, advice on how we can facilitate that and whether there has been interest in it and whether, you know, and we have to deal with that and whether there are any concerns around it. Supplementary, Ms Hunter. The ACT can currently contract a Medicare eligible midwife and can, compl and can claim Medicare payments. Minister for Health. Oh, sorry, I just missed the first part of the question. Can I explain yes, how they can? Uh, can, you, can you explain how the women of the ACT, sorry, who currently contract a Medicare eligible midwife, uh, how they can claim Medicare payments? I'll have to take that on notice. It, I must say it isn't something that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, it's through the, really through the private health system. Um, you know, in terms of women accessing midwifery care through ACT Health, that is something that ACT Health manages. But I can certainly take some more advice on it. Ms Hunter. Yes, Ms President. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, will you direct senior obstetric staff to respond to Medicare eligible midwives when communicating mandatory care plans that are part of their insurance requirements? Minister for Health. Uh, thank you. Look, I, I don't... I don't ever direct uh, senior medical staff to do anything um, because, um, you know, it's not my... Well, I don't, I don't think you can... I, can, I don't think you can take that approach um, to this issue, but, look, if, if there is eligibility and there are, is a midwife interested and in order to gain, um, you know, the appropriate supports through Medicare, they need to have pr clinical privileges through ACT Health, then I think we need to look seriously at how we deliver that. But I'm not going to say that it's going to be easy or that there is going to be broad support for it, because I know um, the medical profession, um, you know, have had some concerns around um, independent midwives and their practice, and also the risk or, or what they see as the risks of... Um, you know, working collaboratively uh, in a professional relationship where they don't have a great deal of control or say. And I think those are legitimate um, issues, but I have asked Health uh, for advice around how we facilitate um, a process where women, uh, uh, independent midwives, I should say women, where independent midwives can apply for clinical privileges at Canberra Hospital. Uh, yes, Mr Hanson. So given that the government advised that you'd be uh, absent from question time, the opposition prepared no questions, when did the government advise the Greens that you would be present at question time? The question is uh, actually not related to the initial question. I'm sorry questions. to have ruined, yeah. of sorry to have ruined your question. I can answer it just for the sake the question of, is out of, order. of, of um, cancelling the conspiracy, but we didn't... Well, why don't you ask? <laughs> order. Order. The question without notice, Mr Dospot. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, on Monday, 7 March, the Federal Government released the Education and Care Services National Regulations Exposure Draft. Minister, I draw your attention to Part 6, Policies, Procedure and Programs, Division 4, Relationships with Children. And in particular, I draw your attention to Section 86.1b. In protection from inappropriate activities or treatment, and I quote, a child being educated and cared for by the service is not separated from other children for any reason other than illness or an accident. Minister, this will end the ability of workers to use a time out as a means of behaviour management in the centres. Minister, do you support this proposed regulation? If so, what child behavioural patterns have you considered in coming to that view? Minister Birch. 
Um, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr Dosbot for his question and um, for reading uh, some inf misinformation that has been uh, put into media. Uh, the, the, well, the regulation services, uh, the regulator of services need to make sure that children are safe in their learning development and supported in education and share services. The draft regulations do not include a prescriptive definition of children being separated. The outcome is the child is Order. not removed or isolated from other children and staff on an ongoing basis. The regulation, the regulation, the regulation. Sorry about that, Mr. Speaker. I require that each child is given a positive guidance um, and encouragement towards acceptable behaviour. I go to say also that the existing uh, childcare services standards already address this issue within a behavioural guidance context. Supplementary, Mr. Dosport. Research underpins this regulation and its penalty consequences. And will you table that research by the close of business today? Minister Birch. Um, it would be extensive research that underpins this new framework. This is education Order. and care national law. The, uh, the, the, the research underpinned the bill that was put through the Victorian government back in October. It underpins the bills that are being introduced in each state and territory. So I, well, I would direct them one to multiple websites. I would do, I will bring a list what I can. But if you want me to truck in, truck in, um, I am not prepared to do that. Uh, members of the opposition, your colleague is seeking the floor. Mrs. Dunn, you have a supplementary question. Minister, what behavioural guidance context, as you referred to it, is used to determine behaviour management? In, in childcare centres as they currently operate in the ACT and is timeout uh, provisions allowed? Minister Birch. Thank you. Uh, look, it's my, it's my understanding that within uh, the current standards and what will be reflected in the new standards is that the services here maintain their compliance with the standards by not isolating children as a strategy to manage a children's behaviours. Children are in services to interact with other children. And early childhood professionals and good practice means that children should not be separated or isolated for reasons other than their own health or to assist in stopping a spread of infectious disease. Now, the professionals, the childcare workers here in the ACT are skilled at managing children's behaviour. Sometimes children have expressed uh, difficult behaviour. So it's not unusual for um, professionals to manage uh, that in their day-to-day -day environment within centres. Yes, Mr Hargraves. Thanks very much. My uh, supplementary to the Minister is what experience in, in your former life in childcare would actually enable you to be able to know the vagaries and the difficulties facing childcare centres in behavioural issues in children? Minister Birch. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Hargraves, and thank you, Mr Speaker, for that question. Uh, look, there are, are fantastic childcare professionals here in the ACT that care for children each and every day of the week, and they provide a fantastic service and support to Canberra families. Um, yes, I did own and operate a childcare centre, but as a parent, I also have experience in managing dif difficult behaviours, as I'm sure every families do, uh, with their Thank children. We all are aware of uh, the terrible twos. Uh, that's within a family context, but it is also within a service context. The regulations provide clear guidance. Our professional childcare sector here in the ACT are well aware, are well aware of their standards and are very comfortable with its implementation. Question without notice, Ms Lakuta. My question is to the Minister for TAMS and concerns the Asian honeybee. Minister, as the ACT's representative to the Primary Industries Ministerial Council, are you aware of the extensive scientific evidence presented to the recent Senate inquiry that the Asian honeybee can have serious implications on cold temperate climates like Canberra's, especially on biodiversity and the environment? Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank Ms Lakuta for the uh, question. Uh, thank you, Ms Lakuta. Ms Lakuta, I am aware of the risk which the Asian honeybee uh, represents, uh, most particularly uh, to, uh, um, I think, uh, uh, fauna within Australia. Um, 
It's been a very difficult issue. It's been problematic. It's been an issue that has uh, been uh, con considered at some length Thank by, you, uh, by most particularly agriculture ministers from around Australia. The decision has been taken, and I'm, I, I, I'm sure you're aware that the decision uh, has been taken. That the uh, the decision has been taken that uh, an eradication program uh, is not feasible. Uh, whilst uh, whilst there is a, a recognition always of the implications uh, for native uh, uh, fauna and indeed for, for our environment when uh, exotic species are introduced or find their way into Australia, and the Asian honeybee uh, is one such exotic um, bee that uh, has established in Australia. Uh, it, is a, an, it is a matter of uh, significant, concern, significant concern, most particularly to the rural sector. Uh, based on scientific advice, uh, the decision has been taken that it is not practical or possible uh, to uh, seek to contain, through a structured eradication program, the Asian honeybee. It's a matter of enormous regret, uh, but the advice that has been accepted by governments, all governments across Australia, uh, is that uh, the prospects of successfully combating the incursion of uh, Asian honeybees, that there is no prospect uh, of... Uh, uh the recent Senate inquiry. Uh, if the Minister could comment on that. Chief Minister. Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I've uh, concluded my answer. Just before you proceed, Ms Lakuta, for members of the opposition, I find your string of derisory comments both unparliamentary and disorderly and not becoming on this place. I'd ask you to desist from it. Ms Lakuta, you have a supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, what review have you done of the economic, social and environmental impacts of the eight and honeybee that could have on the ACT and Australia, particularly since the ACT is in your decision to vote again, to defund the eradication program? Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'll take the question on notice. Yes, Ms President. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the ACT government now reverse its position and vote to fund the Asian honeybee eradication program at the upcoming primary industry ministerial council meeting? Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No. Further questions without notice? Mr. Without notice, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, on Thursday, the 24th of March, you appeared on the Triple Six ABC morning radio program. You were questioned about criticism of the infrastructure grants and the fact that you are not doing enough to address the immediate problem of staff shortages. Your response was, and I'll quote, ah, well, the ratios come into effect in 2012. Um, the qualification requirements attached to staff come in effect in 2012. So 2012 in my calendar head hits me before 2014. That's why we are moving on the infrastructure grants first and foremost. Minister, 52 temporary exemptions from childcare standards were granted in 2009. 71 were granted in 2010. Mm. Already 12 have been granted so far this year. Minister, how will the implementation of the National Quality Framework, which you introduced into the Assembly this morning, alleviate the difficulty that childcare centres are experiencing in recruiting staff? Minister Birch. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr uh, Hanson for his question. Uh, we have the bill come, will come in effect. We've tabled the bill. The new regulations come in effect for staff ratios in January of next year and for qualifications for 2014. Uh, the question about supporting the sector around workforce recruitment is an ongoing challenge, not only in the ACT but across Australia. You're right, I'm looking at uh, the things that need to be done uh, now, and that is also about supporting sector to meet the ratios, which is why we've put in $10,000 grants to support the community sector. Should they have building requirements, should they have design and building plans to do, should they require some internal modifications that will support them in that? As far as workforce, we work hand in hand with the sector. The Children's Services Forum, uh, the Children's Services sector know that this is an ongoing battle. 
Uh, strangely enough, uh, the portable long service leave we consider to be a, a recruitment and retention strategy for the sector. Those opposite have no interest in supporting the sector with a portable long service leave. As far as ongoing support in recruitment, it is about training. Uh, we mentioned yesterday about we mentioned yesterday about the opportunities through CIT and UC. We also spoke about RPLing. This is just part of the ongoing strategy that this government has about supporting the sector. Supplementary, Mr Hanson. Mr. Is there a critical shortage of skilled childcare workers which must be addressed now, and not when your calendar head hits you in 2014? And if yes, what are you doing about it now in 2011? Minister Birch. Uh, thank you. Well, what we've done is worked with the sector on developing a, um, a postcard, a promotional material about a career in workforce. We also have activities uh, where at career, uh, at career events, and we also promote childcare sector as a valuable and uh, professional place to work. Yes, Mrs. Dunn. Minister, what have you done to satisfy yourself that staff shortages, uh, that staff shortages, will not be a problem? when your calendar head hits you in 2014? Minister Birch. Well, I will continue working with the sector and do what I can to facilit facilitate their workforce strategies. Yes, Mrs Dunn. Minister, when will you actually listen to the community and act upon their concerns about skill shortages? Mm -hmm. Minister Birch. Uh, I do listen to the community, I do listen to them regularly, and I do what I can as I can, which is why we've brought in uh, the grants just recently. But going, about, go, going to some of the misinformation and misunderstanding on this uh, from those opposite, I was, my attention was drawn to a City News article in January of last year. Um, where Miss Dunn, um, however, and I cannot quote from this, Mr Speaker, uh, Community Services spokesperson Vicky Dunn says the new national quali quality framework will inevitably result in increases in childcare fees. From the discussion my office has had with the Childcare Alliance, a peak body for the childcare operators, fees will increase by up to $22 Point of a day. Point Just of reducing order. the care of. Uh, Miss Birch, one moment, please stop the clocks. Thank you. Minister, I asked a question about staff shortages. Mm -hmm. Ms Birch is, try, is, is trying to, to switch to another topic which is, she's more comfortable with, but the question was about staff shortages, not about the cost of childcare, and the Minister needs to answer the question, when is she going to listen to the community yeah, yeah. about their concerns about staff shortages? You'll quote yes. down more On the point of order, I'm actually not sure where Ms Birch is going with this quote. Oh. But we'll see, thank Ms Birch, but let's keep the question in just reading it to fill in the time. Uh, Lisa's thank quote thank makes you, sense. Mr. Um, well, just reducing the carer to children ratio from one to eight to one to five would mean an increase of cost of nearly uh, 40 per cent, and that doesn't count for the cost of possible underutilisation of capacity. Now, what that goes to show is that if you have indeed been listening to the sector, Mrs Dunn, you would know that we already meet the one to five ratios. So you are misinformed, you continue to be misinformed and you continue to spread it here. Mr Smith, a question without notice. Indeed, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is the Minister for Police and Emergency Services. Minister, as a result of a severe storm event at Canberra Airport on 3 December 2010, the new headquarters for the Emergency Services Agency was flooded. Various operations undertaken by the agency had to be transferred temporarily to other premises. Minister, have all functions which were relocated from the new headquarters been returned to Fairburn? If not, why not? Yeah, yeah. Minister Corbell. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr Smith for the question. The operations of the ESA's 000 call-taking centre, or the ComSEN as it is known, uh, are still continuing to operate from premises at Curtin. Uh, the, reason, the reason for this, Mr Speaker, uh, is... Uh, Several fold. First of all, the ESA Commissioner has taken the decision that it would be unwise to relocate the ComSEN during the period of the bushfire season uh, and that it would be most appropriate to make the, make the transition back to uh, the ESA headquarters in Fishwick following the completion of the bushfire season. Uh, secondly, uh, Mr Speaker, the bushfire season finished three days ago, Mr Smith, or what is it, six days ago. Um, secondly, uh, Mr Speaker, 
uh, the resolution of outstanding matters with the airport group in relation to repair of the building is ongoing, as is the finalisation of uh, responsibilities in terms of insurance is ongoing. Uh, and for those reasons, relocation has not yet occurred. I can assure members uh, that the operation of the ComSend has been uh, very reliable and constant throughout that period. Uh, and the, the transition and the return to Fishwick will happen uh, in an orderly and considered manner once uh, outstanding issues are resolved. Now, your supplementary question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, what action has been taken since the storm to ensure that there is no repeat of the flooding of the headquarters of the Emergency Services Agency? Minister Corbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And extensive steps have been taken uh, to prevent a reoccurrence uh, of this uh, failure. Uh, the failure occurred because of a very significant rainfall event. In fact, a rainfall event that is estimated by the Canberra Airport Group uh, to be a one in 100 year rainfall event. Uh, the Canberra Airport Group has undertaken a range of actions to prevent water from entering the building, uh, as is their obligation as the owner uh, of the premises and the grounds surrounding the building. Uh, they have constructed a series of new works uh, which are designed to prevent a reoccurrence of that flooding event. Uh, including additional drainage uh, and additional uh, other engineering works uh, to ensure uh, that a reoccurrence of the event um, is uh, eliminated to the greatest extent practicable. Supplementary, Mr. Sizildjian. Uh, yeah, Minister, what has been the cost of any remedial action at the Fair Fairburn headquarters, and is the total cost of any measures the responsibility of the ACT? Minister Corbell. Uh, there are a range of costs, and costs are expected to be shared uh, between the Territory and the Capital Airport Group uh, in relation to, uh, obviously, the Capital Airport Group is incurring all of the costs associated with remediation and, and additional engineering works surrounding the building uh, on grounds that they own and, in the, and external to the building. Issues in relation to damage within the building uh, is being resolved through the Territory's insurance uh, arrangements and any uh, requirement to uh, engage with the Capital Airport Group in relation to those insurance arrangements. Uh, the, exact, the exact cost has not been determined. Insurance uh, matters are ongoing. Supplementary, Mr Sizilja. Uh, yeah, what contingency plans exist for maintaining emergency services in the event of problems at the Fairburn headquarters? Uh, Minister Corbell. Well, Mr Speaker, the obvious contingency in relation to the transfer from Curtin to Fishwick uh, was that the Curtin uh, facility remained available, and indeed that is what the Territory has drawn upon. Uh, in the context of future arrangements, and particularly once the Curtin site is fully decommissioned, uh, the ESA has always had as its contingency the provision uh, to be able to stand up a capacity uh, at the, uh, the um, Winchester Police Centre uh, through their triple zero call taking centre and provision is made in the infrastructure at that facility to stand up a capacity at the Winchester Police Centre in the event of a failure at Fishwick. Uh, following this incident, the ESA is also exploring whether it is appropriate to retain capacity at Curtin uh, in the longer term. Uh, and that is a matter that is under ongoing consideration. Mr President, a question without notice. The question is to the Minister for Health and concerns preventative health and life expectancies. Minister, the ACT Health Council has stated that if current trends in obesity continue, the life expectancy of ACT people would decrease. The recently released Picture the Future Healthcare 2030 report also suggests that three in four Australians will be overweight or obese in 2030 if current trends continue. Minister, what is the ACD government's response to the warning for the first, that for the first time in many generations, life expectancies will go backwards? Minister for Health. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank Ms Bresnan for the question. Uh, look, um, what I've asked Health to do in response to um, not only that report, but in relation to some, um, I think, other data that we're getting through um, 
a, a range of tests that's done across government, including through education, but also through the Chief Health Officer's report, which is all indicating that lifestyle-related factors are, are going to increase um, in terms of the burden on the health system and, and diet and lack of physical exercise. Um, I think poor nutrition and, and lack of appropriate amounts of exercise are leading contributors to that. Um, what I've asked health to do is to go back and look at all the programs uh, where we're providing our preventative health uh, messages and, we're, and we've, we've indeed in the last year started an, another, a number of, of programs in this area to look, that, to look to make sure that we're targeting the messages in the right places. And I think this is ongoing discussion about whether a general sort of broad-based population approach applies or whether we actually get down to um, dealing with particular population groups across the community where we're seeing um, no improvements or in fact deterioration in some of the um, in some of the health message um, areas uh, and that um, the area in um, the public health area in ACT Health, led by the Chief Health Officer, is doing that work and providing that advice to me. I'm, I'm worried that um, you know, here in the ACT, to a large extent, and compared to national indicators, that we, we do pretty well in terms of um, our overall health, uh, but I am increasingly concerned that we're not putting enough effort or we're not targeting our effort to those areas where we need to do better. And that, I guess, goes from whether we try to blanket the whole community or whether we look to um, more focused and targeted programs in relation um, to management of not only obesity, but um, you know, other, other areas as well, such as smoking, for example, um, where, again, we're seeing improvements in some areas of the community and deterioration in others. But that works under, underway, sorry. Ms Breslin, a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, given much of government initiated debate about health care focuses on acute care when the main threats to life expectancies are in preventable chronic disease, what program funding is the government undertaking to address these issues beyond developing plans and strategies? Minister for Health. Um, well, in terms of, we have been putting more money into this area. I'll, I'll accept it's not enough in terms of where you look at the ratio. More goes into the acute system to deal with the current demands and it makes it difficult to allocate adequate resources into preventative health and health promotion areas. Uh, but we do have a fair bit of money going in there. Like in the health pact, um, health promotion grants alone is $2 million a year. Um, what I'm worried about is the, some of the money that um, we're putting in, I want to make sure that it's actually targeted into the right areas. Uh, and increasingly, I think we can see areas of disadvantage where health messages are not getting through, where they're not targeted uh, appropriately, um, you know, for one reason or another. And I think we need to seriously look at whether the two and five campaign, campaigns like that, which are very worthy and good, and you get a nice recipe book and, you know, the... Um, you know, the messages, people understand we need to eat two and five, but it's not actually translating into um, particular populations changing the way they um, eat and the way they exercise. And I think that's, that's the area I'd like to address first. But there will be more money into this area. Um, I'm not sure it'll be enough to satisfy you or indeed satisfy me, but there will be more money going into this area. And over time, I think you will see increasingly the shift away from acute into subacute and also into our health promotion and prevention activity. Yes, Ms Hunter. Minister, what socioeconomic groups are most likely to face high rates of obesity and chronic disease and how are you working to focus on them? Minister for Health. Yes, since I answer that, um, you know, I think in the ACT the areas where I would be most concerned are in the low socioeconomic groups um, and um, particularly and in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. I think they're the two areas. And that's the question to me. I mean, when you run around the lake or, you know, at lunchtime, you know, you see a lot of fit Canberrans um, out exercising. Indeed, if you go around in the morning when Ms. Mr Speaker's racing around there, again, you see a lot of fit, healthy Canberrans. You don't see the people that perhaps we need to be targeting the message to the most. Uh, and that's, that's the issue, I think, that we need to have a pretty um, hard conversation about whether we now shift away from general sort of spray the population with the same message or whether we look at what resources we have available 
pull it all together and actually make sure that, that, that those funds are going into the areas and the, into the population groups where we need to see substantial change. And I think, you know, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, we're not seeing the reductions in tobacco, um, uh, that we, tobacco consumption that we're seeing in other areas of the population. Uh, in young Aboriginal pregnant women are still taking smoking up at a, a much higher rate than non, non-Aboriginal pregnant women. And so we need to, I think, instead of, you know, into, for the next steps in tobacco control, look at how we are getting the messages to that population. So that is work that's currently underway. No easy answers, though, unfortunately. Yes, Ms Lakuta. Minister, has the ACT government adopted the World Health Organisation's social determinants of health framework as has been recommended? Uh, look, I'm certainly no... I'm not sure in terms of adopted... We're, I'm certainly aware of them and they're used in our policy development, um, but I will check as to whether we need to do anything else with them. Um, I know they certainly inform the discussions, but I, I've had a number of meetings with uh, the Chief Health Officer around this issue in the last four months or so because... I, as I said, I am increasingly concerned that whilst for many we're doing OK, there are, there are groups within our community where uh, the measures are, going, uh, are either staying the same or going backwards, and I think we need to address that. Mr Coe, question without notice. Mr Speaker, and the question is to the Minister for Transport. Uh, Chief Minister, students and parents who wish to purchase a MyWay card are required to first apply and then register their details to obtain a card. This process requires parents and students to share details about the student, including name, school attended, date of birth, address and telephone number. Chief Minister, given previous confidentiality failures overseen by the ACT Government, will you guarantee that the information provided by MyWay Users to Action will be kept secure? Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank Mr Coe for the question. Uh, Mr, Mr Coe, I have to say that uh, no issues of concern have been raised with me in relation to a potential diminution of security in relation to information provided to action as a result of implementation of my way, but I accept that this is a very serious issue. I'm not aware of any potential for that to occur, but uh, on the basis of your question today, uh, I will take advice and seek assurances that uh, there will be no um, reduction uh, in our commitment to protecting confidential personal information. Mr Carr, supplementary. Uh, Chief Minister, is it true the photos and student details will be is it true the photos and student details will be sent interstate for printing of the cards? If so, how will you guarantee the security of the information provided by MyWay users? Chief Minister. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I think um, just the, the process and whether or not uh, MyWay cards are processed within the ACT or interstate. Uh, isn't of itself, of course, relevant at all to uh, our capacity to secure uh, and to make and uh, to secure the confidentiality of that information. But as I said, Mr. Coe, it's a serious issue, and I'm more than happy to seek uh, the assurances uh, that you ask for today. And indeed, I would be more than happy, Mr. Coe, for you to be fully briefed by action uh, on the processes uh, that they have in place to ensure that uh, personal information provided to action for the. Uh, printing of my way cards is secure. Yes, Mr Smith. Um, Minister, what access will other agencies, both Territory and Commonwealth, have to the information provided by the my way users? Chief Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, my understanding is they'll have none, but uh, I will take the question on notice. Uh, right, Yes, Thank Mrs Dunn. Minister, Chief Minister, how could uh, sending photographs of potentially every school child in the ACT interstate not be a security risk? Chief Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, what I said was that it would represent no greater risk to security uh, than uh, would uh, potentially exist in any event. But uh, uh, as I've indicated, I'll take the question on notice and I'll respond fully. And uh, I extend the offer of a briefing to... Uh, I, I, well. You're suggesting that it's uh, insecure interstate. You're suggesting that it's potentially insecure here. And of, uh, of course, I was uh, drawing the distinction that uh, the, uh, the place of uh, production, of course, shouldn't be relevant at all. And if it were, I would be most concerned. Uh, but I will seek the assurances that uh, members quite rightly are seeking in relation to this issue. That is Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mrs. Dunn. Minister, my question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. 
Minister, I take you back to your meetings with workers at Bimber Youth Justice Centre on the 24th of November 2010. It has been alleged on a number of occasions, both to me privately and also publicly through the media, that on, at one of those two meetings you at one point turned your body away from the meeting, covered your ears with your hands and said, la, 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 I don't want to know. You have repeatedly denied those allegations. Minister, I ask you once again for a simple yes-no answer. At one of those meetings with Bimbury workers on the 24th of November, did you at one point turn your body away from the meeting, cover your ears and say, la, 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 I don't want to know? Careful, Joy. Minister Birch. Uh, no, Mr Speaker. Question, yes, Minister. Mrs Dunn. Mr. Mr Speaker. Minister, are you therefore accusing the people that have made these claims both to me privately and publicly through the media of lying about your behaviour at those meetings? Minister Birch. Um, no, I'm not, Mr Speaker. Mr Zelger, supplementary. Thank you. Uh, Minister, in order to clear up this perception about your, your behaviour on the 24th of November, will you now go again to Bimbury, meet with workers, listen carefully and sincerely to their concerns and then act upon them decisively? Minister Birch. Um, I have been to Bimbury. I have listened to their concerns and I've acted and responded to their concerns. Yes, Mr Smith. Yeah, Minister, on reflection, um, what do you consider you could have done better at those meetings on the 24th of November in order to create a more positive perception about your behaviour at these meetings? Yeah. Minister Birch. Well, some feedback to me has been that that was a positive meeting, Mr Speaker. Mr Hargraves, question without notice. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. Um, and actually, in her capacity as Minister for Children and Young People, could you please uh, outline the range of activities in, uh, taking place in the... Mr Hargraves. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Young People. Minister, could you outline the range of... Members, can we please stop interjecting while Mr Hans Hargraves is trying to ask the question? It's really inappropriate. Thank you, Mr, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Don't push it. Yes, but Mr Smith, clearly chatting amongst yourselves has a potential to be disorderly, which is against the standing orders. The volume at which the chatter is conducted is both inappropriate and unnecessary while Mr Hargraves is trying to ask a question. Mr Hargraves. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister <coughs> of Children and Young People. Uh, Minister, could you outline the range of activities taking place in the ACT as part of National Youth Week, please? A celebration of young people. It's a great opportunity to recognise and celebrate young people's achievements and contribution to community. The week focuses on how optimistic, bold and vocal young people are with a full range of fun and diverse events. Throughout this week, young people have been actively taking part in celebrations. Mr Speaker, I launched the National Youth Week in the ACT for 2011 last Friday at the Youth Week Expo. It was great to see a broad range of youth related organisations present at the Expo. I acknowledge that Mr Coe and Ms. Ms Hunter was there in support of this fantastic week of events and the young people involved in them. This week is driven by young people, but everyone is encouraged to participate, young and old alike. This year, Youth Week celebrates the theme, Own It, which aims to encourage young people to embrace life, share ideas and to become involved in what young people are passionate about. National Youth Week is a fantastic opportunity for people to showcase their events, exchange ideas and act on issues that affect them. This year sees a range of innovative activities being run by young people, ranging from workshops, music festivals, competitions and opening and closing celebrations. There are 93 events taking place across the ACT up until Sunday 10 of April. There is still a lot happening and I encourage everyone to have a look at the National Youth Week website to see what's going on in their area. One of the events this weekend is the National Youth Week Festival, a fair with arts, which is a festival of youth visual art and live performance. The Canberra Youth Festival is performing hijinks, a youth variety spectacular, and the CYT Actors Ensemble will be running a theatre sports showdown. QL2 will stage a studio showing work of created by Melbourne choreographer Jodie Fagara and the performance will be part of QL2's major season identity in August of 2011. ACT Riders Centre in Canberra Contemporary Art Space 
will host the annual Zin Fair, which includes Zins, which I'm told are self-published magazines on art, badges, T-shirts, T-shirts, buttons, great designs, as well as cupcakes. That's all happening from 12 this Saturday at our Gorman House. Youth Week is in the ACT. It's a partnership between the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Service and the Youth Coalition of the ACT. And I'd like to thank the Youth Coalition of the ACT for putting this fantastic event together. National Youth Week uh, would not be possible without their long-term and deep support for the young people in the Territory. The Department provides the Youth Coalition approximately $20,000 to coordinate National Youth Week and another $20,000 provided by the Australian Government grants to provide activities. This year, a total of 10 grants were provided to the ACT community to run events that give young people a chance to celebrate their achievements and to recognise the contribution of young people to our community. A number of grants are provided directly to the ACT schools to fund an event or activity initiated by students in AT schools or colleges. The aim of this funding is to give young people the opportunity to organise an event for their school or community. I'm pleased to also recognise the significant financial support provided by Beyond Blue for Youth Week. Youth Week in the ACT has received over $40,000 in sponsorships to conduct a week-long program in Jarvis Bay. Half of these funds were distributed to conduct a national Youth Week events focusing on Beyond Blue's key messages of look, listen, talk and seek help. Seek help. Mr Speaker, as you can see, Youth Week in the ACT is a strong community-based event delivered with and engaging with young people. This terrific range of activities and events highlight the diversity and achievements of young people in our community and are a credit to all those involved. Mr Hargraves, a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Minister, could you explain what has been organised for the Youth Interact Conference as part of National Youth Week, please? Minister Birch. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank Mr Hargraves. Uh, tomorrow I will be opening the Youth Interact Conference, which is being held in the Ainsley Arts Centre. The Youth Interact Conference is now in its 10th year and is hosted by ACT Youth Advisory Council and the support of the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Services. Conference participants are from a range of ages, abilities and backgrounds. As a result, the diverse views and thoughts of all young people in our community will be well represented and heard. The Youth Interact Conference aims to inform and engage young people in topical issues and fun activities, also while providing them with the opportunity to give valuable and insightful feedback to the ACT Government on issues of importance for young people. Each year, the ACT Youth Advisory Council identifies forum topics for discussion. These topics are selected on the basis of their priority and based on feedback, which is received through an online survey which is conducted by the Youth Interact Consultation Register, as well as feedback provided by the National Survey of Young Australians conducted by Mission Australia, and in accordance with the priorities outlined in the Young People's Plan 2009-14. to For 2011 Interact Conference, the five topics will be addressed arrive alive, young drivers and passengers, sustainability in the environment, alcohol itself and social impact on young people, mental health and wellbeing, removing the stigma and accessing entertainment for under 18s, identifying the barriers. Mr Speaker, a number of confidence building and recreational based workshops will also be conducted, such as circus skills, hip hop and funk dance, zumba dancing, stencil art, drama development workshop and unicycling. As well as participating in the conference, young people will be involved in the delivery of the actual conference through event management, catering, conference photography and assisting in generating positive media coverage over the event through partnerships with communities at work, Northside Community Services and Angler Care ACT. I look forward to hear about the outcomes of the conference tomorrow and the young people's ideas about these important issues. Mrs Dunn. Question. Uh, Minister, how much time and effort has been put in by your department to, uh, to secure media events for you during Youth Week? Minister Birch. Uh, this week is focused on the youth of the ACT. Yes, Ms Hunter. Uh, Order. Minister... Ms Hunter has the floor for a supplementary. Ms. Hunter. Minister, how will you be using the feedback from the young people at the Youth Interact Conference? How will you be that, feeding that back into uh, government decisions on policy programs and so forth? Minister Birch. Thank you, and I thank Ms Hunter for her question and recognise her involvement in the youth sector in uh, days of past before her arrival in this place. The Youth Interact Conference, when you look at those uh, five themes that they will be looking through, 
are all important themes for young Canberrans, and they're important that we hear what they have to say about it. Uh, there will be a formal write-up of the conference, but also the Youth Advisory Council will be bringing me first-hand a verbal report and a written report on those activities. And they will indeed work through uh, across my department areas where we can, but also inform uh, the, youth, uh, the youth plan implementation plans in the out years. Thank Chief you, Minister. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask for the request to be placed on notice paper. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation under Standing Order 46. Yes, Mr Hargraves. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank members. Look, I refer to the, uh, the question from Mr Hanson today, and I believe that, in fact, the, uh, the Chamber is due an explanation. The issue about uh, the uh, Treasurer's return today <coughs> and uh, advice to the opposition of that return is the subject of this personal explanation. I had uh, communication from uh, Mr Hanson's office yesterday. Just, just settle, pedal. I had communication with Mr Hanson's office yesterday asking for the detail about the Ministerial Council, what time it starts and what day, etc., and quite a reasonable request that was. Uh, my office responded uh, that the meeting of States and Treasury ter Treasurers would uh, take place on Wednesday afternoon from 4 with no predict a predetermined finish time, a standard arrangement whereby State and Treasuries meet prior to the MinCo to discuss and exchange views on the forthcoming agenda. Uh, that is where the states and territories get together be without the Commonwealth to discuss these things. And the, minister, and the MINCO itself commenced today, Thursday, at 9am and will be finished by COB that day. The MINCO is here in Canberra. There was an understanding in my office that the, the terminology finished by COB would mean an indeterminate time. Now, this is the bit that I wish the Chamber to know. I gave an instruction to my office to advise Mr Hanson's office this morning that should the Ministerial Council finish early, given that it was a Canberra, there was a likelihood that the Treasurer would return to the Chamber. That instruction from my office was not conveyed to Mr Hanson's office, and for that I give Mr Hanson an unqualified apology. It is my, my fault that, uh, that the information was not conveyed to, to the opposition. I'd also like the record to show Mr Speaker, that I had no communication with the Greens on this issue either. So I hope that would, uh, would satisfy the Chamber as to what the circumstances really were. Thank you, Mr Hargrove's Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I also seek leave to make a statement, personal explanation, understanding Order 46. Yes, Treasurer. Uh, thank you. Just uh, further to Mr Hargrove's, um, may I offer my sincere apologies to the opposition that they came in here unprepared for question time or unprepared in the sense that they thought I wasn't going to be here and I was and I've obviously ruined the last hour for them and my most sincere apologies for that. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, if I can make a yes, explanation as well. And I, I certainly would like to accept Mr Hargrove's apology and I appreciate that he's made that commitment. I think that the question that I asked that was ruled out of order was more about how was it that the Greens seemed to be informed when we didn't. And uh, I'm not trying to allege some sort of conspiracy here, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I accept your apology, uh, Mr Hargraves, but, uh, you know, Thanks. yours was given in a slightly different manner, uh, and I'll have to consider whether I'll accept that one or not. Mr Barr. We'll Thank you. Order. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr Barr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. Order. Thank you, members. Mr Barr has the floor now. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week in question time, Ms Bresnan asked me several questions about the length of rural leases in the Nars Valley in the context of the ACT's water security plans and ACTU's planning for a possible... NACE. Oh, NACE. Sorry, NACE Valley, yes. Uh, for a possible tenant dam. Uh, ACTU advises me that, they are very un that it is very unlikely that they would require the land in the immediate future. The corporation has advised that the enlarged Cotter Dam and Murrumbidgee to Googong water transfer projects are scheduled for completion in mid-2012 and with the Tantangra transfer project are expected to provide water security for the foreseeable future based on current modelling. However, Mr. Mr Speaker, ACTU advises that they continue to review their operations for water security into the future, and they are specifically examining the question of any longer-term use of the land for water storage and will report to government shortly. 
Uh, Ms Hunter and Ms Lacuda asked supplementary questions about the hydrology of the site and its suitability for water storage and what plans ACPLA had for the area and what, uh, what information ACPLA had on the ecological qualities of the area and the viability of the site for such development. As I noted in my response at that time, these are matters that are really uh, in the purview of other agencies, but I can uh, advise that ACPLA itself has no plans for the valley. Thank you. We now move to the presentation of papers. Mr Stanhope. Speaker, Mr Speaker, pursuant to subsection 15.2 of the Cultural Facilities Corporation Act, I present the Cultural Facilities Corporation quarterly report for the period 1 October to 31 December 2010. Thank you, Chief Minister. Ms Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Let's get my papers. For the information of members, I present a report on the external component of the evaluation of drug policies and services and their subsequent effects on prisoners and staff within the Alexander McConaughey Centre, including an erratum together with the interim government response. And I seek leave to make a statement in relation to the paper. Is leave granted? Yes. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Today I table both the final report, external component of the evaluation of drug policies and services, and their subsequent effect on prisoners and staff within the Alexander McConaughey Centre, conducted by the Burnett Institute, and the ACT Government's interim response to the recommendations in that report. The Burnett Institute was specifically selected by the ACT Departments of Justice and Community Safety and Health to undertake this evaluation as an expert in medical research and a public health organisation focused on improving the health of disadvantaged and marginalised populations. This review relates to the work of both ACT Health and ACT Department of Justice and Community Safety, and I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of the people who participated in the review, including ACT Health and Correction staff, non-government service providers, prisoners and ex-prisoners of the AMC, and community-based service providers and the Burnett Institute, of course, for doing the evaluation. As members of the Assembly will know, the Government gave a commitment to undertake an evaluation of the drug policies and services provided to prisoners at the Alexander McConaughey <coughs> Centre in accordance with ACT Health's Adult Corrections Health Services Plan 2008 to 2012. The evaluation was conducted as a joint initiative of ACT Health and JACS, with myself as ACT Minister for Health taking the lead on the evaluation within the Government. In December 2009, an evaluation advisory group was established. Members of this advisory group were invited from a range of relevant organisations, including ACCOS, the CPSU, ANF, the Salaried Medical Officers Federation, Families and Friends for Drug Law Reform, ACT Aboriginal Justice Centre, Canberra Alliance for Harm Minimisation and Advocacy, ACT Alcohol and Other Drugs Sector, Mental Health Community Coalition, Pharmacy Guild, ACT Women's and Prisons Groups, ACT Prisoners Aid, Chief Minister's Department, ACT Corrective Services, ACT Department of Justice and Community Safety and ACT Health. The approach used by the Burnett Institute for this evaluation in included both qualitative and quantitative components and included in-depth interviews with a range of key stakeholders, a desktop policy review, a literature review, a review and analysis of secondary custodial and service provision data and a review and analysis of the inmate health survey data, which was collected in May 2010. In conducting the review, the Burnett Institute also examined relevant documentation and conducted interviews with staff and prisoners as required. The Burnett report was provided to the Government in January 2011, with a final version being provided to the Government this week to incorporate some revised data relating to urine analysis and an erratum issued by the Burnett Institute to correct a factual error in the previous draft. The report makes 69 separate recommendations. In our interim response, which is provided to members of the Assembly today, the Government has agreed to 10 of the recommendations, agreed in part to one agreed in principle to 27 and noted 31 recommendations. There are no recommendations which the government have rejected outright in our, immediate, in our interim response. It is important that I stress this is an interim response and further government consideration is required on some key recommendations prior to finalising a formal ACT government response. A key recommendation which has been agreed by the government is for the ACT, Health and JACS to develop a consolidated strategic policy framework to provide clear governance regarding drug-related policies and services. 
The government supports recommendations that a governance structure be established to support implementation of integrated drug policy across other service providers and that key performance indicators better reflect the achievement of quality outcomes. The Government's support of these recommendations reflects our continued commitment to ensuring high levels of care and treatment are provided to detainees at the AMC. The Government has indicated in principle support for a number of recommendations made in relation to supply reduction. The Government agrees in principle, for example, that searching and urine analysis, urine analysis should be conducted on a more consistent basis and that individuals returning positive results should be referred to case managers so they can be linked in with appropriate therapeutic responses. The Burnett report also made recommendations in rela relation to demand reduction. The government agrees to many of these, agrees in principle to many of these recommendations, including recommendations to provide a more holistic case management approach. Mr. Speak uh, Madam Assistant Speaker, seven of the recommendations made in the Burnett report have already be been addressed by either ACT Health or JACS. For example, recommendation 10, which is around the revised protocols for the provision of informed consent for information sharing between ACT Corrections Health Program and Corrective Services regarding urine analysis uh, testing and the presence of prescribed substances in samples should be finalised and implemented. This recommendation has already been completed in conjunction with the Human Rights Commissioner. ACT Health developed and implemented a standing operating procedure at the end of 2010 to facilitate better information sharing with ACT Corrective Services to support testing undertaken by Corrective Services. In recommendation 26, detoxification regimes should not be provided to those requesting to be inducted onto methadone. This recommendation has also been completed. A clinical assessment informs whether or not a person is offered the opportunity to be inducted onto methadone. Prisoners are off offered symptomatic relief based on their clinical assessment and all prisoners are assessed within 24 hours of admission to the AMC. Furthermore, with the priority clinical triage processes, prisoners are able to be assessed and treated by a medical practitioner at the Hume Health Centre within 24 hours of coming into prison. Recommendation 58, that all ACT Corrections Health Program staff should re receive accredited training for pre- and post-test counselling for blood-borne virus testing. This recommendation is partially complete. All Corrections Health staff have access to training in this area as part of a one-month induction and staff development program. However, the recommendation is only partially complete as the training is not yet accredited. ACT Health will be seeking to achieve accreditation for training in the near future. An example of some of the recommendations that were noted include recommendation 21, a system for consensual pre and post monitoring of prisoners should be developed that identifies fatal and non-fatal overdose events, continuation of opioid pharmacotherapy and compliance with case plans and discharge plans. In responding to this recommendation, a range of actions will be considered. Prisoners on pharmacotherapies could be monitored for three months post-release for retention on the program. Any program of this nature would need to consider individual prison choice for post-release monitoring. <coughs> post-release monitoring of prisoners who are on psych psychiatric pharmacotherapy in detention could be carried out through forensic mental health services. Post-release monitoring of prisoners on opioid replacement therapy could be monitored through the AOD sector, including the alcohol and drug program in ACT Health. There are a number of recommendations that have resourcing implications, and these may need to be considered in the budget context. Adding to this, a number of the recommendations need to be considered in parallel with the recommendations from the Hamburger Review. In addition to this, as I've already mentioned, there are a number of recommendations that require further government consideration. Ms. Madam Assistant Speaker, the Burnett Institute report looks briefly at the issue of a trial needle and syringe program at the AMC. Recommendation 69 advocates that a process should be commenced to instigate a trial NSP at the AMC. I've previously placed on my record my understanding of and support for the underpinning health rationale for such an approach, and indeed I do support a needle and syringe program at the AMC as Health Minister. However, I also acknowledge that this is a complex issue that requires a considered response by government before any final decision is made. Since the report has been received, I've been seeking the views of a range of stakeholders in relation to this matter. However, I believe that further work is required before the government will be in a position to reach a final decision on this important issue. The government will immediately commission a project that will look at further work around a future needle and syringe program. This work will cover potential models for an NSP, how they could work in the prison setting, barriers to implementation at the AMC and how and if these barriers could be overcome. 
I have asked Mr Michael Moore, former ACT Health Minister and currently Chief Executive of the Public Health Association, to lead this work. The report makes a number of recommendations that are likely to require new and additional resources to implement, including addressing issues such as counselling services and trials of the provision of naloxone to prisoners, and as I have mentioned, the needle and syringe program within the jail. These are all issues that the government will consider carefully in the development of our final government response. The Burnett report stated that some key informants felt, and I quote, that prisoners experienced undue influence from health staff to commence methadone. On my advice, there is no evidence to show that this is occurring. I am advised by ACT Health that methadone is prescribed in the AMC according to the ACT opioid maintenance treatment guidelines. That means the client is assessed for opioid dependence by a medical officer prior to commencing the program. If the person is already on an opioid treatment program, they are continued on the program using information from their prescribing doctor and their care is transferred to the AMC doctor. If the person is assessed as opioid dependent and not already on methadone, they are offered the program and following informed consent are inducted. This is not exerting undue influence to commence methadone, far from it. It is evidence-based treatment based on published guidelines. While much has been made of the opposition um, on these key informants' view in the report, the Burnett Institute report makes no findings or recommendations about this. Indeed, the recommendations around it are about supporting and improving access to the methadone program. It is important to note that prisoners can come into the ANC, AMC in withdrawal. This is sometimes as the result of being in the watch house and sometimes because they are already in withdrawal when they enter. Medical staff may provide symptomatic relief as part of the workup period prior to induction onto methadone program. Without prior knowledge of the drugs that the person may have taken, symptomatic relief is considered the most appropriate method of treatment based on a harm minimisation approach. This is not considered to be withholding methadone, rather treatment based on clinical symptoms. Following assessment, prisoners are offered access to the methadone program where this is clinically appropriate. Once they, have been, once they have given informed consent, they are inducted onto the program. However, it is important to note that at all times, detainees are able to choose whether they wish to participate in the program. Detainees are also able, in consultation with their doctor, to alter their methadone dose to an appropriate level. Data from the Inmate Health Survey provides a useful snapshot of the AMC um, population. We are talking about a group of people here where 91% of respondents reported lifetime use of illicit drugs. Nearly three quarters of respondents, or 74%, reported that the crimes related to their current prison sentence were related to drugs. And 79% reported that they were affected by drugs and or alcohol when they committed their irrelevant offence. It, it is important to reflect on these statistics when we consider the health needs of the detainees at AMC. They are significant and they are complex. The Burnett Report is a significant review of what health services we provide for the detainees at AMC and provides some very in-depth analysis that I believe the government needs to thoroughly consider. Once the government has considered the recommendations in greater detail, I intend to bring to the Assembly a final government response to the Burnett Report. In that final government response, I will not only address each recommendation individually, but I will provide an anticipated time frame for completion and prioritisation prioritisation of the agreed recommendations. It is my intention to have this complete by the 30th of June 2011. I'd like to thank the Assembly for its interest in this matter and re repeat that this government is committed to ensuring safe, high quality care is provided to all detainees whose complex health needs are managed at the Hume Health Centre. The report be noted. The question is the report be noted. Mr Hanson. Madam Assistant Speaker, obviously the, uh, the Burner Institute report has been the subject of some attention both here in the Assembly and in the media. And uh, as members would be aware, I was provided a copy of a report um, which was titled the final report, December 2010. And I note that today the report tabled by the Minister is the final report uh, dated 11, uh, correction, April 2011. And part of the, uh, I guess, the spin that's been put out by the government when Elmas's report were provided to the media and as we've been talking about it in the Assembly and indeed Simon Corbell's refusal to even talk about the report has been that, of course, the report that I had was different. 
somehow than the final report that's been tabled. And probably it is in small part, Madam Assistant Speaker, but I've just had a, a, about five minutes to have a cursory examination of the two reports. I note that one is two pages longer than the other. Um, in fact, the, the final dated April is two pages longer than the final dated December. And I would not suggest from my cursory reading and a comparison so far that there is any uh, consequential difference, but I will prepare to be stand corrected on a number of issues if that is proved to be correct. So there is so, so there is very little difference. And so if I can so I think that it's important that we just note that the report that's been tabled by the Minister today, and I know I've only had a chance to flick through about half of it, finds in summary, Madam Assistant Speaker, and I think this is part of what the Minister's been saying both in the media and, and in this place, is that oh these are just quotes from from prisoners. These are just quotes from people, these allegations. Well, let me read what the summary says about a number of issues. There's a lack of consultation with frontline staff during policy development, inadequate implementation of policies, a human rights approach has emphasised rights more than responsibilities, disciplinary conflicts have been occurring, policy not adequately guiding how to balance harm minimisation interventions, lack of leadership and coordination of drug-related activities. Just bear with me, Madam Assistant Speaker, while I go to the next section. Fragmentation of case management, service system, lack of awareness of AMC case managers amongst prisoners, poor relationships between AMC case managers and prisoners, confusion between case manager and case officers, differential access for case management, lack of coordination of services provided to prisoners, a lack of role clarity amongst service providers, poor communication between service providers, implementation of through care has been inadequate. Insufficient counselling opportunities available to prisoners, insufficient awareness amongst prisoners of counselling, insufficient resources to offer counselling to all prisoners. Poor access to education and employment programs than in New South Wales prisoners. Greater variety of courses needed. Courses are being started and then discontinued. The gym should be available. Opportunities for recreation can improve wellbeing. Recreational opportunities can improve order within the prison. Delays experienced by prisoners in accessing health staff. Systemic problems with prisoners reporting health issues and requests to nursing staff on medication rounds. Lack of care and discharge planning. Problems with clinical record keeping. Conflict between forensic mental health and ACT Corrections Health Program, issues with crisis support, no assistance for prisoners withdrawing from prescription medication, lack of any meaningful relationship between cell and area search seizures, uh, concerns about effectiveness of searches and resources required to undertake searches, searches allegedly using, used to victimise individuals. So, Madam Assistant Speaker, that I got to page 117, just looking at the summary. And I think that if I went through the rest of the report, which I won't do obviously now, we would find that the summary has changed little, if at all, from the version that we've been provided earlier. And that just as members would be aware from the extracts I've read out there, this is an entirely damning report from the management of both the Minister for Health from the health correction side and for the Minister for Corrections, the Attorney General, and his management of the jail. And it's a very important point to make for those in this place, for the media listening and for members of the community, that this report dated April 2011 is very little, if at all different, from the previous report that has been provided to the community. And despite, despite the enormity of the problems that have been raised in the Burnett Institute report and from the Hamburger report that was released uh, to this place on Tuesday, this minister is still saying that she's going to want to try and push ahead with a needle and syringe program. That she thinks that despite all these problems that are there, that this government and this minister could adequately manage a needle and syringe program. Well, the Liberal opposition stands against that, Madam Assistant Speaker. We do not support it. We do not support it for very good reasons. And none the, le none the least, none the least, because the Minister for Health and the Attorney General would be incapable of implementing such a program into this jail either 
effectively or safely. The question is the report be noted. Mr Smith. Madam Assistant Speaker, I move the report be now adjourned. The debate be now adjourned. The question is the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The aye. question now is that debate be set down as an order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Ms Birch, Minister for Children and Young People. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. For the information of members, I present the ACT Young People's Plan 2009-2014, Implementation Plan 2011, and I move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is the Assembly take note of the paper. Ms Birch. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. It's my pleasure to table the 2011 Implementation Plan for the Young People's Plan 2009 the first year of implementation of the Young People's Plan 2009-14 saw the delivery of many important initiatives. The second iteration of the Young People's Plan 2009-14 will continue on this strong foundation. In 2011, the Young People's Plan will continue to assist young people to reach their potential and contribute and share the benefits of our community. The Young People's Plan 2009-14 describes the ACT Government's vision goals and aims to value and promote the positive contribution that young people make to the ACT community and to respect, protect and advance the human rights of young people. Mr Madam Assistant Speaker, the Young People's Plan 2009-14 sets forth a fle flexible strategic plan that will guide the government's partnership with young people and key community stakeholders. The Young People's Plan is guided by, guided by five priority areas that will cover the next four years these being health and wellbeing and support, families and communities, participation and access, transition and pathways, and environment and sustainability. These priority areas reflect the greater policy context in which the Young People's Plan 2009-14 was developed, including alignment with the Canberra Plan and the Canberra Social Plan. The Young People's Plan and the 2011 Implementation Plan is a whole of government strategy and supports the implementation of key intergovernment agents, sorry, agreements such as the National Framework for Protecting Australians' Children 2009 to 2020, the National Partnership on Homelessness and the National Partnership Agreement on Youth Attainment and Transitions. The implementation of this plan is timely as young people continue to need targeted support and programs that assist them to navigate their way through adulthood. This position is supported by recent research and reviews conducted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the National Youth Affairs Research Scheme and the ACT government agencies, highlighting the areas of need for young people in the ACT. In developing the 2011 implementation plan has been a journey involving each ACT government department, identifying three key areas under the five priorities. From this request, the ACT government departments identified up to five key actions, reducing key actions from the 166 in 2010 to 59 from 2011. A total of 24 key actions have been carried over from the 2010 implementation plan. This highlights the ACT government's commitment to young people as high on their agenda. The additional priorities further strengthen the goals and objectives reflected in the Young People's Plan and the commitment of the government to meet the needs of young people in our community. A further review of the key performance indicators will be undertaken in the Implementation Plan 2012 to ensure targeting and prioritisation of the priorities of the Young People's Plans are met. This process reflects the recommendations from the Hawke Review governing the city-state, which includes strong suggestions and recommendations about streamlining and re recalibrating strategic planning and reporting frameworks. The 2011 Implementation Plan provides flexible and responsive content with the Young People's Annual Progress Report to be tabled in the Assembly in December of this year. The Young People's Plan was born out of consulting with young people and there was a strong emphasis on supporting young people to participate and engage in its implementation. The 2011 Implementation Plan reinforces the priorities young Canberrans identified for action, guiding policy development and service delivery by both government and non-government agencies. As such, it articulates the government's commitment to young people and provides a whole of government policy framework for young people. Madam Assistant Speaker, the Young People's Plan governance structures ensures that young people are consulted on action items as well as on progress. 
This is achieved through the Government and Community Advisory Group for Young People as a subcommittee of the Children and Young People's Task Force. ACT government employees, young people and community groups make up the membership. This document sets forth a flexible strategic plan that will guide the government's partnership with young people and key stakeholders. And through the implementation plan, we will continue to see genuine youth participation and expanded partnerships between young people, government and the community. And the government will continue to boost resources, activities and opportunities for young people. Of a particular note are the following key actions outlined in the two Implementation Plan 2011. The National Partnership Agreement on Preventative Health will focus on developing and implementing programs that focus on health, weight, physical activity and healthy eating for children and young people aged 0 to 16 years. A cultural care plan for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people placed in out-of-home care that maintain and support cultural identity. Strengthened exiting a statutory care system through the implementation of leaving care plans, leaving care kits and case conferencing pilot projects. Implementation of excellence in disability education in the ACT public schools 2010-13. We'll see the implementation of key actions such as individual learning plans for students with a disability to ensure inclusion of transition goals and community involvement. Development of and implementation of a youth foyer type model in the ACT, linking youth housing with opportunities for employment and training for people aged 16 to 25 years. This model will form part of the continuum of service targeted at youth homelessness and will incorporate a range of personal supports related to health and wellbeing. Madam Assistant Speaker, these and other actions outlined in the 2011 implementation plan reflect the strength of the government's commitment to young people. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone involved in delivering the many initiatives and I commend the 2011 implementation plan to the Assembly. The question is that the Assembly take note of the paper. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Ms Birch, Minister thank for Ageing. Thank you, uh, Madam Assistant Speaker. For the information of members, I present a report by the ACT Ministerial Advisory Council on Ageing, entitled Revisiting the 2005 Review Report of Seniors Clubs. And I move that the Assembly take note of the paper. The question is the Assembly take note of the paper. Ms Birch. Thank you, uh, Madam Assistant Speaker. It's my pleasure to table the ACT Ministerial Advisory Council's on Ageing Report, revisiting the 2005 Review Report of Seniors Clubs. And I congratulate the Council for the extensive consultation and research undertaking in preparing this report. This report was undertaken in the context of the ACT Strategic Plan for Positive Ageing 2010 to 2014, and its purpose was to map the progress against the findings of a similar review of seniors clubs undertaken by MACA in 2005. The ACT government responded to the 2005 review by undertaking three significant initiatives. These included the provision of land for the seniors clubs in Tuggeranong, funding to construct the Tuggeranong Seniors Centre and six regional community buses for operation by the ACT regional <coughs> community service organisations. Commitment to the construction of a permanent home for the Tuggeranong 55 Club uh, was a clear acknowledgement of the important role that the clubs play in contributing to the social wellbeing of older Canberrans. Um, and being in my local electorate of uh, Brenda Bella, I can see firsthand the benefit that will bring to that uh, area. A budget of $1.7 million was allocated for the design and construction of the new club, and in February 2011, work commenced on site in Greenway. The project is expected to undertake, sorry, to be uh, to take about eight to nine months to complete. And I know that seniors in the Tuggeranong area are looking forward to seeing their new club um, complete and ready to move in. For an initial period of time, communities at work will work alongside the Tuggeranong 55 Club Plus Club to manage the new facility. On that point, I'd, also, I'd just like to uh, recognise um, Mr Hargraves for his interest in making sure that the Tuggeranong 55 Club um, most certainly found its home in, in Tuggeranong. Uh, Ms. Madam Assistant Speaker, the regional community buses have been in operation at each of the six regional community services since 2008. These provide a valuable low-cost service for ACT residents who may otherwise be socially isolated due to the lack of transport. 
This includes seniors with mobility issues and those living in nursing homes in retirement villages. The ACT government is currently undertaking a review of this service to ensure that it is appropriately targeted to meet current community need. The Council has made four recommendations for consideration by the government and two recommendations for consideration by the seniors clubs. The recommendations look at ways in which seniors clubs can work best together with the ACT government and broader community to enhance their programs. The first of these recommendations calls on the government to support clubs in developing new facilities or upgrading existing club facilities. The ACT government acknowledges that with the growing population of older people, existing clubs infrastructure present a barrier to expanding the facilities, membership and the scope of activities offered. The ACT government is committed to support existing seniors club to develop their centres and it continues to consider proposals and explore options to assist with the development of facilities through the ongoing discussions with the Department of Land and Property Services and the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Services. Madam Assistant Speaker, between 2003 and 2006, the ACT government provided over a quarter of a million dollars to seniors clubs for repairs and maintenance through the Renew Community Infrastructure and Facilities Program. We continue to provide funding for seniors clubs for equipment, special events and projects through a number of grants programs. Between 2006 and 2010, over $38,000 of funding was provided to seniors clubs through the ACT government um, seniors grants and sponsorship program. This report confirms the important role that senior clubs plays in engaging and encouraging the community participation of older Canberrans through the provision <coughs> of a range of centre-based and community activities in a safe environment. The seniors clubs are an important part and they also reflect on the grand party in the park when we had seniors weeks just a couple of weeks ago. They're a valued part of our community and the seniors club is a way that they network and support each other. The report confirms um, that the important role of our seniors clubs here in the ACT. And I'd also like to thank the ACT Ministerial Advisory Council on Ageing for its report and recommendations for improving and enhancing the facilities and programs offered by seniors. Um, the ACT Ministerial Advisory on Counseling for Ageing is a very strong and solid group. They provide good, solid advice to me, and I do value their contribution. I'd also like to thank the, um, the staff at the Office for Ageing for their ongoing support, not only to me, but to the older people across all of Canberra. The involvement of older people in social activities is important for their inclusion in our community, and I look forward to working with the councillor to advance these recommendations. The question is the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Um, Mr Speaker received letters from Ms Bresnan, Mr Coe, myself, Mr Hanson, Ms Hunter, Ms Lacuda, Mr Seseldra and Mr Smith proposing that matters of public importance be submitted to the Assembly and in accordance with Standing Order 79, Mr Speaker determined that the matter proposed by Mr Hanson be submitted to the Assembly, namely the importance of fiscal discipline. Mr Hanson. Madam Assistant Speaker, thank you. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today on this matter of public importance. And this is about the matter of fiscal discipline. It's a concept that, although it's wrapped up in the technical nature of the budget process and financial analysis, it's a concept that I think we can all understand at the most basic level. We all exercise, or we should all exercise, fiscal discipline when we're determining what groceries we purchase, how we'll pay for our children's education expenses, or how we'll pay for maintenance on our homes. And Madam Assistant Speaker, it is ironic today that I should win the MPI because my mother is in the audience. Now, if anybody understands fiscal discipline, it's my mother. And I have gladly learned that lesson from her. Unfortunately, the ACT Labor government just doesn't seem to understand the concept of fiscal discipline. And when it comes to ACT taxpayers' money, they simply do not understand. They seem to believe that there's a pot of gold that will go on to fund their most extravagant promises without any impact on residents' hit pockets. And this government, when they're at the supermarket, choose to use credit to buy the sirloin steak and the bottles of champagne without a thought to how the bread and the milk will be paid for. Madam Assistant Speaker, to this government, spending more money means success. That is how they measure success. 
and they believe the more they spend, the better government they are. They believe that as expenditure goes up, so does their credibility. But unfortunately, while this may work at election times, it doesn't work over the longer term. The ACT is now put in the unfortunate situation where we have no contingency. We have no plan B. We've spent too much at the supermarket on steak and champagne. When the unexpected bill comes in for roof repairs for our home, we'll have no way of paying for it. And we only have to look at the Queensland floods, Madam Assistant Speaker, and the imposition of the flood levy to see what happens when budgets are not managed to ensure there's a contingency for the downtime or for disasters. Now, the bill for roof repairs may not be too far off for the ACT. And just today, the AMP markets, uh, Capital Markets Chief Economist, Shane Oliver, had this to say. After relative calm in financial markets, from September to February, it seems the, worst, the worry list for investors has blown out to include Japan, oil prices, inflation, China, US housing, the Fed's exit from easy money, European debt problems and the high US public debt. The effects of the global financial crisis are not over, Madam Assistant Speaker, and the effect and the pressure on our economy is not over. We can't be complacent and think that this won't affect us, because it will. And you only need to look to Portugal, to Greece, to the UK and see the effects that the GFC has had on those local economies. The effects on economies where spending has exceeded savings year after year, where there was no fiscal discipline. And the effect has been drastic budget cuts and riots on the streets. Now, federally, the impact can already be seen. In the 2010-11 budget, the federal Labor government went into almost $80 billion of net debt, or about $3,500 per Australian to fund their extravagant promises. And they use this debt money to fund school halls, pink bats and the big cash splash. And they wasted the Australian taxpayers' money on $12 billion worth of grants on environmental uh, projects across the states and territories that the Grattan Institute has found in a report released today have done almost nothing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's $12 billion, Madam Assistant Speaker, spent by federal and state governments on climate change initiatives that have Order been members. utterly futile. Mr. Hargroves, Mr. Not only did the federal Labor government budget spend so extravagantly, but then they've mismanaged the budget since then. As it was revealed in The Australian this morning, the cost of capital works for the mammoth NBN project looks to surge more than 50 per cent above forecasts. So this is potentially $20 billion on top of the already budgeted $45 billion for this NBN that the federal government is <coughs> relentlessly pursuing. Of course, this isn't a new message, Madam Assistant Speaker, and if you look back at budgets and debts over the last 20 years, what you can see, particularly in the federal sphere, is that Labor governments simply cannot exercise fiscal discipline. And I recommend members go to a website titled labourwaste.com.au. And what you'll see there are a number of charts, and what you'll see is debt. Debt growing from 91-92. So as much as you hear about the Hawke-Keating government being so fiscally responsible, go and look at the evidence. Go and look at the facts. And what you'll see is that from the early 90s through to 95-96, that debt increased exponentially. And when the Howard government got in, it was $96 billion. And then you'll look at the charts, and you'll see they go down again. The debt is reduced to the point that we got into surplus. And we're in surplus. And then what happened? Madam Assistant Speaker, the government's changed, Labor got in, and the chart goes back up again, all the way up. It's like a roller coaster, isn't it? And the Treasurer comes down here, has a bit of a smile. But I think we know that this is a pattern of behaviour between Liberal and Labor governments. This roller coaster ride of debt and deficit under Labor and surplus and saving under the Liberals. The federal government has been forced to rein in their spending and they're already sending the message out to Australians that this federal budget will be a tight one. In light of the debt they put Australia into, that they just couldn't do their normal round of extravagant spending. And this, Madam Assistant Speaker, is where it becomes a real problem for Canberra because, as we know, as such a small jurisdiction, 
and so intrinsically linked into what the federal government does. If they sneeze, we catch a flu. That might be what's happened to my colleague, Mr Smith. And in the 2009 estimate hearings, Chris Falks, the chief executive of the Canberra Business Council, stated that the worst case scenario is a perfect storm where you have budgets at both levels taking drastic measures to return the budgets to balance. And that's exactly what we're heading to. So the Treasurer has stated that there'll be no new spending in this budget, which means that we're heading towards the perfect storm, potentially, for the residents of the ACT. The federal budget will be tight, the territory budget will be tight, and why? Because successively, the Labor governments at both levels cannot understand that you cannot endlessly spend and spend and spend without consequence. Madam Speaker, in 2001 2002, the ACT budget was $1.5 billion. In 2011-12, the budget looks to be about $4 billion. The question is, do the residents of the ACT feel any better for this almost fourfold increase? The residents I speak to, whilst out door knocking or at shopping centres, certainly don't think so. And they're sick of waiting longer for services. They're sick of the city not looking as tidy and they're sick of continually being hit on the cost of living. 2001-2002 budget revenue for the Territory was about $2 billion. In 2010-11, budgeted revenue was nearly $3.7 billion. And this is an increase of revenue of 80 per cent. So there's an effect of CPI, Madam Assistant Speaker, but if you discount that, this still represents a 40 per cent increase in revenue for the ACT. But instead of using the expenditure to cater for increases in demand due to population growth and demographic change, the government has chosen to make extravagant spending decisions. And you need to look at the last territory budget to see that in action. And the mismanagement of the budget can be seen across all the portfolios, Madam Assistant Speaker, and I'll choose a few examples today to illustrate the lack of fiscal discipline and the wasteful spending that this government has exercised with ACT residents' money. But let there be no doubt that I could speak for days when it comes to examples of budget overspending and mismanagement that this government has illustrated. Yeah. Now, it's good that the Treasurer is here because she's also the Minister for Health. And as we know, the large proportion <coughs> of the ACT budget is health, and it's a subject that's close to my heart. As we know, Madam Assistant Speaker, people continue to wait longer in emergency department waiting rooms, spend longer on elective surgery waiting lists, and still have difficulty in getting to see a GP. And this is while the Minister for Health is spending, or has recently spent, $43 million on a car park that was meant to cost $27 million. And while this minister, this minister brought forward a plan to spend $77 million on a hospital that we already owned. She says it would have been money well spent. Well, what we find out from the Auditor General and the accounting advice is that we don't need to. That it, the, the whole myth, uh, this, is where the, this is where she shows her colours, Madam yeah. Assistant Speaker. The, basically what she's admitting Order, here with Treasury. her interjections is that the, the whole accounting trick that she was talking about, we had to own it so it makes our budget look better, that didn't really matter. I mean, that's what she's saying with her interjections because she's saying that we still wanted to own it. So we do know that this is, again, she is prepared to spend $77 million of our money to appease her ideology and that of the left faction of the Labor Party, and I think we already knew that. Now, she's now planning to spend about $800 million or thereabouts, up to that money, on 400 new hospital beds. And I do hope that when she comes up with the plan to do that, that she does it in a way that is fiscally responsible, that gets the best bang for the buck, and isn't simply a matter of saying, look how much we're spending as a measure for her success. Because, as we know from the Auditor General's report and from other reports, that the health system is not being run as it is effectively or efficiently. Um, one of my other portfolios, corrections. As we know, the Alexander McConaughey Centre was delivered well over budget. So it was meant to cost $120 million to deliver 374 beds. But what did Simon Corbell deliver? $130 million for 300 beds. And now that prison is so under capacity sorry, over capacity, that it's going to need retrofitting with bunk beds, and that's going on at the moment, costing us more money. And as Keith Hamburger found in his report, they're going to need to actually build more facilities, probably up to the 374 that was originally scoped for. 
and it's costing us $477 for a prisoner held in that jail. And that was 163 when we sent them to New South Wales. And we promised it would cost us no more than that. And it's costing us double that. But, Madam Assistant Speaker, I think that if we were getting the world's best jail, we might be prepared to pay such an extravagant sum. But I think if we reflect on the report that was tabled by the, tre the Treasurer and the Health Minister just previously, what's quite abundantly clear is that we're getting anything but world-class jail. Champagne prices with what is a very much a beer result. So this is uh, just simply the tip of the iceberg, and I could go on with some exa examples of wasteful spending and inefficient spending. I think the GDE, uh, because they didn't build it with two lanes initially, that's cost us, I think, an extra 20 billion, sorry, 20 million. Uh, the dam, if you recall, was meant to, and this is a matter close to your heart, Madam Assistant Speaker, was meant to cost taxpayers 145 million, and it's blown out by 150%. So we're going to be spending an extra $220 a year on the cost of water security in the ACT by 2013. The Arboretum. Now, I drove past the Arboretum today with uh, members of my family, uh, including my aunt, Christine, who's visiting from the UK, and we looked at it. And I said, there's the Arboretum, and I'm sure it will be a lovely Arboretum when it's completed. But the discussion we had is that given the state of our health system, given the state of other aspects, of the state of this territory, it is an <coughs> indulgence, an indulgence. It is a champagne product, and we simply cannot afford it here in the ACT, as lovely as it may be. Similarly, the roadside art, Madam Assistant Speaker, while we're in deficit, whilst we have no contingency for flood or famine or simply a downturn, simply the federal government cutting into its, its budget here for the ACT and the effect that's going to have on us. It's an indulgence. And we can see that this is not a, you know, untypical, a typical of this, uh, this government. And Mr Hargraves is here, I note up the back there, talking to Ms Birch. And, you know, we can reflect perhaps on the Multicultural Festival and what a debacle all that was and how it was a seven-day festival, but because of Mr Hargraves' inability to manage the budget for that, it's now a three-day festival. So we see that the inability the inability to actually manage their budgets, to actually have fiscal discipline, means that things, the consequence is that things will get cut. And I think that the Multicultural Festival is a classic example. But what we know is that as a taste of things to come, more will be coming. We know that the Greens and Labor have called for a 40 per cent reduction in carbon emissions. That is an extravagance we cannot afford. The consequence of that is going to be enormous. How about the Greens? Ms Hunter is having a bit of a snicker over there. Remember in the GLA, they wanted a billion dollars spent on housing. Uh, they wanted buses that are coming every 30, uh, 30 minutes, and that was going to be an extra 100 buses at a cost of $35 million. So, Madam Assistant Speaker, I could go on and on and on. But what is clear is that this ACT Love It government, with its Green colleagues, simply cannot exercise fiscal discipline and the people that pay again and again are the ta taxpayers of the ACT. Matter of public importance, before you begin, Treasurer, can I point out there's a lot of conversation going on. It's disorderly to interject, and it's doubly disorderly, Ms Birch, to interject when you are not in your place. Uh, matter of public importance, uh, the Treasurer. Uh, thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. And I might start by giving... Um, an excerpt of the uh, budget speech um, presented to the Assembly on the 25th of June 2002, and in the words of um, Mr Ted Quinlan. Mr Speaker, since coming to government, we've been faced with a number of financial issues which the previous government had not addressed, <laughs> issues which are not small in dollar value or insignificance in their importance to the people of Canberra and to the running of effective government. Mr Speaker, I can only speculate as to the reasons why some matters were not provided for in the budget of 2001. For example, Mr Speaker, the Liberals have promised a jail. No capital funding was provided. Labor has now picked up the tab. A planning provision of 50 million has been set aside from the cash reserves to fund the, new, the construction of a new remand centre, a much needed facility. The Liberals had committed to funding of a medical school, but no budget funding was provided. Labor has now picked up the tab and has provided both the capital and ongoing contribution to the medical school. 
The last Liberal budget ignored the impending nurses' salary settlement as it ignored other very ob obvious wage and salary pressures. I think it was, what, 1 per cent was put aside for wages. The budget also presumed a clearly unachievable clawback in public sector superannuation. It goes on. It's become obvious that the information technology base has been neglected in terms of funding. The, this budget provides ongoing commitment to the funding of the cost of information technology against, uh, across the public service. And again, like Mr Hanson, I could go on and on for those opposite that are trying to portray themselves as the fiscally conservative and the only people that can manage an ACT budget. It's not what the records will show in time when historians go back and have a look uh, at these issues uh, with impartiality. I would also note that it appears that it is this time of year that we get uh, this belated concern around uh, the economy and the budget from uh, those opposite. Now, I did have a quick look back because I thought when I saw this MPI, I thought, I've seen this MPI before, and I have. In fact, I've seen ver versions of it in the April, April of 2008, um, April of 2009, and uh, I think of March 2010. Uh, it seems that the March-April sittings are the only sittings where the Liberals try and position themselves just prior to the Commonwealth budget and the ACT budget as, uh, as the only people that can uh, manage finances. And I would ask, as um, Mr Hanson's address goes to raising issues of concern about the impending, or the perfect storm, I think he called it, you know, what has the opposition done? To, if they can see this impending storm on the horizon, what have they done to uh, advocate on the needs and for the needs and interests of Canberrans? Have they been up to see the Federal Treasurer? Have they been lobbying Gary Humphreys? Have they been to see Senator Lundy? Have they been talking about the importance of the Commonwealth maintaining their spend in the ACT? Have they done anything? Have they provided a submission? Have they provided a submission to the ACT budget? No, not, not to my knowledge. Nothing. So you come in here in April, as the final touches are being put on the budgets of the Commonwealth and the ACT government's budgets, and now you're all concerned that there's a perfect storm coming? I've been talking about concerns with the Commonwealth budget spend for the last two years. I've been up there having meetings with them. In, in fact, today, at every opportunity, today, with the Federal Treasurer, with the Federal Treasurer, can you please... Please, if you are making decisions that are going to impact on Canberra, please think of us. You are the most significant spender in this territory. Any decision you take will disproportionately affect the people that I represent, that you represent. I mean, the Chief Minister's been up. He's met with Penny Wong. He's met with the, the Prime Minister. He's met with the Treasurer. We both met with the Treasurer in December. I've, seen, I've since met the Treasurer twice this year to talk about it. What have you done about Majura Parkway, the infrastructure needs? You know, what have you, what have you done? You come in here and you blame and you try to point the finger, but everyone here represents their community. Everybody in this place represents the local ACT community. And, you know, it wouldn't hurt sometimes to have the support of everybody in this place working together to advocate in the interests of the ACT. And the Majura Parkway is a classic example of where that kind of tripartisan uh, approach could assist uh, residents of the ACT. Uh, I think this budget, um, from the sounds that I've heard from the Commonwealth um, and decisions are yet to be taken, is going to be a tough one. I don't think there's any doubting that. And our, our budget is proving to be a very difficult budget to frame. What we're trying to do is be very conscious of the cost of living pressures uh, on families, particularly um, disadvantaged families. We are trying to be aware, um, conscious of the fact that the tax review is having a look at our revenue lines. But we're also mindful of the fact that in almost every major area of government service delivery, the demands for continued growth grow every year. Uh, and so it, it will come to a position where we do need an honest discussion about how are we going to pay for all of the services uh, that we need um, to keep um, the ACT delivering at the level that we currently do and not increase um, our revenue base. And, uh, you know, as much as that's a difficult conversation for politicians to have, 
I think it, it, it is going to be a conversation that this community needs to confront over the next uh, 18 months to two years because we cannot, with our population growing as fast as it is, and it is growing faster than I think anyone had predicted, uh, and with um, you know our population now over 300 and whatever, 360,000, uh, with the level of services that we're currently providing, we cannot continue to do that without looking uh, at our revenue base. And that's precisely why I commissioned the tax... Why I, I commissioned the tax review, and I'll be very interested to see whether the Liberal Party participate in that review and, and actually provide a submission about their ideas there. Um, and then, you know, whether or not the, um, you know, the tax review is given... Um, you know, I guess a mature conversation uh, from members of this place about how we actually provide services. Because it's not about the next two years or three years or four years. We'll be fine. Our balance sheet is strong. Our cash reserves are strong. We've got a very good budget, Mr Smith, as much as it probably pains to say for you to acknowledge. Standard & Poor's, in their latest uh, report, has acknowledged the strength of our budget. And I don't discount that had has had at least a little bit to do with every government that's been in this place, including your own, uh, that everyone has contributed to the strength of the ACT's balance sheet. I don't, I don't um, deny that. Um, but Standard & Poor's have also acknowledged that it's been the government's uh, financial management um, that has... Uh, and that's recent financial management that has um, ensured that the balance sheet remains as strong and that our outlook for the future is stable. That's, that's what Standard & Poor's are saying. Uh, you know, and I think you know, when we look at the tax review and opportunities into the future, it is the longer term. It's going to be for times when none of us are in this place. Uh, but I don't think it's a discussion that we can avoid e either. You know, I think it is one that we need to have. It needs to be mature and it needs to acknowledge the pressures that governments are facing. At, at the meeting this morning with uh, treasurers, we went round the, um, the table and all of them were talking around the pressures their budgets are under. The WA treasurer spoke at length about the pressures they're under to provide infrastructure and how much they're borrowing to deliver that and um, when they're going to reach capacity on that front. Um, the New South Wales Treasurer was the same. The Queensland Treasurer is the same. Everyone had the same story. Demand is growing, health is growing, infrastructure needs are growing, and that the revenues weren't necessarily growing at the same pace that demands for services are. So I'm not sure it's a Labor versus Liberal debate, and I think it probably demeans it to have it as a Labor versus Liberal debate. Uh, it's, it's a debate about whether or not your, your community is prepared to pay for the level of services um, that uh, they demand. And it's also acknowledgement that there is always efficiencies in government that need to be found, that waste needs to be minimised, efficiencies need to be found. I agree with all of that, and that's something that we've had as part of our budget. But I'd also acknowledge that whenever we have put in efficiency measures, it's of often those office opposite that have complained about those efficiency measures uh, and sought to have those efficiency measures re-agitated and re-cogitated. Um, and so, you know, it is very, very difficult in government to find efficiencies, to save frontline services, to deliver more, and at the same time when your revenues are actually diminishing, which is what we've seen. And I know Mr Smith will be saying they've increased, that when you look at them and you pull out the nation buildings and jobs money, which came in but was for a designated program, so it wasn't there as general revenue coming in to be used for recurrent spending, you will see that we lost, on average, $230 million a year over our forward estimates from the global financial crisis. Uh, now, that is a significant loss, and to only have a deficit the small size that we have now, um, I think in the mid-year review, uh, mid-year update, or the, um, the budget update, as we're calling it, not to confuse Mr Smith. At the budget update, we um, announced a figure of about uh, minus 50 million. Um, we then lost 30 million from the Commonwealth Grants Commission re review of relativity. So it's, it's, you know, before we start the budget, it's sitting at minus 80 million. To be in that position and to have lost the amount of revenue we lost across the Ford estimates, I think, speaks to the strength of the budget and the fact that we have sought efficiencies wherever we can um, and implemented efficiencies. But we have now, I'm not going to single out Mrs. Ms. Birch, but you know we have disability, we have child protection, we have education. Health is always a big offender in terms of demand. 
uh, and we need to meet all of those challenges. And, and I have to say we've been meeting all of those challenges against a sh what has been a shrinking revenue base. We have dramatically reduced our GST receipts, um, you know, and these have been revised and re-revised over the last three years. Uh, but in the future, and we talked about this again today, there is a tax forum um, coming up in October for the Commonwealth, the, uh, Commonwealth Tax Forum, which I imagine state revenues are going to be discussed uh, pretty openly then. By then we should have our ACT tax review in our hands uh, and be able to be in a pretty good position to have a discussion around um, the National uh, Tax Forum in October. Uh, and the reason I commissioned that work was, I think, Ken Henry in his review signalled the fact that in their view, or in his view, and I think it's a view shared by the Commonwealth, that there are inefficient state revenues uh, lines that need to be looked at. And I have no doubt that this will be the subject of much discussion in October at the, at the um, tax forum. And um, the ACT needs to be well positioned for that because I think it will turn into a, um, you know, what the states, the greedy states with their revenue lines, and we have to look at that and, you know, it'll be very easy to point the finger. But I think for us, in a small jurisdiction like ourselves with a narrow revenue base, we need to be able to stand united and protect the revenue that we get in the ACT to ensure that we are able to deliver services to our community. And I think um, Mr Quinlan's tax review and the work that's been put into that by the review team will give us some very good information about you know, whether we need to change some of our revenue lines, modernise them, make them more efficient and look at how we transition over time um, to a new uh, <coughs> range of... Um, or to a, whatever the tax review recommends. I'm, I haven't had a meeting with Ted for a while and I, I need to do that. But um, that, that will give us a good indication in the, um, or information in the lead up to that Commonwealth tax uh, forum. But I would just say it's very easy to come in here and and wave your finger and allege that you're the only fiscally disciplined group in the Assembly. But it's not a very mature way to have a discussion about our budget, the needs of our community, how we pay for them. Um, there's very little discretionary spending in the ACT budget for ministers. There's very little capacity for ministers to come and say, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, this is something new that I've wanted to do because uh, so much of the budget is already predetermined into uh, delivering core services to the community. And I reject any view that there is ex any excessive waste or um, you know, lack of priorities in terms of the spending within our current spend. Um, it is an area that we have gone through with fine tooth combs in looking for efficiencies, and we'll be doing so in this year's budget as well in order to pay for any new spending uh, that the budget outlines. But, you know, it is time, I think, that as parties in this place that we do lift the level of debate around this, that we do have a willingness from those opposite to acknowledge that there may, in the future, be a need to raise additional revenue if we are going to pay for all the services that we need to pay for. But I can certainly tell you from my point of view, and I think my time as Treasurer, if historians are even slightly interested in reviewing it when I'm no longer here, which I, I doubt, but if they say they were... Um, I've been accused of having boring budgets, Mr Smith, they're that fiscally disciplined. You know, I've done press conferences where the media have gone, well, this isn't a very exciting budget, it's a bit boring, and it's boring because it's fiscally disciplined, and I've been trying to deal with the shocks that our budget received in 2008 and return it to a surplus position and, as soon as I can. Um, and I think that's the right thing to do, but... Um, it's because of the fiscal discipline of this government that we're in a position where we can do that. Matter of public importance, Ms Hunter. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. And uh, budget time, of course, is fast approaching and it's appropriate we have a general discussion um, about the level of public expenditure. It was interesting, though, hearing about the last few years that every April seems to be the timing on this discussion, but that's OK. It is, uh, I believe, has a level of appropriateness. No doubt this issue will be revisited extensively over the next couple of months and the key questions for discussion are what should the ACT's fiscal stance or fiscal policy be, how soon uh, should we be aiming to return to surplus and what level of expenditure reduction is justified to meet that end. 
And in other words, what level of fiscal rectitude is required? And we'd probably all agree um, that the fiscal stance and the revenue and expenditure decisions that make up that position are absolutely critical to the ongoing prosperity of the ACT. Unlike other jurisdictions uh, or economies, the ACT is very much subject to the Commonwealth Government decisions. And this places us in a unique position that adds additional challenge and can offer some opportunities. As the Treasurer has indicated, we have recently suffered setbacks in the allocation of GST revenue, uh, and this will add to the challenge of providing all the services Canberrans expect from government. And as was also said, this has been on top of losses suffered through the global financial crisis. Now, all of us here in this place have different policies and priorities and would spend public money differently. The Greens are committed to a balanced budget over the budget cycle. <clears throat> Our priorities and commitments are very clear, and we've been very consistent in saying that what we think public money should be spent on, how it should be raised in the role of fiscal policy in a market-based economy. And I'd just like to briefly cover the fixation with balanced or surplus budgets that pervades the political discourse at the moment. From the language used um, by both major parties, one could reasonably think that some great catastrophe will befall us if we don't have a balanced budget. And whilst it is, of course, a laudable goal and undoubtedly we need sufficient fiscal and monetary space to ensure that we can respond to the natural economic, uh, economy cycles and counteract them to ensure stability, mainstream economic thinking does not support the at-all-costs approach to budget surplus that seems to have been adopted in recent years. Fiscal policy is very complicated and there is certainly much more to it than just achieving a balanced budget. It's overly simplistic and disingenuous to say that budgets have to be in the black to be prudent. That is not in any way to suggest that we don't need to carefully assess every expenditure decision and make sure that it is in our long-term economic interest before we position ourselves for the inevitable difficulties that will come from short-term thinking. Now, energy efficiency is the simplest and most basic example that illustrates the point very well. If I borrow money to improve the energy efficiency of my house, and it costs me $1,000, but each year it saves me $200, and the interest payments are only $70, it was a prudent economic decision by any measure. In the long run, I'm much better off. This is a very simplistic example, but it illustrates the point that our thinking should be about the long-term impact of our decisions, not the, just the mindless adherence to something that in and of itself makes little difference to our lives. It probably is easier to spend money than save it. In that sense, a level of discipline is required to avoid having to borrow funds to finance the budget. To the extent that this is true, fiscal discipline is required. No one likes waste. We all work hard for our living. And it's offensive to see money frittered away when it could be used to tackle the many serious problems that confront our community. <clears throat> and conceptually, there are two types of waste. The first we can all agree on, building something and then pulling it down to do it again, or providing materials grossly disproportionate to needs is waste that we would all disapprove of. And a couple of examples here would be Bunda Street, for instance. Bunda Street recently has had a lot of work done to it with the, uh, the new shopping mall going up across the road. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of money has been spent on that. And unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately now, there has been a change um, in decisions on Bunda Street. It's now been decided that it would be better off having it as a shared uh, thoroughfare. That means that a lot of the work that was done will be ripped up and have to be redone again. And that's an example of waste. Another one is a proposal to plant 500 trees down Northbourne Avenue. Well, the question would be, is this the right time to be doing that? As we know that there is a design study, a, a, a look at uh, an investigation into Northbourne Avenue about how Northbourne Avenue may be replanned, may be redesigned in the future to ensure that we do have uh, faster access for buses, we have better um, access and safer access for those who wish to travel by bike. So is this the time to be planting trees if we're only going to turn around in the short term 
to make a different decision about design and those trees will have to be ripped out again. The second issue uh, about waste is about what we each perceive is a policy waste. Um, and of course we would have different views on that and some others of course would argue that uh, one person who thinks a policy is a waste and another may find great merit in it. I no doubt we'll debate this question at great length when the budget is announced. However, there are a couple of particular policy areas that probably should be canvassed today in the context of a general discussion about what's an appropriate fiscal policy for the ACT. As I outlined earlier, the Greens very much believe that we need to think long term and respond to the issues today in a manner that assures that are properly addressed and not just postponed. And I guess that's why I was so alarmed to hear Mr Hanson uh, say pretty much that anything to do with uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, anything to do with trying to tackle climate change, was a waste of time. It's a waste of time and money. We can put that off to tomorrow. Where we know the experts have told us quite clearly if we put that off tomorrow, not only will we have a bigger mess to clean up, but it is going to cost a lot, lot, lot more for Mr Hanson's grandchildren and Mr Hanson's children to have to deal with. So maybe Mr Hanson really wants to get his head more into long-term thinking rather than very, very short-term thinking that he seems to be proposing. Um, the health portfolio is another area, and it re represents the single largest expenditure item and the biggest growth area in the ACT budget. And we know that health expenditure will representative, represent an enormous challenge in the future. And to respond to the challenge, we need to be investing more in preventative health initiatives. The challenge and required fiscal discipline is to recognise this and forego, forego other initiatives that might be more attractive in the short term but which in reality will make a limited difference in the long term. And I note the Minister's recognition of the need to do more, but also express the Greens' concerns that relatively minor changes to existing programs will by no means be adequate to address the enormous, enormous problems our community is facing. Preventable diseases are the major contributor to the health tsunami, and not only is it socially responsible, it's also economically prudent to do this, and in the long run will leave the ACT much better off financially and socially. Um, another uh, thing I, we have spoken about and I've spoken about in previous budgets and in this place is about the need to shift to a green economy and ensure that we're in a position to prosper from the challenges in front of us rather than lagging behind. And this issue is evident in a number of areas of our economy. For instance, the issue of waste looking at household uh, and commercial waste. If we uh, really uh, look at this area, we can get a lot of economic uh, benefits from recycling, reprocessing our waste here in the Territory, which comes back to how we collect that waste in the first place and how we deal with it as to what economic benefit we're going to get. But that's one example of how we can be shifting our economy to a green economy. Uh, and this, of course, there's discussions going on all over the world by governments, by financial institutions, by academic institutions around this concept of a green economy, green collar jobs, and how we can shift our economy to be far more sustainable into the future. Another area, of course, is around uh, making our houses more energy efficient. My colleague Shane Rattenbury introduced a bill this week, an exposure draft bill, which was the draft exposure around um, uh, ensuring that rental properties are uh, up to speed as far as energy efficiency. Now, another part of that, of course, is that that means that if that gets through, there will be ongoing uh, support and ongoing uh, work for businesses to keep going here in the Territory. We very much need to look at the opportunities we've got to shift to a green economy, and I hope this budget gets us one step closer. Mr Smith. Mr Speaker, and I'd like to say I'm delighted that my colleague Mr Hanson's brought this MPI on today. Um, it is a very important issue, and yes, it's good as the Treasurer to point out that we often have economic discussions in the lead up to the budget. Gee, who'd figure? Who'd figure that politicians would want to talk about the single most important bill of the year in the lead up to that bill? Well, I'm just surprised. I am so surprised. But what I'm more surprised over is that the, that the Treasurer had so little to say about her budget, so much so that she spent six of her 15 minutes attacking the Liberal Party 
and reliving history. Now, not just reliving it, but rewriting history and saying, oh, how, how badly the budget was off when they came to office because there were all these things unfunded. But the interesting thing is the money was there to fund them because the government did so in the following budget. They didn't have to find it. It was there. And it was there because what we left was a strong economy. And what we left was an economy and a budget that could cope with the things that we had promised. And that's unlike what we, what we inherited in 1995, when we had a $344 million operating loss left by the previous Labor government. $344 million it was more than 20 per cent loss on the turnover of that year. $344 million. And in the six years after that, of course, following Follett, you know, there were the cuts under the Howard government. Um, there was the collapse of HIH. There was the ANSET collapse. Um, there was the SARS tragedy. And then, of course, there was the Asian meltdown. Things which we coped with and still brought the budget back to the black and left the budget in a great position for the incoming Labor government to spend the next 10 years wasting those opportunities. 10 years of reckless spending and 10 years of failing to diversify the ACT economy and to prepare for the future. Now, Ms Gallagher complains that people thought her, her budgets were boring. Well, they're probably boring because there's been no ideas in them. There's been no drive. There's been no choice. There's been no initiative to say, we're going to take this economy and we're going to do something with it because we understand the potential of having the federal government here. We understand the potential of having the departments here. We understand the potential of having the largest contract signed in the country signed in Canberra with government departments. We understand the potential of five universities and their, or their campuses here in the ACT. We understand the potential of having the CSIRO headquarters here. We understand the potential of the smartest population in the country and their ability to come up with solutions. Yes, Treasury, your budgets are boring because they lack leadership, they lack ideas, they lack drive. They lack answers to the problems that face the community because of the lack of courage that your government has, has had and will continue to have in the future, well, at least for the next 81 weeks. Now, Ms Hunter makes a point. She says, what about recycling? What about waste? Well, we had a program to address waste in the ACT. It was called No Waste by 2010. 2010 has come and gone, and 2010 the target was missed. And what was missed most importantly was the industries that we said, back, as a Liberal government said back in 1996, that would be required to achieve the target of 2010. We had a problem. What we wanted to do was take a problem and turn it into an opportunity. We saw that that opportunity would create new industries that would answer problems that not that we had for ourselves here in the ACT, but all jurisdictions around the world had, and thereby giving us a more diversified economy. And it's just gone. The opportunities are just gone. They're not thought of. No waste by 2000 is just no waste, and it should actually be recycled. It's a waste, because it's a waste of an opportunity. And that's why, Madam Treasurer, as you return to this place, your budgets are boring because they lack leadership and they lack drive, and God help us when you take over as Chief Minister, because we'll get the same boring approach. We're good because we spend. We should be admired because we've spent so much of your money. And by the way, we're going to take more money out of your pockets because we can't stop our reckless spending. Well, that cycle is self-fulfilling, and that's how you get $344 million operating losses. That's how you get streams of deficits. That's how you get a government that budgets for deficits at the height of the boom. At the height of the boom, you manage to outspend your revenue and put us in the parlous position that we find ourselves. So, as I said, Madam Assistant Speaker, delighted that my colleague brought this on today because it is an important issue. And Mr Hanson touched on something that, um, that we all should be quite aware of. Given that the, the federal government is signalling a, a tough budget, and that more cuts have to be found in our local budget. Um, Chris Folkes, the, the uh, CEO of the Canberra Business Council, said back in 2009 that if you get, um, and, and I quote, our concern beyond that is at the same time that the ACT will be clawing back its deficit, which is happening now, the federal government will also be clawing back a very substantial deficit, which is happening now. When those two occur at the same time, the pain for the ACT is going to be significantly compounded. The worst case scenario is a perfect storm. 
and you get the perfect storm when you don't plan, you get the perfect storm when you don't make allowances for the future, you get the perfect storm following 10 years of reckless spending when you make no allowance for the future. Madam Assistant Speaker, um, we, we may well recall the way in which this government budgeted for the deficits at the height of the economic boom. ACT Labor governments budgeted for a succession of deficits from the 2002-03 to 2006-07, when, when the building boom was enormous, when the federal government spending was enormous, when prosperity in this country um, was, was enormous. And in those years, they, they, they had a deficit of $17 million predicted, $69 million, $5 million, $365 million. Let me repeat it. In 2005-06, this Labor government budgeted for a deficit of $365 million at a time when the Australian and the ACT economies were booming, and then another $68 million. That wasn't fiscal discipline. It was simply reckless spending. And to cry poor is to now forget your failures, to forget your record, and to forget that you made no, uh, made no allowance for the future. And was this appropriate budget policy? Well, of course it wasn't. Was it fiscally disciplined? Was it course it not? Of course it wasn't. And despite what the Chief Minister and the Treasurer and any other ministers may say, it failed the people of the ACT and they now pay for it through their increased costs of living. In recent weeks, we've had the latest instances of how this Labor government lacks fiscal discipline. Um, the ACT community is well aware of the difficulties that have faced all jurisdictions in dealing with and responding to the consequences of the global economic and financial crisis. Unfortunately for the ACT, we don't have a good record of achieving savings across our budget. In February this year, the Treasury gave us the details of the revision to the outlook for the budget for 2010-11, and she was able to tell us that the estimated budget deficit for 10-11 had been reduced from $84 million to $6 million which on the face of it you'd have to say is an outstanding achievement. Yet this reduction um, in, the in the estimated deficit was of $78 million um, was simply because of, um, not, not of the, this Treasurer's fiscal record and management, it was because we had a one-off payment from News Limited. One-off. That, that's, you know, th this is luck, this isn't budgeting. It's, a, it's as simple as that, Madam Assistant Speaker. Moreover, what the, what the Treasurer did not say when she released the update um, is also very significant. What she didn't say, or what she didn't comment on, was the fact that budgeted spending by this government was estimated to be 5 per cent above the actual level of spending in 9-10. 5 per cent increase. Um, did she say that the budget update revealed that spending would now be 6 per cent greater than actual spending in 9-10? Um, no, she didn't. These increases are significantly more than the rate of increase in consumer prices and are not indicative of fiscal discipline. And what are the position in the out years? 4 per cent. 5%, 4% increases. This isn't controlling your spending. This is merely going along hoping that something will turn up. Madam Assistant Speaker, oh, sorry, Madam Assistant, yeah, Madam Assistant Speaker. Um, um, we were also told that there were savings to be made, that some of these savings were identified, but that further savings would, ha would be required. Um, they would be identified in, in future budgets. That's in 2009. In 2010, the remaining savings will be achieved in future budgets. So we're probably here in 2011, that the future savings will be received, will be achieved in future budgets. Now, of course, there was one, one neat saving that, um, that the Treasurer latched onto, and that, of course, was the reduction of the provision for the uh, Treasurer's advance. Now, um, I'm, I'm glad to have helped. She said earlier we never help. Um, she never gave me credit for that one because when we put that out before the 2008 election, um, we, were, we were soundly lambasted by the, the Treasurer and her colleagues, but they took it when they needed it, didn't they? They took the Liberal Party idea and they said, that's a good idea. So there you go, we've helped Treasurer. Um, you might at least give us the credit for it. Um, Madam Assistant Speaker, I will conclude my remarks by quoting the findings made by our now former Auditor General Tu Farm in her report on the 2009-10 financial audits that was delivered in December 2010. In commenting on the ACT's long-term financial position, Tu Farm said, and I quote, the Territory's long-term financial position has weakened significantly in 910. However, its position was stronger than estimated in the budget. The long-term financial position is expected to further Smith, weaken over expired. the forward period, and that is why we need Mr. strong financial Mr. discipline. Mr. Yeah. Hargraves. Uh, thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. When listening to the, uh, the Treasurer's rejoiner, um, I'm reminded of the various alternative budgets that have been proposed by those opposite since 2001. 
and I could sum them all up by describing them as a piece of paper with please turn over on both sides of the page. And uh, that would keep those officers busy for about a week, I would suggest to you. Mr Speaker, one of the problems is in this place that uh, some people deliver strong fiscal management and responsible fiscal management, and some people um, really don't know what it means. It's supposed to, you would have expected in previous uh, budgets, for example, that when, when in opposition you would promote an alternative. You would say, well, I'm not going to expend on this, but, and I will, but I will expend here, or I will get the money to do this by getting it from somewhere else. I'll give you an example to that. Mr Smith said, I think, and also Mr Stefaniak, I think it was, I could be wrong here, but they said that they would not spend $100 million on the jail but rather they would put the $100 million into health services and get us more nurses. Now, you might say that. That sounds like at least an alternative. The argument that I have with, though, is that um, the $100 million was capital funds in the prison and Mr Smith wanted to apply it to uh, recurrent uh, provision of extra nurses. And uh, you would expect somebody who's been around as long as those opposite to know the difference between capital and recurrent. But if you don't know the difference between capital and recurrent, it means that um, you didn't actually do your homework in, uh, in budgeting 101. And, uh, and so you, can't really, uh, you don't really have the, uh, uh, I suppose, the uh, credibility to talk about strong fiscal management. Uh, Mr Speaker, I actually thank uh, Mr Hanson for, uh, for raising this matter of public importance on the importance of fiscal discipline. As the Treasurer has indicated, that fis fiscal discipline is a fundamental principle of good governance and a key attribute of a good government. Fiscal discipline is a prerequisite for macroeconomic stability, supports confidence in the economy and supports jobs, and it's conducive to longer-term growth. Fiscal discipline creates room to accommodate and respond to the unpredictable risks and crises while maintaining high levels of service to the community. And I'm reminded of something Ms Hunter said. Don't be afraid of a deficit necessarily. And she also said having an aim that we would be in surplus is laudable. And I support that view. Because let me just say this. Many people uh, in this town have mortgages you can't jump over. And their goal is to own that house. In other words, their goal is to be in surplus as a family unit. But the, the gauge on whether they are a strong, uh, strong economic household is whether they have the ability to service those loans. It's all about whether they have the income streams available to them to service that loan so that at the end of the day their dream of, uh, of having a household surplus is realised. And I think we lose sight of that analogy sometimes in this place when we talk about the size deficits uh, that we're faced with. Certainly they're large but I wouldn't say they're catastrophic by a long shot, not by a long shot. And given what we're actually getting in return, in terms of the spending on uh, social welfare projects, I think we're doing reasonably well, and I'm congratulating the Treasurer. Having sat in the Cabinet at times of, uh, of need, I have to tell you that uh, the Treasurer's done a remarkably good job to be where we are now. And, and except for the fact that I was wanting $25,000 for a particular project and, uh, and I wore out my, the trousers in the knees trying to get the 25 grand, but uh, that strong fiscal management meant that I had to go find it somewhere else, which I did, actually, Treasurer, and I just didn't tell you about it. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Treasurer also made a very important point, and that is that fiscal discipline is not an end into itself. Good governments exercise fiscal discipline, but they do it to achieve their core objectives for the economy and for the, and for the community. No doubt, Mr Speaker, that we've been faced with many challenges in the past two and a half years. World, national and local economies have been grappling with negative impacts of the global financial crisis, a term which seems to be missing from the speeches of those opposite, I might have to observe. And it also included, we're also grappling with the continuing uncertainty in financial markets and the progressive rise in the costs of delivering services to the community. The Territory has been mindful of all these conflicting pressures on our budget, coupled with the rising costs of living and the decreasing level of consumer confidence. We have responded prudently to the financial crisis and, as a government, 
undertake insensible measures to address the substantial hits to the budget, to ensure that essential services are maintained while adopting a measured approach to addressing the financial impacts. This was the correct approach, as evidenced by the ACT's recent affirmation of the AAA credit rating by Standard & Poor's. Territory's AAA credit rating is an important measure that provides the community in general with, a, with confidence that the Territory's finances are being looked after. It provides confidence that financial risks are being identified and managed and that debt is manageable. Mr Speaker, Standard & Poor's has indicated the ACT government's management is, in, is a very positive rating factor. They have given considerable weight to the government's response to the global economic slowdown and the decisions taken in 2009. In confirming the Territory's credit rating, Standard & Poor's noted that, quote, the ACT government's management is a very positive rating factor in 2009 in response to the economic slowdown and resulting drop in revenue. The ACT revised its uh, fiscal strategy with a primary focus on returning the Territory's oper operating position to balance by fiscal 2016. Improving revenue expectations has seen the return to surplus timeline revised to fiscal 2014, close quote. Mr Speaker, unlike the previous Liberal government, which delivered major deficits in four consecutive years and neglected services to the most vulnerable in our community at the same time, we have a plan to restore our budget. We have improved the level of services in many important sectors, including disability services, mental health services, child protection services and public hospital beds, to name a few of the issues that we have inherited from the previous government. Mr Speaker, this government has committed to and delivered the largest program of infrastructure investment across the Territory since self-government, a program that we continue to deliver. And this investment will build a hospital system to meet the needs of the next decade, improve our transport system and urban amenities, assist in responding to climate change and meet the needs of a growing city. We all know that delivering a capital program is not about spending dollars, it's about delivering projects. The list of projects that this government has successfully delivered is long. These include health facilities, roads, schools, families and community centres, public and social housing parks and other water infrastructure projects. Such is a confidence in this city, Mr Speaker, that we have a forest of cranes on the skyline, something that uh, was uh, hitherto unknown before this government took over. This government continues to work to reduce wastage of the community and taxpayers' funds, you know, like aeroplanes with, uh, with things blazoned on them, green grass on sporting fields those sorts of things. Any savings under our plan are redirected to frontline services that benefit the citizens of the ACT. And investments in hospital beds, teachers, police, roads, buses and the prison are not a waste of public money and an example of responsible financial management. Nor is our record of investments in disability services, health education and child protection. The government was able to provide additional funding to these important areas because of the efficiencies made to its overall operations. Speaker, it's extraordinary that providing more funding to address critical service delivery is seen to demonstrate a lack of fiscal discipline. Uh, Mr Speaker, towards the aims of our budget plan, we readjusted our spending and achieved savings. However, sharp adjustments were not made. And we maintained our investments in vital community and infrastructure, community services and infrastructure and supported business confidence, a fiscal strategy also employed by the Commonwealth and most other Australian jurisdictions. In fact, this government has worked hard to ensure health expenditure is sustainable and, grow and to contain growth in a to affordable levels. It's directed funding to areas of greatest need, including elective surgery, critical care and cancer services. Also, more doctors, more nurses and more hospital beds. As a government, we've imp implemented significant reforms in our public education system, investing in both new and existing schools, and we now have more teachers, smaller class sizes and more educational choice. Those opposite would commend this, should commend this government for prudent financial management. And by way of comparison, the former Liberal government's lack of financial discipline and appropriate investment in infrastructure led to well publicised and accepted failures in service delivery. And these include failure to support people with health issues, failure to support children at risk of abuse, failure to support people with disabilities, failure to house the homeless, and failure to adequately resource emergency services. Those opposite simply forgot that it's not possible to deliver services unless you have the infrastructure to do it. Mr Speaker, the government's strong fiscal uh, discipline has strengthened the economy, the local industry was supported and the future of the ACT looks more positive because of this approach. And importantly, this government's strong fiscal management has ensured the services of the community are a high standard and will continue to be delivered to that standard. Thank you, members. The time for debate has now expired. Mr Anthony, I'd seek in a call, are you? No?
Thank you. Because <laughs> I'm sure you'd be interested in Ms Lakuta's statement from the Standing Committee on Public Accounts, Ms Lakuta. Uh, th thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Pursuant to Standing Order 246A, I wish to make a statement on behalf of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts relating to inquiries about certain Auditor General's reports currently before the Committee. Review of Auditor General's Performance Audit Report No. 7 of 2010, Management of Feedback and Complaints. On the 27th of October 2010, Auditor General's Report No. 7 of 2010 was referred to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts for Inquiry. The audit report presented the results of the performance audit that reviewed the effectiveness of feedback and complaints management mechanisms within the Department of Territory and Municipal Services, TAMS. The committee received a briefing from the Auditor General in relation to the audit report on 10 February 2011 and a submission from the government dated 22 February 2011. The committee has resolved to conclude its consideration of the audit report with the tabling of a summary report. The committee expects to table its report as soon as practicable. Review of Auditor General's Performance Audit Report No. 9 of 2010, Follow-up Audit Courts Administration. On the 12th of November 2010, Auditor General's Report No. 9 of 2010 was referred to the Standing Committee on Public Accounts for Inquiry. The audit report presented the results of a follow-up performance audit that reviewed progress by the Department of Justice and Community Safety in implementing agreed recommendations from the Auditor General's performance audit in 2005, which reviews the efficiency and effectiveness of courts administration in the ACT and the recommendations of the Sixth Assembly Public Accounts Committee into the 2005 performance audit. The committee received a briefing from the Auditor General in relation to the audit report on the 22nd of February 2011. The committee reiterates previous comments it has made with regard to the importance of follow-up audits to assess whether agencies have addressed recommendations and findings arising from specific audits. This type of follow-up audit is an important exercise to inform the ACT Legislative Assembly on progress towards implementation of accepted recommendations. The committee has resolved to make no further inquiries into the audit report. As the audit report assessed progress by JACS with regard to the efficiency and effectiveness of courts administration in the ACT, the committee believes it may be of interest to the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety as per its portfolio coverage. The committee has written to the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety to bring the audit report to its attention. Thank you. Clark. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, actually, want... no, I was sorry, no, it doesn't matter. I was mm. going to do something. Clark. Executive business, yes. order of the day number one, courts legislation amendment bill 2010, resumption of debate on the question that this bill be agreed to in principle. Mrs. Dunn. Turning on, and I'll do with that later. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the Canberra Liberals will be supporting elements of this bill in principle and we will be proposing amendments in the detail stage of the debate. This bill aims to change the jurisdiction of the Magistrates' Court, as well as establishing the Family Violence List as the Family Violence Court and the Gallum Valley Court to administer circle sentencing. Generally, the, Can the Canberra will support um, these last two uh, measures, the Family Violence Court and the Gallum Valley Court, uh, but we do not support the government's proposal in relation to indictable offences. The government's proposal in relation to indictable offences um, uh, are of serious consideration uh, for us in the Canberra Liberals, and those amendments that I have foreshadowed will achieve a quite different outcome to that contemplated in the government's bill. They will be simpler and have a, lower, a far lower impact on the rights of accused people to be tried by jury, uh, especially uh, Thank you, impact on the lower rights of people, uh, uh, especially in relation to an accused right to a jury trial. The government's bill has the principal objective of reducing the caseload burden in the Supreme Court 
and to give a chance to catch up and give it a chance to catch up on its backlog. The government has not proposed the major changes in this bill for any pur purpose of delivering a benefit to the community. Indeed, it takes away the rights and privileges of the community to the extent of the rights of trial by jury for offences carrying penalties of five years, up to five years' imprisonment. The singular purpose of this bill is to relieve pressure on the Supreme Court. It is another Band-Aid approach to reform um, of, court, of a court system because the uh, Attorney-General failed to get his beloved district court up, something he proposed off his own bat and without consultation. This Attorney-General is too proud and too egotistical to accept the expert advice of the legal fraternity in relation to court reform. He has come up with his own idea in this case. I'm sure that he will claim that this was a suggestion uh, made by the Bar Association and the Law Society, but in fact what the Minister proposes in this bill in relation to indictable offences is exactly half of the suggestion made by the Bar Association and the Law Society and without the two components of that proposal uh, in this bill, uh, my, under my understanding is that there is general belief in the uh, amongst the legal fraternity that they cannot support this legislation. Madam Assistant Speaker, this bill seeks to take, uh, change the way the magistrate courts operate. It changes its criminal and civil jurisdictions as, and, as I've said before, establishes the Gallimbani Court and the Family, court, uh, the family Violence Court. Um, under this bill, uh, an indictable offence will be redefined so, that they, so it now carries a minimum sentence of five years or more. This means that offences carrying a maximum penalty under five years would be dealt with summarily uh, by the Magistrates' Court with no option available to a defendant to elect to go to the Supreme Court. The current threshold is two years with an option available for defendants to elect for summary or in indictment or indictment hearings for offences carrying a maximum penalty of two to five years. This approach, um, the approach proposed by the government is cumbersome and convoluted and sets out amendments to 22 other acts and regulations because there are a large number of specific offences and circumstances uh, that relate directly to indictable offences. For instance, Madam Assistant Speaker, there are a number of um, offices uh, that can be held, for instance, uh, to be a member of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, no, actually not. There are a number of offices that can, that can be held uh, or can be barred to people who have, have been guilty of an indictable offence. And the current definition of that is uh, punishable by a term of imprisonment up to two years, uh, more than two years. But with the government's changing of the, the definition of indictable offence, it means that it has to go back and recast all of those, um, those barriers to people uh, in a quite cumbersome way. More importantly, the government's bill uh, represents a significant diminution of the rights of an accused to have their matter heard before a jury. This derogation of human rights was the centrepiece of considerable discussion in report number 32 of the Scrutiny, committee, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. And it's worth summarising the position put by the committee. And when I'm summarising the position put by the committee, it is interesting that in many ways what the position put by the committee and, th and the advisor to the committee was reflected in many of the discussions that I had with members of the community about this, including the, the, historic reference, the, the historical references that I will uh, allude to. It may be some, uh, surprising uh, to some that the ACT's Human Rights Act does not necessarily confer a right to a trial by jury. And the ministers, uh, in his comments and his officials, have been quite... Um, they have gone out of their way to make this point uh, that, uh, that they don't believe that they're derogating from, from their, the human rights right to a fair trial by, by um, diminishing a right to a jury trial. The early stages of development of the ACT Human Rights Act did contemplate in, enshrining a right to a jury trial, this, and, but over time that changed, Madam Assistant Speaker. And the committee noted, uh, the, the Scrutiny Bills Committee no, noted in Report 32 that the ACT Consultative Committee uh, on the Human Rights Act appears clearly enough to have acknowledged that such a right would be of a set of rights that would be particularly relevant to the ACT community. But the report's authors recommended against the, the course of action, that is, 
um, enshrining in, in the Human Rights Act a right to a jury trial on the basis that would be, there would be fewer objections to the enactment of a territory law were it to be limited to the implementation of human rights treaties to which Australia had already been party. But the committee also, uh, the Scrutiny Bills Committee at report number 32, also made um, a lengthy historical reference to the, to the thread of, uh, and the history of trials by jury, which, uh, as those of us who care about these things know, stretch back in black letter law to 1297. The committee noted, and I quote, it is clear that a right to a trial by a jury in any serious criminal matter is deeply rooted in the Anglo-Australian legal and political tradition. The committee notes, uh, noted the comments of Justice Dean in the case of Kingswell and the Crown, in which his honour uh, noted, and I quote, it is, however, clear enough that the right to a trial by a jury in criminal matters was, by the 14th century, seen in England as an ancient right. The centuries that followed were, there, in the centuries that followed, there was consistent reiteration by those who developed, pronounced, recorded and systematised the common law of England of the fundamental importance of the trial by jury to the liberty of the subject under the rule of law. Gee, I wish I'd said that. The Scrutiny Committee also noted that Section 80 of the Australian Constitution acknowledges the importance of jury trials and it says, and I quote, the trial on indictment of any offence under any law of the Commonwealth shall be by a jury. As I said, Madam Assistant Speaker, the right to a trial by jury stretches back to 1297 and to that year's version of the Magna Carta. ACT law through the Legislation Act adopts Chapter 29 of that version of the Magna Carta. The committee noted that in part, in cha in part Chapter 29 provides uh, that once, and, uh, and I'll quote, nor will we pass upon him nor condemn him by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. The committee concludes, Madam Assistant Speaker, by saying that, and I quote, the proposed reduction in the availability of trial by jury of a criminal charge would bring about substantial changes to the constitutional arrangements of the Territory concerning the administration of justice. I'll just repeat that. The proposed reduction in the availability of trial by jury of a, tri of a trial of a criminal charge would bring about a substantial change in the constitutional arrangements of the Territory concerning the administration of justice. Once upon a time, the threshold was one, one year for an indictable offence, but it became two. But this ACT Labor government, with its, uh, this government that claims that it upholds the human rights principle, now proposes to increase the threshold for trials on indictment to five years. This is a serious derogation of the rights of an accused to a trial by jury, and this government has given little, if any, credence uh, to it, this in its justification for this change in the jurisdiction of the Magistrates' Court. It is merely said that it will help to reduce the backlog in the Supreme Court. Madam Assistant Speaker, I'm troubled by the government's approach and I'm troubled by the government's disregard for the impact it will have on the rights that extend back in, in our law and our history of our law more than 700 years. I note from the Attorney-General's response to the Scrutiny Rep Committee report that he will be tabling a supplementary explanatory statement to address the shortcomings in the, the initial um, explanatory statement which the committee identified and commented upon. I look forward to that, Madam Assistant Speaker, and I note again uh, that it is, it is the Department of Justice and Community Safety and the Attorney-General who has become a serial offender uh, of the, the the requirements of the Scrutiny Committee for more fulsome um, discussion of the derogation of human rights in, in the explanatory statement. I also note that there is work afoot uh, in, in the Scrutiny Committee, courtesy of the advisor, uh, to, uh, to um, assist uh, officials in how to write a human rights compliant explanatory statement. And I hope that we will see an improvement and that the, the Minister will cease to be a serial offender. Madam Assistant Speaker, the League Fraternity wanted provision, as I said before, wanted provisions enabling rehearsing rights for all summary matters in the Supreme Court. Civil Liberties, um, of a, Civil Liberties Australia also expressed strong criticism of the Government's bill and supported the approach which will be put forward in amendments uh, that I will move in the detail stage. Uh, which will be in May. 
The government rejected that proposal because the attorney because um, the attorney general says that um, if we went down that path, uh, the process that, uh, that that was originally asked for by the Law Society and Civil Liberties and the Bar Association uh, couldn't happen here in the ACT because it would uh, require the involvement of an intermediary, intermediary, intermediate court and he thought that it would not assist with his aim of reducing the load of the Supreme Court. As I said, the amendments I propose I will propose in the detail stage will not completely restore the right of an accused to a trial by jury. However, it will go some way to ameliorating the derogation of that right as proposed in the government's bill, and my amendments will be subject to review. And in, in the subject and in subjecting to them to review, it is my uh, hope that by the time these uh, amendments have been in operation for two years and reviewed, we will have addressed the backlog in the Supreme Court. And if the legal community and the court community doesn't find that these have been efficacious in terms of delivering justice, uh, that they can be removed because their reason for being inserted will have been removed. In addition uh, to the changes to indictable offence, Madam Assistant Speaker, the Government's Bill also extends the civil jurisdiction of the Magistrates' Court, enabling the Court to determine matters involving claims of up to 250000 the current threshold is only $50,000. I note that there are various alternative approaches that have been suggested by the ACT Law Society and the ACT Bar Association. Uh, the Law Society has suggested a threshold of $100,000 with $250,000 um, being dealt with at, with the consent of the parties and the Bar Association suggests a threshold of $150,000 or $250,000 with the consent of parties. The threshold amounts proposed by the government seem to the Canberra Liberals reasonable in the context of the quantum of claims being made these days in civil matters. More importantly, the Canberra Liberals consider that the government's approach is simpler than that proposed by the legal fraternity. Uh, given, a civil matter is, uh, given a civil matter is already in court, negotiation as to which court should hear the matter doubtless would only add to the existing antagonism between parties and not speed things up. Finally, Madam Assistant Speaker, the bill also um, establishes two new courts, the Family Violence Court, which, which is given its own status within the Magistrates' Court, and secondly, the Gallum Valley Court uh, gives statutory recognition to the specialist ACT Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Circle Sentencing Court. It too will uh, operate within the Magistrates' Court and will provide culturally sensitive sentencing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander offenders. The Canberra Liberals will be supporting the establishment of these two jurisdictions. Madam Assistant Speaker, I want to spend uh, a few moments to reflect upon uh, the work that has been done by the non-government parties uh, in consultation with the, the legal community uh, uh, in uh, coming to a better solution than the one proposed by the government. I want to acknowledge the considerable work that has been done in this regard by Mr Rattenbury and his staff in developing amendments to the government bill relating to criminal jurisdiction in the magistrates' courts. These, were, these amendments were crafted in order to pick up an approach that was proposed by the legal fraternity. I was uh, going to go down this path myself. Mr Rattenbury uh, informed me that he had already started the process and I deferred uh, to him in this regard. Uh, I, in, and I was... Um, open to supporting Mr Rattenbury's uh, amendments. But I, had, I was troubled by them uh, when, I, when I saw them in their final form because I thought that they were uh, somewhat complicated. Um, and I had some discussions with members of the legal fraternity who, while they were supportive of the approach, thought that the means were, were somewhat complicated. And in, in the course of that discussion, a member of the Bar Association uh, offered to me um, a, a simpler version, um, and I understand that that, uh, that's, uh, the, that a similar offer was made at about the same time to the ACT Greens. I looked at the proposal. I thought that the, it had merit because I think it is simpler and more streamlined, uh, and that we we drafted up an alternative set of amendments. And in the last two or three days, uh, Mr. Rattenbury's office and my office have worked quite closely and quite collaboratively and in a very, very good spirit, I think. Um, 
to come up with a with a, a consensus view about how this should should go forward. Uh, this culminated this morning in a, in a meeting with members of the legal fraternity who came and gave some specialist advice on, on, on some of the wording. I would have preferred to deal with this matter today, but as a result of um, a couple of issues that were raised in the meeting this morning, I uh, thought that it would be inappropriate to rush through another set, a, a, a few amendments to, the, to, the, to that. I thought it would be better to give uh, everybody concerned uh, time to, to look at it. Mr Rattenbury also raised the question that um, my amendment, while, while my amendments have been through the scrutiny report, scrutiny process, the final versions have not. And by uh, agreeing to uh, take this to the, the in principle stage, to agree to this bill in principle and then adjourn it, it gives um, the members, it gives the drafter more time, it gives members of the Legislative Assembly more time to consult and make sure that it's absolutely right. Uh, it gives uh, scrutiny of bills an opportunity to look at the final version that I think that everyone will agree upon, and it gives the legal fraternity um, an opportunity to comment as well. So that in the in the course of the next uh, week or so, there will be um, a final set of amendments which will be circulated widely for comment and consultation. Um, I wanted to thank Mr. Rattenbury and his staff for the thoughtful and considered work that they did. And I want to also thank them for the readiness to provide my office with information and material in a, in a timely and ongoing fashion and their willingness to discuss amendments. Um, I want to thank the, the ACT Bar Association for their contribution uh, to making the amendments that we had before us uh, much simpler. And I would like to thank the input from the ACT Law Society as well for their um, quite detailed uh, uh, input this morning, and I particularly want to thank the Parliamentary Council Office who who, to, who were set about um, drafting uh, a set of amendments that reflected the advice of the ACT Bar Association. Um, in doing in doing in saying this, in concluding, I, I have to go back to where we started. The bill that the government presented in its present form, in in that in the way that it relates to indictable offences is quite unacceptable to the Canberra Liberals. It is quite unacceptable. Um, I understand to the ACT Greens, but Mr Rattenbury can speak on that, on that matter. And it is quite unacceptable to the ACT Bar Association, the ACT Law Society, and the ACT uh, um, Council for Civil, Civil Liberties Australia, the ACT branch. And it's interesting that the proposal that, that we'll, I will be proposing and, and uh, that Mr Rattenbury has worked on as well reflects the concerted view of the Bar Association and Civil Liberties Australia, which I think is a... If both, both of those organisations are singing from one hymn sheet, I think we've probably hit a sweet point. Um, and I thank the very um, concerted uh, assistance that, we have re that I have received uh, from the legal fr fraternity, um, I, and I, in anticipation, commend the amendments that we will deal with uh, at, on a later day. Uh, but say that we cannot support the, the major elements of this bill as proposed by the government. The question is that the bill be agreed to in principle. Mr Rattenbury. Thank you, Madam Assistant Speaker. Uh, this is a significant bill that makes three important reforms to the justice system in the ACT. The Greens understand the reasons for each of the reforms, and we agree today in principle with the need for the changes. However, the Greens disagree with the government on one critical aspect of the reforms, and as Mrs Dunn has spoken of, there will be important amendments moved in the future. I thank Mrs Dunn for her comments on the work that's been done there. I think the cross-party work that has been going on between the Canberra Liberals and the Greens on those amendments has been very effective, and I welcome the collaborative work because it, we believe it will deliver a better outcome for the community. In contrast to this, I was somewhat surprised when I emailed the attorney late in February with a proposal the Greens had prepared. It was a detailed proposal that took time to fully understand and one which we had spent time consulting the legal profession on. I emailed through to the attorney at 3.35pm on a Friday afternoon in February. My intent was to give the attorney and his department some time to go through the proposal in detail and come back with a considered response. The amendments did run to some many pages. You can imagine then that I was in for somewhat of a disappointment. Eight short minutes later, at 3.43pm, the attorney replied to my email thanking me for sharing the proposal but stating in a single line, 
it won't have our support. Eight minutes consideration before the attorney had made up his mind, and eight minutes to weigh up the competing interests of the century-old right to a jury trial against the need for greater efficiency in the ACT courts in the year 2011. Now, that was a disappointment, not that we wouldn't get the support, but that, uh, unfortunately, there was such a lack of willingness to engage in a meaningful discussion. I do prefer the approach we've been able to put together with the Canberra Liberals on this one, who've been seriously engaged in this important issue. I'd like to briefly cover the two uncontentious reforms proposed by the bill before returning again to the need for the amendments. Firstly, the existing family violence list in the Magistrates' Court is upgraded to official court status with the formal creation of the Family Violence Court. And secondly, the existing Circle Sentencing Court for Indigenous Offenders is also upgraded and given official court status uh, with the creation of the Gallimbunny Court. These two reforms reinforce the good work that is already occurring in the Family Violence List and the Indigenous Circle Sentencing Scheme. At the heart of these two changes is the principle that one size does not necessarily fit all when it comes to the justice system. What we have learned over time is that, that if we rigidly apply legal process to vulnerable groups, we run the risk of our justice system becoming counterproductive. Victims of family violence and Indigenous offenders are two key examples of where the criminal justice response in the ACT has been able to be tailored to re reflect specific vulnerabilities. This benefits society overall, and the Greens very much support the amendments in, this pr in principle contained in the bill. Returning to the remainder of the bill, the third and final reform proposed by the bill is to enlarge the jurisdiction of the Magistrates' Court, to divert cases away from the Supreme Court and free it up to work through some of its backlog. Now, this is a goal which the Greens support. We do believe, however, that the government has overreached in how they have gone about the reform. We believe they've gone too far and, as a result, are taking away the long-held opportunity to a jury trial. This is a fundamental legal principle and one which the Greens are not prepared to give up as lightly as the government appears to have done. What the government proposed is to redraw the threshold between what is a summary offence and what is an indictable offence. Currently, all crimes carrying a penalty of up to two years or less are summary matters, and everything above that is an indictable offence. Now, this largely affects the status quo around Australia. Six out of nine Australian jurisdictions set the threshold at two years. Two jurisdictions set it at three years and one sets it at 12 months. So summary offences around Australia are those that carry one, two or three years imprisonment. In the scheme of things in the criminal law, these are the low end crimes and the ones that occur with a relatively high frequency. Trials for summary offences are carried out in the magistrates court around Australia where they are dealt with expertly and efficiently. Due to the frequency at which these cases are brought through the courts, the law is well settled for each. For example, any defence lawyer worth their salt will be able to cite from memory the elements of the crime of common assault, likely sentences to apply for a given set of facts, and any relevant well-settled case law. Now, the government's bill seeks to redraw the line at five years, putting the ACT significantly out of step with the rest of Australia. In redrawing the line in this way, more serious cases with larger and more severe sentences would be diverted to the magistrate's court where they would be tried without access to a jury. Crimes where the defendant is open to being sent to prison for five years are of a different character, we believe, to the summary offences. They are more complex, the facts required to be proven are more detailed, and there is more case law to be taken into account. For these reasons, we believe that these more serious offences should have access to a jury trial. This is a fundamental part of the legal system that the government would seek to have us remove. I'd like to reflect on two quotes that encapsulate the importance of a jury trial. The first is from the scrutiny of Bill's report from the 10th of February this year. It says, and I quote, it is clear that a right to a trial by jury in any serious criminal matter is deeply rooted in the Anglo-Australian legal and political tradition. And later, and later, when quoting the 1985 High Court case of Kingswell, it was quoted as, it is clear enough that the right to trial by jury in criminal matters was, by the 14th century, seen in England as an ancient right. In the centuries that followed, there was consistent reiteration by those who had developed, pronounced, recorded and systematised the common law of England of the fundamental importance of trial by jury to the liberty of the subject under the rule of law. 
Perhaps an even more succinct statement of the matter was contained in a letter written by Civil Liberties Australia and sent to the attorney, Mrs Dunn, and myself. And Civil Liberties Australia wrote, the right to a jury trial in the British common law world has been a basic common law right for more than 800 years, with its fundamental importance being entrenched in the Magna Carta. It is a right that has endured through major world wars, the security imperatives of the Cold War, and the threat from Irish Republican Army terrorists, and later from Islamic extreme ter extremist terrorists. These are the arguments and the factors that have driven the Greens to investigate if there isn't a better way to cut the backlog while at the same time protecting the right to a jury trial for serious cases that warrant one. And there is clearly a tension here between two competing rights, that of access to a jury trial and that of access to timely justice. And I think that is something we sought to very much weigh up in, re in considering whether there was a possible different approach to this matter. And we were f pleased to find that the answer was yes, there is indeed a more responsible way through this. And as Mrs Dunn has touched on, uh, the Canberra Liberals and the Greens are in the process of putting that into legislative effect. But to conclude at this point, I'd like to touch on the criticism that I anticipate is coming from the attorney when he rises to speak this afternoon, because I well imagine he is going to go back to his proposal for a district court and argue that if we wanted to protect jury trials, we should have gone with the district court proposition. Now, the Greens did not support the district court proposal at the time for two key reasons. And I believe those reasons remain valid today. Firstly, a compelling case was not put at the time of why adding a third tier to our courts would assist in the efficiency of the court system or in addressing the backlog. It was argued that having more judges would mean the same amount of work would be spread across more judicial officers. However, a more detailed analysis raised more questions than answers and questioned whether the workload would indeed remain the same or whether having more levels of court would ultimately add to the complexity and the overall level of work. Questions such as what about appeal rights? By creating a third tier to our courts, how would the threat of increasing avenues of appeal and increasing the workload be guarded against? More courts would also raise the possibility of requiring more staff at the DPP to attend at court and progress matters through it. And what additional court staff would be required? Unfortunately, none of these questions had clear enough answers to enable us to support the district court proposal. The second concern we have with the district court was that it risked rewarding inefficiency. The Greens made the decision that we wanted to make sure we were getting the most out of our existing two tiers of courts and judicial officers before adding to them with more. We thought there were efficiencies that could be gained through better processes, and the working group has identified some of those. In addition, we made suggestions to the attorney on where we thought some of those efficiencies could be gained, and some of them have already been adopted, and we uh, dealt with the bail act recently as one of those examples. We took what we thought was the responsible position of ensuring that we as a community are getting the best out of our courts and judges, that they are working as efficiently as possible before we add further tiers to the legal system. And so that is where we find ourselves today. Parts of this bill reflect the decision not to move to a district court, but rather to seek better ways to use our current system. As I have indicated, we agree with the government's idea that many cases carrying up to five years can be dealt with summarily. And I think that that's quite clear if one looks at the sort of cases that are going through. Often a, a penalty that potentially is very serious may well come in at the lesser yes, end yes, of the spectrum yes, and is suitably dealt with uh, at the level of the magistrate's court because in some senses it's a like matter to many of the matters the magistrate's court are dealing with as I said, expertly and efficiently on a regular basis. But we do believe that we need to put in place safeguards for the more serious matters, the matters at the end of the spectrum that could well attract a four or five year uh, term of imprisonment. We wanted to find a way through this that was both practical, but also just. Practical in the sense of improving efficiency, uh, not necessarily putting what might be considered relatively minor matters or less serious matters into the Supreme Court, ensuring that the Supreme Court is dealing with the most serious matters, but also retaining that element of justice of thinking about uh, the fact that somebody who does face up to four or five years incarceration should have potentially the opportunity to be judged before a panel of their peers. I believe that, uh, without foreshadowing too much, as we'll come to this in the detail stage, but the model that will be proposed, that we've discussed extensively 
with Mrs Dunn and with the legal community will deliver that in providing the Director of Public Prosecutions with an opportunity to send some matters to the Magistrates Court and where that is not sought for those more serious matters to go through to the Supreme Court with the prospect of a jury trial. Uh, Mrs Dunn did touch on the collaborative work that has taken place. I similarly appreciate the spirit of that work. Uh, unfortunately, some of, it, some of the thinking on it has come quite late uh, and we're not able to fully proceed today, but at the same time, I think we're undertaking very serious reforms here and I feel more comfortable that we would take the time rather than some of which we were putting the finishing touches on this morning to come in here this afternoon and present them. I prefer to have a, the situation, and I appreciate Mrs Dunn agreeing to this, that we give the drafters time to just think through the, the final few steps, that we have the opportunity for scrutiny to look at the final version, and also, for that matter, uh, for the attorney to review the final version and use the resources of his department to ensure that there are perhaps not unintended consequences, and there is an opportunity for that discussion to continue. Uh, it probably won't take four weeks. That's the time frame in which we sit again, and so that's when we'll come back to it. But I think come May we'll be able to pass this through the Assembly in a, an efficient and timely way. Uh, and so the Greens will be supporting the adjournment today when, it, uh, when we get to the detail stage in order to facilitate uh, the passage of a, as I say, I think a different way than the Government has proposed that has that element of practicality, has that element of seeking to use our court system more efficiently whilst retaining important uh, rights to the, to the access to a jury in the most serious of matters. The question is that this bill be agreed to in principle. Minister Corbell. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Mr Assistant Speaker, this bill is not the government's preferred approach. The government's preferred approach to reduce the Supreme Court backlog was to adopt from other Australian jurisdictions the proven methodology of a district court. However, as is sometimes the case, parliamentary members have indicated that the government's preferred approach would not be acceptable, and accordingly the government has had to adopt the second best option. The most significant jurisdictional change proposed in, this package of, in the package contained in this bill is the removal of offences with a two to five year maximum imprisonment penalties from the Supreme Court to the Magistrates Court. The government did not initially propose this approach. This proposal was made to the government by the Bar Association and the Law Society as part of a number of reforms. Mr Speaker, the government implemented and introduced this bill on the basis of those suggestions. While the government's preferred approach for dealing with the Supreme Court backlog was to establish a district court jurisdiction. Other parties in this place have made it clear that they will not support structural reform at this stage. This is deeply regrettable, considering that a large percentage of matters currently dealt with in the ACT Supreme Court are heard by a district court in other jurisdictions. If the ACT established a district court, the streamlined procedures of the court would have been better suited to many of the less serious criminal and civil matters currently heard by the ACT Supreme Court. Without the support of the Assembly for structural reform, the increase to the Magistrates' Court jurisdiction remains the only viable option open to the government. In addition to the reforms contained in this bill, the government has already implemented a number of measures to reduce the backlog in the Supreme Court. These measures include the appointment of three highly experienced retired judges as acting judges to assist with the, with the Supreme Court case backlog in the short term. The government has also converted underutilised hearing rooms in the Magistrates Court building into a jury courtroom and jury retirement room. Currently, the Supreme Court is only able to list two jury trials at any one time. A third jury courtroom will increase the Supreme Court's listing capacity and will allow the court to list 50 per cent more trials at any given time. Late last year, I introduced the Bail Amendment Bill 2010, which contained amendments to reduce the number of bail hearings in the Supreme Court. Contrary to the assertion by Mr Rattenbury, Mr Assistant Speaker, this proposal had been proposed by the government in advance of his suggestion. The purpose of the Bail Act amendments is to ensure 
that the issue of bail is explored fully in the Magistrates' Court, while still ensuring that appropriate access to the Supreme Court is retained. As members would be aware, this bill was passed by the Assembly in February this year. Finally, the Acting Chief Justice and I jointly requested a review of case management practice in the Supreme Court earlier this year. The review is currently underway and is examining listing practices in the Supreme Court, as well as considering practices adopted in other jurisdictions. I look forward to the outcomes of the review and their timely adoption by the court. In the absence of the Assembly's support for a district court, this bill, combined with the suite of measures already implemented and being implemented, presents the best option available to us at this time to reduce delays in the Supreme Court. And I'd just like to, on that point, elaborate a little, Mr Assistant Speaker. Mrs Dunn suggests that where is the public interest consideration of the government? Well, the public interest consideration is timely access to justice in the Supreme Court. It is not in the public interest that defendants and other applicants before the court have to wait protracted periods of time to have their matters heard. That is an overriding public interest consideration in the government's view and directly engages, and directly engages the rights set out in the ACT Human Rights Act to a right to a fair trial, which includes a right to a trial in a timely period. The effect of the bill we are debating today will be to increase the summary jurisdiction of the Magistrates' Court to include offences with maximum penalties of five years or less. Presently, defendants charged with offences with maximum penalties from two to five years imprisonment may elect to have these matters dealt with summarily in the Magistrates' Court or heard on indictment in the Supreme Court. Appeal rights are unaffected by the reforms in this bill. Defendants will still have access to an appeal from the decision of a magistrate to a single judge of the Supreme Court and ultimately to the full court of the Supreme Court. I know that the proposal to increase the summary jurisdiction was put forward by the legal profession itself. The Law Society and Bar Association proposed an additional requirement to accompany the increased jurisdiction, being a de novo appeal. A de novo appeal would create a right to a full rehearing in the Supreme Court of all criminal matters coming before the Magistrates' Court. The government for this cannot support a rehearing of all Magistrates' Court criminal matters. It would simply undermine the government's attempt to reduce the pressure on the Supreme Court. While this type of appeal appears to work quickly and efficiently in the New South Wales District Court, there can be no guarantee that this experience would be replicated in a superior court of record such as our Supreme Court. It has been suggested by some stakeholders that the bill limits the right to a fair trial by removing the option to elect to have a jury trial in relation to these offences, which under the proposed amendments would be tried by a magistrate. I reject, and the government rejects, any suggestion that this limits the right to a fair trial. In fact, it supports it by reducing undue delay in bringing matters to trial. The right to fair trial has a range of components, including right to trial without undue delay, right to a public hearing and equal access to and equality before the courts. While the jury trial plays an important role in the criminal justice system and is indeed a matter that I am pursuing in relation to serious matters in the Supreme Court, trial by jury is not a prerequisite component of the right to fair trial. The right to fair trial as propounded in the international conventions and as formulated under the Human Rights Act, is concerned with the appropriateness of the adjudicative action, not the nature of the decision maker. ACT magistrates meet the fair trial requirements of competent, independent and impartial adjudication. Through their demonstrated ability to deal summarily with a broad range of offences by consent, including indictable offences with greater penalties, than those affected by the proposed increase to exclusive jurisdiction, their experience in sentencing defendants in these matters and their knowledge of the law, I have no doubt that magistrates possess the skills and experience to competently hear cases which would fall within their sole jurisdiction as a result of the proposed reforms. I have not heard any argument to the contrary from those 
in this place. Increasing the summary jurisdiction supports the right to fair trial by upholding a key element of the fair trial, that is, right to a trial within a reasonable period and without undue delay. The current backlog of the Supreme Court is causing trials to be listed up to 24 months after the person is committed for trial. The right to fair trial is severely compromised by undue delays in hearing and finalisation of criminal matters. The structural reform of the court system was not supported by the Liberals and the Greens in this place. The government is obliged to take alternative action, which includes increasing the jurisdiction of the magistrate's court. The increased summary jurisdiction promotes greater accessibility to court proceedings through timely hearings. The rights to legal advice and representation, right to a public hearing and right to an interpreter are unaffected by the proposed reforms. Procedural guarantees associated with the right to fair trial, such as the opportunity for defendants to present their case, are bolstered by ensuring defendants are brought before the court more promptly and are not left with the uncertainty of a lengthy remand period. This does not seem to be such a concern for other members. A detailed analysis of how the Bill supports the right to fair trial, including references to the relevant international law and commentary, is contained in the supplementary explanatory statement, which I have previously provided to members, but which I now table for the information of the Assembly. The reforms contained in this Bill will reduce the workload in the Supreme Court and cases will be heard in the most appropriate forum. The Supreme Court will be able to get on with the job of dealing with the most serious cases, as is the case in most other Australian jurisdictions. Court data from the 2009-10 financial year indicates that 21 out of 78 Supreme Court cases, that is 26 per cent, would have been diverted to magistrates' courts under reforms contained in the government's bill. These reforms would also have a significant effect on the present delays being experienced in bringing matters to trial. As I have mentioned previously, some defendants are waiting up to and beyond 24 months before committal and trial. The government is confident that the workload will be reduced in the move to the magistrate's court due to the streamlined procedures of the summary jurisdiction. This new work can be accommodated within present magistrate staffing levels. Recent changes to the rules allow the register registrar to finalise non-contested protection orders. This reform, together with the recruitment of an additional deputy registrar, will free the magistrates to hear matters in the increased summary jurisdiction. Every Australian jurisdiction has adopted a slightly different way of dealing with this issue. Most jurisdictions use a district court to buffer their Supreme Courts from all but the most serious trials, such as murder, manslaughter and treason. However, even in, these, in, even in those jurisdictions without a district court, without a district court, measures have been taken to allow a wider range of matters to be dealt with summarily in their magistrates' court. For example, in Tasmania, the magistrates' court can impose a sentence of up to 12 months for a first offence and up to five years, five years for a second or subsequent offence. The Northern Territory Magistrates' Court has in addition to its exclusive summary jurisdiction, compulsory summary disposal for less serious property offences. In the absence of the Assembly's support for structural reform, the reforms contained in this bill represent the best option to further assist in reducing the backlog in the Supreme Court. As members have noted, the bill also gives statutory recognition to the Family Violence Court, which has been a successful specialist list of the Magistrates' Court to date. Similarly, the bill establishes in legislation the Gallimbani Court, which provides a culturally relevant sentencing option for eligible Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have offended. I am aware that other members will be moving amendments to the bill. I have been engaged in discussions with both Mr Rattenbury and Mrs Dunn in relation to the bill, and officers from my department have provided briefings to both members and met with the Law Society and Bar Association. The government remains of the view that its bill is the best legislative option available in the circumstances. However, to progress the bill, the government recognises that it will need to support uh, some amendments. The amendments 
uh, that have been put forward propose a DPP discretion in the election of the appropriate court. Based on court figures from 2009-10, assuming the DPP makes an election for summary disposal in all the affected matters, the amendment should still reduce the workload of the Supreme Court. However, we will have to wait and see whether the DPP election process works in practice. Some of the amendments put forward lack the clarity and simplicity of the government's approach, and they also have a significant element of uncertainty. Under the government's proposal, all offences with penalties of five years of less or less would have been automatically heard in the Magistrates' Court, whereas now there is the possibility of the DPP electing for the case to be heard in the Supreme Court. While I have full confidence in the DPP, there will be some matters with penalties of five years or less that he may consider appropriate to be heard into the Supreme Court. Under these amendments, there is a risk of leakage into the Supreme Court because of the natural discontinu discontinuity between DPP estimates and actual sentence outcomes. Under the amendments proposed by Mrs Dunn, where the DPP elects for matters with penalties of five years or less to be heard in the Magistrates' Court, and facts emerge during the hearing that warrant a longer sentence, the election precludes the matter being referred back to the Supreme Court for sentence which is a limitation on what currently exists. There are further difficulties with the amendments. They would reduce the existing sentencing jurisdiction of the Magistrates Court, as the maximum sentencing jurisdiction of magistrates is currently five years, not two. Under the Greens model, where the DPP does not make an election and the defendant elects for a matter with up to five years penalty to be heard in the Magistrates Court, the court's sentencing jurisdiction would be reduced to two years and more matters may be referred to the Supreme Court for sentence. Madam uh, uh, Mr Assistant Speaker, I seek the leave of the Assembly to complete my speech. I have is leave granted. a couple of paragraphs. Leave is granted. Uh, I thank uh, members. <clears throat> the granting of such a broad discretion to the DPP is potentially problematic, as it would give greater power to the DPP than he currently enjoys particularly in the context of a small jurisdiction. The Scrutiny Committee itself has commented on this issue in its report of the 4th of April this year. In its report, the committee has expressed a concern, which is shared by the government, that it may be unfair to invest in the prosecutor a discretion to decide whether the defendant should be deprived of the capacity to decide whether the matter should be tried in the Supreme Court. The proposed discretion also lacks transparency, and there would be no mechanism for review or challenge. The discretion proposed is quite different to the existing power of the DPP to consent to aggravated robbery and burglary charges being summarily disposed of. In that case, the defendant must also consent. Mr Assistant Speaker, I have highlighted the difficulties with the amendments. The government reiterates its firm view that the preferable approach is, of course, structural reform to deal with delays in our court system. We reiterate our firm view that these changes will at best prove to be an interim or temporary solution to the problems faced structurally in the case workload of the Supreme Court. And we express the fear that we will be back here in a relatively short period of time, having to again deal with ongoing delay in the Supreme Court. That said, it is clear that unless amendments are made to the government's bill today, it will not pass at all. And for that reason, uh, the government will engage in the discussion on those amendments and indicate its preferred way forward in those circumstances. Mr Assistant Speaker. I commend the bill to the Assembly. The question is, did this bill be agreed to in principle? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Is the wish of the Assembly to dispense with the detail stage? I think not. The question is that Clause 1 be agreed to. Mrs Dunn? Mr Assistant Speaker, I move the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. That is that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it.
Um, and I think the question now is that the, uh, <coughs> that the bill be set down for a, uh, item an order of the day and another day of sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Mr Barr. Uh, sorry, Mrs Dunn. She rose. Thank you. Sorry Mr. about that. Mr Speaker. Mr. Sp Mr Assistant Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 254A, as the Chair of the Standing Committee on Justice and Community Safety, I ask the Attorney General for an explanation for the lateness of the Government's response to the Committee's Report No. 2 into the Crimes Murder Amendment Bill 2008. And in doing so, I note that the Committee reported on the 27th of August 2009 and the Government responded on the 15th of September 2009 to one of the committee's recommendations, the government undertook to respond to the remaining recommendations within the, the time frame, but to date this has not occurred, and I therefore seek an explanation. Attorney General, Mr. Corbell, I would have to take the inquiry on notice, uh, Mr. Assistant Speaker. I simply don't have the particulars of the matter before me at this time, but I'll endeavour to provide an answer to the assembly as soon as possible. This is done. In accordance with Standing Order 254A, I move that the Assembly note that the Attorney General has failed to supply an explanation for his failing to provide a government response to the Standing Committee's report number two on the Crimes Murder Amendment Bill 2008, which was due by the 27th of November 2009. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Noes have a division required. Ring the bells. We've written to you three times, Simon. Order, members. Conversations across the chamber is disorderly. Repairs in operation, I understand, for the purpose of Hansard. Uh, Ms Porter and Mr Dospot. That's all. No, Mrs Gallagher has returned. There's only Miss Porter and Mr. Dosper. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Joy. Oh, it's all right. Do you want to step outside, please? Because we've got a just had a request for repair. Thank you. It's a pair now in operation for Mr Smith and Mrs Birch, in addition to Ms Porter and Mr Dospot. Uh, two missing. All members of present who can be present, lock the doors. <laughs> The question is that the motion be agreed to. Clark? Mr Barr? Aye. Ms Bresnan? Yes. Ms Birch? Mr Coe? Yes. Corbell? No. Mr Dospot? Mrs Dunn? Yes. Ms Gallagher? Mr Hanson? Yes. Mr Hargraves? No. Hunter? Yes. Ms Lacuta? Yes. Ms Porter? Mr Rattenbury? Yes. Mr Cecilia? Yes. Mr Smith? Mr Stanhope? No. 
Result of the division, eyes eight, noes five. The question therefore is resolved in the affirmative. Mr Barr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask leave to make a statement in response to the resolution of the Assembly of 25 August 2000. Is leave granted? To master plans. Leave is granted. Order members. Order members. Mr Coe. Mr Barr has it. It's almost over today. We can... Chief Minister, please. Mr Barr is capable. Thank you. Mr Thank Coe, you. don't end on a bad... Don't end on a bad day. Order members. That will do. I won't say it again. Next person to do that. Chief Minister, please don't force me into it. Mr Coke, you're warned. I mean it, and it carries over if I name you. Point of order, Mr. Mr. Point of order, Mr. Assistant Speaker. Yes. On your ruling, yes. um, you told members to be quiet. The Chief Minister clearly intervened after that. Yes. You did not warn him, and you warned Mr Coe. Could I seek uh, your the rationale reason? as yes, to why Mr. Mr Coe's interjections uh, merit a warning and, and the Chief Minister's Far more persistent uh, interjections do not. Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr Seselja. The answer to your question is I asked Mr. Mr Coe forcefully three times to desist and the Chief Minister twice. I also told, I also told members, Mr. Mr Hanson, would you like to dispute the ruling? I'll invite you to dispute the ruling. You can do what you like. I'm not finished making not my explanation. Just resume your seat for a second and I'll, then you can, then you get the floor. Mr Seselja, I also said, and you weren't listening, that I was fed up with it. It was the end of the day and I asked both sides of the chamber, and I did ask the Chief Minister twice to desist, and I asked Mr Coe three times to desist, and I was halfway through it saying the next, and the next person will cop a warning. And I delivered on that, uh, that promise. Now, I have been even-handed in all of my rulings, Mr Seselja, and if you wish to dissent from that, I invite you to do so. Mr Hanson has the floor. Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I do dissent from your ruling. Um, the point is that you may have warned the Chief Minister only twice and Mr. Coe three times, but uh, excuse the... me a second, Mr. Hanson. I've just taken some technical advice. I don't wish me to interrupt you, Mr. Stream, but I'm advised that uh, you need to do it in the context of a dissent motion. So you need to seek leave to move such a dissent motion. It's just a procedural thing. I'm sorry. Well, about certainly, that. Mr. Assistant Speaker, I seek leave to move a motion of dissent in your ruling. A formal reprimand under the standing orders, or is that something at the Speaker's discretion that has no actual uh, basis until you name a member? Thank you very much, Mr Barr. The answer to Mr Barr's question in, in his point of order is that there is no, uh, no mention in the standing orders of a warning and what it constitutes. It's a convention in this place, has been a convention in this place no since uh, 89. That, Mr Barr, I'm not finished. And the convention is in this place that uh, on the receipt of the second warning, it is a naming in accordance with the standing order. The warning is, is a flag, it's a conventional flag to say that a member's disorderly conduct is getting towards uh, being required to be named according with the standing orders. Mr Hanson. Thank you. And uh, I thank Mr Barr for that, uh, that point because it actually goes to the point I'm going to make, which is, although... I thought I had sought leave before. Did you? I sought leave. Did you? Well... Is leave granted? Yes. Yes. Well, the chair is granting Mr Hanson leave. Thank you. My point is that regardless of the warnings that you gave to Mr Coe or Mr Stanhope, and you're saying it's three to one... I'm, I'm just advised again, Mr Hanson, I did ask you earlier on, you need to move a motion of some type, like a motion of dissent. I move a motion of dissent in your ruling, Mr Assistant Speaker. Thank you. The mo the, the quest Can I clarify as to whether you've actually made a ruling? Or just issued a warning. I haven't. I have issued a warning, Mr. Barr. Now, Mr. Mr. Hanson can move any motion he likes, and it will be at the pleasure of the chamber. Uh, Mr. Hanson, you've moved the motion. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. Mr. Hanson, you. your floor. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the point is that the form of this place has been that uh, when members are warned, then essentially the next action that. Uh, comes from the Speaker's chair is that the member gets ejected. Um, so it does carry some weight in this place and I think that the point is not necessarily uh, on this uh, <coughs> particular warning but is the balance that you've shown towards the interjections between Mr Coe and Mr Stanhope. So although you said that you'd um, 
spoken to Mr Coe three times and spoke to Mr Stanhope two times. The point is that the interjections from Mr Stanhope were far more persistent in their manner. He actually started with the interjections, calling uh, Mrs Dunn immature, describing the assembly as a kindergarten, I think it was, continued on with his interjections, to which Mr Coe then responded. But it was actually Mr, Mr Stanhope who was the main pro protagonist, who was the instigator of the, in, in, uh, the um, interjections. Uh, so your decision to basically pick on Mr Coe, to warn him, to focus on him and name him from the Speaker's chair, was in, entirely inconsistent. And that is my point. So, Mr Speaker, I do dissent in your decision to warn Mr Coe and in your inconsistent application from the, the chair of warnings and of your treatment of the opposition benches as opposed to the government benches. And I think that if you were to review uh, the Hansard or certainly the Daily On Demand, you would note that Mr Stanhope was far more prolific with his interjections, far more, I would say, controversial and objectionable, and Mr Coe was simply responding to those. But it's Mr Coe that you crack down on in this place, and I think that's inconsistent. And I think that you should either withdraw your warning to Mr Coe, or you should apply it consistently and warn Mr Stanhope. Thank you, Mr Hanson. The question is the motion be agreed to, Mr Barr. Well, Mr Assistant Speaker, uh, you are discharging your responsibilities uh, in the chair, uh, I think, in a most impartial manner. And it is, uh, and as I, I go to the, the points I've been raising, the, 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 issue, the issuing of a warning is a courtesy that, uh, that the occupant of, of uh, that position extends to members in this place. Uh, the occupant of the speaker's chair is, is perfectly is perfectly order, entitled. Order members, please. You were heard in silence. The Mr. occupant Bell. of the speaker's chair is perfectly entitled to move straight to a naming, uh, if that person believes that the behaviour of a member warrants such an action, uh, and then we can actually formally have a ruling with which to dissent from. I mean, this this is possibly the most ridiculous conversation we've had in this chamber this week. I say possibly, because we don't know what's still to come. But there's no, in my view, there is no. You have not. You have not made an actual. You have not made an actual please. ruling, Mr. Speaker. You've simply, Mr. Assistant Speaker, you've simply issued a warning to a member, and the Liberal Party don't like the fact that one of theirs has been issued with a warning, a courtesy that you've extended that the behaviour of that member is approaching, is approaching the point of formally being named. That I think is entirely appropriate and a very generous courtesy that uh, that you extend in your role as assistant speaker. Order, Mr. Hanson, please. That you Don't extend in your role as assistant speaker in this place, uh, and in fact, I think the guidance that you provide uh, in terms of that role and being clear and even-handed to all members in this place ensures the orderly functioning uh, of the assembly. Now it's 25 to six. I know members would like to, uh, to discuss the master planning process. I know I have been waiting all day to deliver a speech, uh, Mr <laughs> Assistant Speaker. I know, I know the Greens planning spokesperson is interested in contributing to this debate, and I'm sure that the Leader of the Opposition, uh, if he could bring himself uh, just a moment to focus on his shadow portfolio responsibilities rather than the theatrics of this place, might also have a contribution. We have 24 minutes to go before the adjournment. Uh, Mr Assistant Let's Speaker, and there is no basis in which uh, to support Mr Hanson's motion, and accordingly the government will not thank you. be. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Mr Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. And, uh, you, must, um, you must be very grateful for that show of loyalty from uh, Mr Barr um, in, in, in seeking to defend your ruling. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that Mr Barr focused, as he did, on his desire to speak on, on planning uh, and on a technicality rather than dealing with the substance of the motion before the Assembly right now. And the substance of the motion is very clear and the reason that Mr Hanson has moved it, uh, it is it was very clear that there was one main protagonist there who was not being brought to order, and that was the Chief Minister, uh, and that also uh, after, eventually, uh, after eventually during that exchange you uh, sought to br bring the House to order. Uh, and, you, and you said that the next member to speak out of turn would be warned, the Chief Minister continued 
uh, and was not warned. He continued interjecting, and it was only then when Mr Coe responded again that he was warned. Uh, so, Mr Assistant Speaker, it's, it's absolutely clear, Order, members, it's absolutely clear uh, that Mr. the Chief Cecilia, Minister— please stop. Stop the clock. Members from both sides of the chamber will stop this, please. Let's, let's have a discussion like adults. Now, I have drawn the opposition to being— uh, to stop interjecting. Mr Hanson was a repeat offender while Mr Barr was, was making his speech and I tried to pull him up. I don't want to have to do the same thing to the government as well. Mr Selzer, you have the chair. Thank you, uh, Mr Assistant Speaker. And, and that's yeah. why it's, it's absolutely clear uh, that the Chief Minister uh, was not treated in the same way uh, that, Alice, that Mr Coe was, uh, that, that a far sterner standard was applied to Mr Coe. Uh, and, and, and this has been a concern for some time, and that's why this, that's why this does, from time to time, come to a flashpoint uh, where the opposition gets shut down during debates uh, in interjecting in far lesser ways than members of the government. Members of the government who consistently uh, interject, and the Chief Minister is one of the worst offenders when it comes to this, uh, should also uh, be brought to bear. Uh, they should be warned and they should be thrown out when they go beyond uh, what the speaker and what the ordinary uh, standard of uh, behaviour in this place should be. Uh, so, Mr Assistant Speaker, this motion should be supported uh, because we expect that there will be uh, impartial, an impartial chair in delivering warnings and in keeping order in this place. That was not the case there. The Chief Minister did get special treatment uh, and that's why this motion of dissent should be supported. The question is the motion be agreed to, Ms President. Thank you, Mr Assistant Speaker. Um, we won't be supporting this dissent motion because, frankly, Mr Barr's correct, there actually is no ruling to dissent from. The Chair was discharging his duties as he saw fit, as uh, for the circumstances at the time and the situation. And as Mr Barr said, the Chair, the Speaker, at any time can actually warn someone. It is a courtesy. Under the standing orders, you can actually go straight to naming somebody who did not do that. Acts as a courtesy, uh, put in place a warning, and there is actually nothing to dissent from. There's no ruling here, and frankly, it is a ridiculous situation that we've got ourselves in here at the moment. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Thank you, Mr. Coe. Uh, Mr. Assistant Speaker, if uh, if the house, if order in the house was being uh, upheld, then Mr. Stanhope's interjection would have been clamped down on right away. And there would have been no subsequent banter across the, uh, across the chamber had that have happened. But that hadn't happened, and then there was a gross inconsistency in the 30 seconds which followed, resulting in my warning. So perhaps if order was upheld, and in actual fact, I do ask to you to uh, review the hand side to see whether you actually did say um, uh, anything out of order about Mrs Dunn across the chamber, which was... Um, which is something which wasn't brought up at the time, and had it, have been, um, had it been so, then perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation that we are right now. Uh, thank you, Mr Coe. I would ask, actually, in the interests of impartiality, that the Speaker review the Hansard with respect to that, rather than I review it and then make a reading. But the Speaker will review it in his own good time and come back to the Chamber. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. The vision required ring the bells. There are two pairs in operation, Ms Porter and Mr Dospots, Mr Smith and a member of the government to be determined. Uh, yes, please. Um, well, you can choose between you and Katie, it doesn't matter. Okay. One, I, you can. We need a pair. Okay. Thank you. No, the chief's needed. Thank you. To all members of present who can be present, lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to, Clark. Mr. Barr. No. Ms. Bresnan. No. Ms. Birch. 
Mr Coe? Yes. Mr Corbell? No. Mr Dospot? Mrs Dunn? Yes. Ms Gallagher? Mr Hanson? Yes. Mr Hargraves? No. Ms Hunter? No. Ms Lakuta? No. Ms Porter? Mr Rattenbury? No. Mr Sizelger? Yes. Mr Smith? Mr Stanhope? No. Well, the members, the result of the division is ayes four, noes nine. Therefore, the question is resolved in the negative. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. In August of last year, yeah, the sorry, Assembly. Mr. Barr, I think you, you need to seek leave. I thought I, leave got, I thought I got leave before we. Okay, yeah. I take it back. <laughs> Your floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Speaker. In August last year, the Assembly resolved that, uh, among other things, the government develop a priority list of areas to be master planned and subject to further localised planning. The resolution also called on the government to undertake localised planning and consultation in suburban areas and town group and local centres where significant changes are anticipated and to incorporate these master plans and precinct plans into the territory plan. The Assembly resolved that the Government report back to the Assembly by the end of June 2011 with the results of the priority list. Uh, Mr Speaker, I want to take the opportunity today to provide the Assembly with the Government's response on the master plan priority list and the way this program will be managed over the ensuing years. Mr Speaker, master plans are important tools to implement strategic initiatives such as reinvigorating our centres, identifying opportunities for appropriate development and improving access to services and public transport for all of the community. Master plans are important tools in identifying the intrinsic quality of a precinct and are even more important as tools to manage change. Clearly those areas that are likely to experience significant change or are in need of reinvigoration will be high on the priority list, but will also be important to include a range of centres, town, group, local and rural. Uh, if we are to be, if we are, if we are to begin, Mr. Speaker, to deliver on the themes of time to talk, Mr. Speaker, the government envisages an ongoing program of approximately four master plans each year for the next six years, subject to annual budget funding. This represents an ambitious program, but responds to community needs and government policy for urban renewal. The 24 places included in the preliminary priority list of a master plan program have been selected from the 17 group centres, five town centres, five rural villages and six transport corridors, noting the master plans already completed and currently under development. It is intended to consult on the broad priority list during the public consultation on the revised planning strategy, which is anticipated later this year. However, as the program will commence in the new financial year, a selection of the highest priority areas for the first year of the program has been established. This selection was based on the following criteria. Places that are likely to experience the greatest pressures for change from current government policies or other works projects. Places that support the delivery of transport for Canberra Network 12 and places that support the redevelopment of public housing assets by the Department of Disability, Housing and Community Services. Accordingly, the priority list for 2011-12 financial year is Oaks Estate, which is already committed and some work is being undertaken in the preparation of the master plan, the Western Coolman Court Group Centre, Athlon Drive, a major transport corridor, and a part of the Belconnen Town Centre as part of that centre's renewal process. The priority listing for subsequent years is based on most need as determined against a set of criteria. The nomination by the Department of Disability Housing Community Services of centres for inclusion on the priority list will also be considered where it would support public housing redevelopment. Community consultation on the priorities for the list of places in accordance with this Assembly resolution will be through the refreshed Time to Talk website. I believe this is an invaluable vehicle for consultation. It provides government with the opportunity to display information and plans 
that can illustrate the intent. But more importantly, it allows people from across Canberra, people of all ages and people who are often time poor, to contribute to the overall planning of our city and to the planning of local areas. However, I believe the Assembly needs to be realistic in acknowledging that given the multiple communities of interest, it's unlikely that this process will arrive at a consensus position and it will be necessary for the Planning and Land Authority to evaluate and recommend the final list, having regard to community input alongside a range of objective criteria. Mr Speaker, I'll now briefly outline the process for the master planning projects under the proposed priority list. Each master plan will follow a standardised process that meets the government's community engagement guide, similar to that currently being applied to the Tuggeranong and Erindale, Canberra and Pialago projects, but tailored where necessary to meet particular circumstances. The consultative nature of the proposed process provides an opportunity for the local community and stakeholders to influence the outcomes and guide the nature of future changes. The master planning process will build on what we've learned and what we are learning from engaging the community on Kingston, Dixon, Tuggeranong, Erindale, Canberra, Gungahlin and Pialago. Through the master planning process, we will actively seek the views of different groups, but Thank most you. particularly the views of young people. We will continue to include schools and youth organisations in our processes, which have been a very successful part of the Tuggeranong and Erindale exercises today. Our engagement with the community on master plans will also deepen the conversations that have commenced about the future planning of our city. The process of preparing master plans is an iterative one that seeks to identify the issues, the opportunities and a way forward to manage change. The community's input will be sought at all of these stages. The master plan process will be documented in four component parts. Firstly, the master plan itself, which will include a vision statement, place-making considerations, opportunities and constraints analysis and planning options with a preferred plan and implementation plan. Secondly, a consultation report, which will document the engagement activities, stakeholder lists and findings. Thirdly, a list of investigation and background reports. And finally, an action plan, which will, which will be a companion text that identifies the next steps required to implement the master plan. The realisation of many of the desired outcomes from master plans will, though, be incremental and it's worth noting will mostly not be the responsibility of the ACT Planning and Land Authority. And this will be enunciated clearly through the community consultation. Any territory plan change that may be required for the master plan to be executed is a subsequent and separate process. Mr Speaker, in response to some concerns raised at the, at the time taken to deliver the Kingston and Dixon Group Centre master plans, Ironically, in large part because of the methodical consultation ACTLA conducts for these exercises, it's proposed that the master plans will be adopted using the following process. That we will undertake a master plan process, as I've just outlined, that a precinct code will be prepared for incorporation into the Territory Plan and the government will initiate a variation to the Territory Plan. And whilst this process responds to part 2E subsection 4 of the Assembly Resolution, it's important to stress that the Territory Plan is limited uh, in the nature of policy in that it contains, uh, in, the, in the policy it contains as a land use and development instrument. And as such, it will only be applicable to the spatial and land use planning actions from the master plans uh, that will be incorporated into the Territory Plan. The planning process uh, to this point will have been supported by extensive consultation, including the consultation completed as part of the Sustainable Futures and Time to Talk work, uh, the community consultation that will occur in the development of the master plan itself and the consultation that will accompany any territory plan variation. The proposed process, which would produce a precinct code, uh, would mean that those development proposals that are in accordance with the relevant precinct code could be assessed in a development application code track. This removes, and it's important to note this, Mr Speaker, this removes third party appeal rights for developments that are undertaken that are consistent with that precinct code. 
taking advantage of the COAG uh, Development Assessment Forum leading practice model that is built into our Planning and Development Act. This is premised on one of the key principles embedded in the model and in our Act, whereby investment is made in consulting on policy, which is then used to assess developments that are notified, but where the policy debate is not re-prosecuted for each and every development application that's lodged. This provides certainty to the community and an incentive to the development sector to work within the policy framework. This means that whilst there is a lead time to arrive at the point of a precinct code, uh, the gains for the Territory are at the back end, Mr Speaker, where development proposals that accord with the code are not delayed through objections and appeals, except where they depart from the code, in which case the development application would be considered in the merit track. Mr Speaker, the program I've outlined today is in addition to ACLA's current program of master plans, which includes the Dixon and Kingston group centres, which are nearing completion after an extensive period of community consultation, the Gungahlin Town Centre master plan, which is now the subject of a draft territory plan variation, the Tugranong Town Centre and Erindale group centre with Erindale Drive Transport Corridor master plan, which commenced in 2010 and are due for completion later this year. The Canbar Group Centre, which is the subject of an assembly resolution that I'm partly responding to today. This master plan has commenced, noting the timeline of reporting to the assembly is September 2011. And the Pialago Rural Village Master Plan, which is about to commence again with completion this year. Now, Mr Speaker, in concluding, this ongoing program of master plans will provide greater certainty to the community on the where and how we are going to be addressing key issues facing the Territory, and it presents a meaningful opportunity for the community to engage not only on the development of their local areas, but importantly on how we plan, build and manage our city's growth and change. Mr Speaker. Um, could I ask uh, perhaps uh, that the minister move that the statement be noted and perhaps table the thing for the purposes of a procedure? Uh, minister, Mr Hargraves, I move that the statement be noted. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Question is that the statement be noted. I move be adjourned, I think, Thank be on, because we're not going to have enough time. Thank you, Mr. Lacuta. The question is that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the resumption of debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, members. Mr. Speaker, with tremendous pleasure, I move that the assembly do now adjourn. The question is that the assembly do now adjourn. Mr. Hanson. Mr. Speaker, thank you. It gives me great pleasure tonight to stand up and speak about. Um, an activity that's been coordinated by the Canberra City Pipes and Drums, which are also the Australian Federal Police Pipes and Drums. And that is a thank you T-shirt, uh, which is um, written on the words of it, thank you, remember them, 25th of April. And the, the aim of that T-shirt is to promote and to uh, remember uh, and to honour Australian veterans on Anzac Day so that people can wear that T-shirt uh, with pride either be it at the dawn service or uh, whilst the parade is on or at their, uh, their local club having a beer and a game of tour. Uh, for those that are unaware, the uh, Canberra City Pipes and Drums is a commemorative um, pipes and drums and plays at a number of uh, ceremonial events. And these might include Vietnam Veterans Day, uh, National Police Remembrance Day, on Anzac Day uh, and so on. Now, the reason that uh, the Canberra City Pipes and Drums is doing this is principally to try and promote the, uh, the veterans in our community and the link between our community and veterans in a way that the community can say thank you uh, to veterans on Anzac Day. But it's also a way that the Pipes and Drums can raise funds for both themselves, but more importantly, for the RSL. So the money that's raised will either go to the RSL or will go to the um, Canberra City Pipes and Drums so that they can participate 
in the events that uh, are so important to our community and represent our community indeed overseas. And the intent is that they'll get back to the, uh, the Edinburgh Royal Military Tattoo in November 2012 so they can represent our great city at that wonderful event. And I think that's a, a great thing that they're doing. The, um, the T-shirts are available from a number of outlets, uh, and that includes the Bendigo, Bendigo Bank uh, in a number of areas, in Bungendore, Corwell, Waniassa, Canberra City and Jamison. They're available from the Bungendore Post Office and the Manuka Services Club, or you can go online to www.rememberthem.com.au. Um, I'm very pleased to say that this is a bipartisan uh, measure, and I uh, thank the Chief Minister uh, for his generous donation of $2,500 uh, toward this initiative to support the, uh, the pipes and drums. Uh, the inspiration for this event has come uh, principally from Pipelines Corporal uh, Jen uh, Hammer, who uh, came up with the idea and has been the force behind it, uh, obviously supported by a number of people in the pipes and drums, obviously including the pipe major. Uh, Dinah Kinsman, uh, her media representative, uh, Fiona Irvine, and the Pipes and Drums. And they were playing the other day at a media event uh, on the 1st of April in Civic and City Walk. And it was great to see the Pipes and Drums out there making the, uh, the great music that they do. And uh, at the event, uh, it was also good to see the support uh, from the AFP and representatives from the AFP. AFP. Jeremy Lassick was there from the... Um, representing the Chief Minister and spoke at the event, and also the RSL Deputy President, Mrs June Healy. Um, there were a number of other representatives there, including Christine Coulthard from the, uh, from the RSL, and a number of veterans, including the uh, representatives from the Vietnam Veterans Motorcycle Club. Um, Madam Assistant Speaker, I think it's a great initiative. I congratulate the uh, the members of the Canberra City Pipes and Drums. I hope that they raise lots of money. I hope that we see lots of those black T-shirts on Anzac Day, and I hope that it uh, both raises funds for the RSL and the great work that they do, but also they raise enough money to get themselves back to the, Royal, uh, the Edinburgh Royal Military Tattoo, where I know that they'll represent our city uh, with great distinction. Mr Coe. Thank you, uh, Madam Assistant Speaker. I rise today to, um, to put on the record my thanks and congratulations uh, for all the, uh, all the people at the Heritage Unit um, for the work they're doing in putting together the 2011 Heritage Festival. It really is a, a superb event and one that I'm very pleased to see um, the government continually support and one that really is going from strength to strength. Uh, in particular, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Gerhard Zatchler um, but uh, also um, Linda and uh, Penny in the Heritage Unit for, um, for their work in, in coordinating the, uh, the events. There are so many uh, events happening over the uh, next couple of weeks, and I do encourage uh, as many members as possible to, uh, to get along to them, to whichever ones they can. Um, in particular, I, I think there are some, some events that are really out of um, uh, left field that, that otherwise you wouldn't uh, necessarily... Um, um, get a chance to learn about. Things such as the, uh, the Goulburn Brewery um, or the um, Acton Walkways at Coolman Ridge, um, the um, Hyatt Hotel, um, the Archives National Trust, a Benedict House, of course the Cameron District Historical Society, um, TAMS um, are running quite a few different events, um, the Cooma Cottage uh, and many, many other events. Uh, the Rolls Royce Owners Club um, are showing off um, some of their vehicles. It really is a uh, fantastic event and one that uh, I think uh, should be supported as widely as possible by the Canberra community. I'd like to put on the record my thanks to the, the work at the Heritage Council, in particular the, uh, the Chair, Dr Michael Pearson, uh, the Deputy Chair, Dr Diane Firth, and the other members of the, uh, the Council, Dr Louise Brown, Dr Lenore uh, Coltart, uh, Mr David Johnston, Mr John Kemester, Dr Warren Nichols, uh, Mr Colin Stewart and Mr Joseph Zivko. I think they uh, do a very good job. It's not always the, uh, the easiest job. There are certainly some controversial decisions that they have to make, um, but I thank them for the service they give to the Territory um, in being on that council and the important decisions that they make. Oh, the question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. Those of that opinion say aye.
To the contrary, no. I believe the ayes have it. The Assembly stands adjourned until Tuesday the 3rd of May 2011 at 10am. <laughs>